Okay, folks, we are ready to start the city council meeting for today, which is Tuesday, March the 22nd. We're about to go in camera, which we will be going downstairs to have that meeting. Then after that meeting, we will resume back upstairs here for the regularly scheduled meeting. And it's a reminder to all council members to leave all electronic devices in council chambers. Our sergeant at arms will keep an eye on things to make sure nobody touches anything. So I'm looking for a motion to go in camera. Motion by Councillor Dabrowski, seconded by Councillor Thompson. All those in favor? Okay, and we're unanimous. We're now gonna go in camera. We'll meet in committee room two.
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the open session of the City Council meeting of Tuesday, April the 22nd. We concluded downstairs in committee room two, our in-camera, and now we're gonna continue with the regular, regularly scheduled agenda. So first up, first order of business, as our tradition here is to sing O Canada, but before we start, let me introduce, we have a recorded performance done by Victoria. Victoria is a student at Niagara Institute of Music and Arts, Nioma, located downtown Niagara Falls. Victoria is 12 years old. She takes piano, guitar, and voice lessons. Her favorite is the guitar. We'd like to welcome Victoria singing O Canada, and I, I would invite everyone to please stand for the singing of O Canada. Our home and native land, true patriot love in all of us command. With glowing hearts we see the rise, the true north strong and free. From far and wide, O oh Canada, we stand on guard for thee. God keep our land. Glorious and free, O oh, Canada, we stand on guard for Thee. O oh, Canada, we stand on guard for Thee. Victoria, thank you very much. We appreciate. We know it's uh, not easy to do, and you had to do it outside in front of the building, holding your mask, but thank you for your rendition of O Canada. We very much appreciate it. Moving along our agenda, next uh, order of business is our land acknowledgement. Uh, with the aim of educating our community, we invite Jackie Labonte, traditional knowledge keeper and local member of the Haudenosaunee to join us once again to share her testimony as we acknowledge and thank the indigenous people. Uh, we can cue the video, Mr. Clerk. Thank you. Want to um, add a little bit more to the land acknowledgement that has been acknowledged here, especially in this city of Niagara Falls, in moving forward to build those relationships with our indigenous population here. And I think one of the um, one of the strong elements that is recognized is um, the dish with one spoon, and that encompasses um, kind of like a, a treaty or an agreement between nations, even to utilize a space, a common space, so that you're not going to deplete what's there, that we're able to all come together and utilize what we need to for our well-being and to still have some resources left. And I think one of the things that um, showed this, for me anyway, in, in our ceremonies is that we recognize that the strawberry is the le leader amongst all of the plants. And we have a ceremony for the strawberry, but also that strawberry drink is at the other ceremonies. And so for us, um, they have the, um, the benches there for the singers and the drummers, and a drink is prepared, that strawberry drink, and it's brought in and put on the bench. It's just one pail and one dipper. And so anytime that anyone is thirsty, needs a drink to quench their thirst, then they can just come up to that pail and use that dipper and take a drink. And you're just quenching your thirst for that moment. And anyone else can do the same. Everybody has a responsibility to bring, say, some of those berries. We don't leave it all to one person. That'd be a pretty big job because we have sometimes 200, 300 people at our ceremonies. And if it were left to one person, that's a huge job. So our job is to help with that responsibility. Everybody brings some berries to help bake that juice so that it can be dispersed to everyone around there. And so we recognize that that dish with one spoon is that concept and it's, it's been here for hundreds and hundreds of years with our people. 
And so in moving forward, we see that in different aspects <coughs> in our communities. And so we recognize and honor that, that this is being embraced, that this is a part of the history, part of the teaching, part of the learning that's happening within our communities to build that bridge. And I can see that the city of Niagara Falls has helped to build those bridges, changing those lights in the falls to orange, helping our indigenous populations in and around our, this area. And so we recognize and offer that gratitude that this is happening, that it's continuing, and we look for further togetherness with that. Yeah. All right, thank you very much, Jackie, for that. She's a wonderful, wonderful lady. Uh, next up on the agenda is an amendment to the procedural bylaw to allow electronic participation for council meetings. Mr. Clerk, did you, is there anything you wanted to add to this uh, part of the agenda? Um, I could just, uh, through your worship, just state that uh, really this is just a procedural uh, matter to update the procedural bylaw uh, as you, as the report states, it was changed back at the beginning of the pandemic and just to allow for further participation electronically and to have that recognized as a meeting quorum if, uh, if required, uh, we need to make sure that this update was, uh, was done on the books. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Any questions? Yes, Councilor Cario. Thank you, Worship. Just a question. Is, are we doing this um, forever? Now, is this, a, is this gonna be the way it is or is this a temporary, just extending a temporary situation? Mr. Clerk. Uh, the way it will be written in the procedural bylaw, it will be there until council decides to change it. Uh, so yes, I guess it could be forever. And just to point out, it's, it's meant just for open council, uh, not for uh, closed meetings. And, and then, uh, so our, our participation will be reflected in our attendance reports as being there on Zoom. Wait. Is, would it be Through the chair, that, that is correct. Uh, your attendance, whether it be virtual or in person, uh, could be counted either either way. Okay, but will we be identifying it as one way or another, or? Um, we could break that down. Um, yeah, we, it's, well, uh, it's, it's... It's broken down on another report I saw, whether it was, it was done by uh, electronic or in person. Mm -hmm. I just wondered on our attendance report if it would be the same way. I think that's a good point. Uh, obviously, this is uh, a new process for us. I, I think we're, now that we've introduced this process, uh, hybrid meetings are likely here to stay, uh, but we can certainly distinguish uh, the level of attendance. I don't, I don't see any downside in saying both ways. You know, either you're here in person or you're there in electronically, just so. So, Mr. Clerk, should that be part of the motion uh, for that or direction to staff? What do you, what's your thoughts on that? I think that can be direction to staff. We, we see it in the report uh, tonight when we uh, finance reports on remuneration. There was previous direction um, other years that part of that report uh, contained counselors' attendance, and we can certainly reflect uh, the type of attendance uh, in that report as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Anything else, Counselor? No? Okay. Thank you. Any other uh, questions or comments? Okay, seeing none, we're looking for a motion to approve. Uh, motion by Councillor Strange, second by Councillor Campbell. All those in favor? Okay, and that is approved. Thank you for that. Uh, we're now looking for an adoption of the March 1st, 2020 minutes of Council. Uh, Councillor Peter Angelo, second by Councillor Strange. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. It's, it's, it's nice having everybody here again. It's a little yeah. easier to track everybody. Pardon me? It's nice that you're looking this way. Yeah. <laughs> More like a tennis match now. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, a it's a natural thing. Though. Yeah. It, it is a natural thing. Yeah. Though. Like the plexiglass, but still, it's, it's, it's nice. Uh, thank you for that. Um, disclosures of a pecuniary interest. Uh, Councillor Cario, and then Strange, then Peter Angelo. And, uh, and then Your Worship, Macoco, in the in-camera session. Uh, the first item on the in-camera session. Um, I am a property owner in the Falls of BIA. And uh, I don't know whether are we able to disclose what the issue, what the item was in uh, that meeting? Mr. Clerk? Um, How about if I just say that number one, I'm a property and it's on my paper. And on the third one, um, also on the last one, the last in camera one, um, the particular owner that was involved in the deal and I are partners on another piece of property. I'm not involved with this, 
but on another piece of property someone later told me I should declare a conflict. And then on the um, planning matter, uh, 2021-019 on Victoria Avenue, um, I own the property uh, next door to that development, the proposed development. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Strange. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, um, agenda number 8.6, uh, conflict of interest, uh, it's a sleep cheap. I'm a member of the, I've been a member of the Falls View Hose Brigade for over 20 years and it's one of the re recipients of the sleep cheap. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Peter Angelo. Yeah, thanks your worship. Uh, 6.1, it's the regional official plan and also our report PBD 2022-17. Not on all the areas, but on the areas that are affected by the SABR, which is the settlement area boundary review and the employment lands, my family owns lands that are affected. Uh, 7.3 PBD 2022-16, I own property in the notification zone. And 8.2, the CAO's report, uh, CAO 2022-02, that deals with the work plans. Again, not all the plans, because I do have some other questions, but just the employment land strategy and the hospital servicing, my family owns lands that are affected. And I'll leave this here for the clerk. Okay, thank you for that, Councillor. Councillor Campbell? No, you're good. Councillor Coco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, 8.6, the sleep cheap. I'm a board member for the Niagara Falls Art Gallery, one of the recipients. And 8.13, the Canada Day um, RNC 2022-06, my husband's former employer. Okay, thank you for that. Councillor Dabrowski. I, along uh, with Councillor Mike Strange, I'm a member of the Falls View Host Brigade. It's under 8.6, I know sleep cheap uh, um, donated to the Falls View Host Brigade, so just declaring a conflict on that. Okay, thank you for that. So that's all. The uh, declarations for conflicts of interest, uh, Mr. Clerk. All and just right. quickly, I, I've yeah. emailed that declaration to uh, the city clerk. Okay, great, thank you for that. Yeah, and either email it or give them a hard copy if you could on one of the procedural notice pads that you should have at your desk. Uh, next up is everyone's favorite part of the meeting, the mayor's reports and announcements. Uh, we'll start off, we've got, uh, they're brief, there's not many. <laughs> I know, a little disappointed, but there's just only so many I could do. Um, we'll start off uh, with the unfortunate part, obituaries. Hank Haluka, retired volunteer firefighter from Station 6, passed away. Mark Kronstein, former city crossing guard and umpire uh, and also timekeeper at the Gale Center, passed away. Uh, Jean-Guy Narbonne, father of J.P. Narbonne in our cemeteries department, passed away. And Rick Stokes, retired firefighter and beloved event photographer for the city for many, many years. Uh, Rick, uh, Outstanding Volunteer of the Year, and you'll direct your attention to the screens. Outstanding Volunteer of the Year for 2008, Festivals and Events Ontario. He was a Tourism Champion of the Year 2018, BNF Award recipient 2019 and 2020, Winter Festival of Lights volunteer since 1992, and he was also a former chair of the Winter Festival of Lights as well. Longtime volunteer for the Shriners Club, Scouts Canada, Niagara Falls Chamber of Commerce, the Niagara Falls Volunteer Firefighters Association. So we'll definitely miss Rick, real trooper, and, uh, and to all those who passed on, we pass our sympathy to, your, to their families. Next up, uh, in regard to Ukraine, obviously Ukraine has been in the news, and Ukraine.ua Real interesting, and I think we've got a photo. I'm not sure, uh, there, there it is. So this photo that we had shared uh, when we lit the falls up in the National Colors of Ukraine uh, was shared by Ukraine.ua. So the company, oh, wow. country itself shared, and it's gone viral as well as many others. So they know that we're standing with them. And as you recall, two and a half years ago, uh, President Zelensky was here in Niagara Falls and uh, along with his wife and family, we had a really nice visit. Uh, who knew the kind of role he'd be playing today? Anyway, there, there's the actual uh, tweet that they sent out and a lot of comments, as you can see. Um, and uh, that was uh, whenever that screenshot was taken recently. So kind of neat that we know that we did reach the Ukrainians and they are feeling the support that they're getting from Niagara Falls. So real neat thing. Uh, Camiso's fundraiser. Uh, another little bit of Ukraine, uh, these two young ladies, Julia and Sofia Zajak, um, they've been making these really neat decals, vinyl decals, and they've been offering them to anyone at Camisos who makes donations to the, to the Ukrainian Relief Foundation and support, and everything is making its way to support them. 
Uh, they've already in the first week raised over $7,000. And these two young ladies, along with their mom, are paying for and making all of the decals themselves. So we're really proud of these young ladies for their efforts. And we're, we know that we're standing with them and appreciate uh, Camiso's Fresh Foods as well participating. And there you can see Rocky Camiso along with the two young ladies um, very proud of their Ukrainian heritage and the flag and uh, nice that they're able to do something about it and feel good about their efforts and give people that just want to help out but that don't know what to do gives them an opportunity. You can go support and donate to the cause. Like I said, $7,000 in the first week. The girls were just uh, floored. They couldn't get over the amount of support that they received already. <clears throat> so please spread the word uh, for anyone that wants to help out. Uh, Transit Worker Appreciation Day <clears throat> is, uh, was March the 18th. Uh, we'd like to offer a thank you to all of our drivers, our mechanics, customer service folks, and our clerks. You know, they do a great job. It was very difficult during COVID, and uh, it was just a great day that we could actually acknowledge them and all their efforts that they do for the city and for all the residents of Niagara Falls. So thank you to all the transit workers for all that you do every day. Uh, helping move people around our community and not just around our community within and between our communities with our regional transit um, also the next picture which we had which we can throw back up i was talking i didn't know how many pictures we had i was trying to stretch out that announcement crossing guard appreciation day and we've got a video for that so that's tomorrow wednesday march the 23rd in the city of niagara falls we have 66 crossing guards at more than 40 locations and tomorrow's their appreciation day, so we've got a video that we're gonna play that uh, we can all enjoy for a moment. signed up Councillor Thompson several times to be a crossing guard. He hasn't shown up for his shifts yet, but uh, we'll keep signing him up. And lastly, we had some grand openings uh, just recently. We had a, an Indian restaurant called Spice and Flames. Uh, that's in the Town and Country Plaza by the Shoppers Drug Mart. I uh, was joined by Councillor Peter Angelo, and you can see where they're holding some samosas on the right, and on the left, uh, vegetable pakoras. And I will point out that they pointed out to us that all the food there is made from scratch. They use all top quality ingredients. It's all made right on site and it's takeout only. So you can pop in, take out some yummy food and uh, enjoy. And also we had the opening yesterday of Triple R Auto in Chippewa, right at the corner. And there's the uh, family, uh, Reese and the family, as they're celebrating the opening of the newest garage and the newest business here in the city of Niagara Falls. So congratulations to everybody. Our next council meeting after tonight will be Tuesday, April the 12th. And that concludes the announcements and reports. Now moving on to item six, depu deputations and presentations. First 6.1, we have a presentation regarding the regional official plan. So Dave Hayworth from the Niagara region, I believe, is it still uh, Dave Hayworth who's gonna be uh, doing this? He's just reconnecting. Okay, so he's just reconnecting online. Back. All right, super. And along, I think uh, Michelle Sergi and Diana Morielli from the region will also be available for questions. So Dave, welcome to the meeting. Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Can you, everyone hear me? Yeah, we hear you perfectly. Right. I think Heather is putting up the presentation for me.
That's our Heather, right? Our Heather? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> oh, there we go. Something's popping up. There we go. Thanks, Heather. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Council, staff, and the public. It's a pleasure uh, to be with you this evening to give you an update on the Niagara official plan, which has been uh, available as a consolidated draft official plan for comments since early January. And I want to start out by indicating that the Niagara official plan has taken a balanced approach with respect to growth management. The policy directions in the Niagara Official Plan have considered climate change and protection of the environment as key priorities in the Niagara Official Plan. Next slide. There are key interest areas to address in the Official Plan. One is an improvement of the natural environment system mapping and policies, providing a policy response to climate change, Providing for a housing mix, increasing our supply of housing of all types, uh, particularly medium and higher density development to help address affordability. Improve our economic competitiveness by protecting key employment areas for the long term. And improve, improving our policy planning framework. As you know, we operate in a two tier planning system and we want as clear and concise policies and uh, to help minimize overlap and confusion uh, from, from the public's perspective and development community's perspective as, as they go through an application process. Next slide. It is important for the region to provide a consistent set of growth numbers as well as a defined urban area for transit transportation planning, water wastewater planning, and development charges. And that's in order to plan for growth to ensure people can travel to and from work efficiently, servicing can accommodate growth, and growth can pay for growth. Next slide. The official plan was developed upon these pillar statements you see on the slide. They form the foundation for policy development. And these pillar statements were developed based on themed input provided during Imagine Niagara, which was planning to 2041 and provided a lot of public consultation uh, in ver from various forms to going to malls, et cetera, and regional council strategic plans, where there was also a significant outreach into the community. As well as Niagara official plan public information <laughs> sessions on background work for the Niagara official plan. We drafted these pillar statements and we provided them and got input at further public information sessions, as well as regional council was surveyed on these pillar statements to make sure they were all in agreement with them. Next slide. So the Niagara official plan is based on some core uh, chapters uh, and is structured as you see on the slide. And you can see in each core chapter, growing region, sustainable region, the subsections that have policies in place to deal with those topic areas as you see on the slide. And it's not the entire official plan, of course. It's not showing the introduction, the implementation chapter, site-specific policy areas, which are a carryover of existing site-specific policies in the plan. Um, as well as schedules and appendices and a glossary of terms. Next slide. So what's really important in, in the compiling the official plan is that the official plan contains uh, interrelated policies. Uh, planning is complex now and the policies have to relate to one another and, and the plan has to be read in its entirety. And one of the best examples of policy interrelation throughout the official plan is a section we have on climate change. And this section pulls together key policy directions throughout other sections of the official plan. And these are examples on the slide as to policy directions and policies in each of these policy directions that uh, relate to helping to address climate change. The section also commits the region to further strategy work, such as a greening strategy, 
climate modeling, and development of, of an adaptation strategy. Next slide. In its simplest form, the Niagara Official Plan identifies what we will protect, how and where we grow, and the systems or tools that provide to help accommodate the growth and protect our resources. Next slide. Niagara is forecast to grow by over 200,000 people and 85,000 jobs between 2021 and 2051. The Niagara Official Plan is taking an ambitious approach to intensification, directing 60% regionally of forecasted housing growth to established areas in Niagara. The growth plan requires Niagara to achieve an intensification rate of 50%, while we established a, we established a plan based on a higher rate of 60%. This 10% increase means 11,000 additional homes are directed to the built up areas in the region and reduce the need for more, uh, more settlement area boundary expansion lands than what's currently being proposed. Not all of the forecasted population employment growth can be accommodated within existing settlement areas and boundary expansion is required. About 1% of the region's land base is recommended to be added to settlement area boundaries. Next slide. Niagara Falls is forecast to add 44,430 people between 2021 and 2051, going from the current population of 97,000, just over 97,000, to the 2051 forecast of just over 141,000. Niagara Falls is forecast to add just over 20,000 jobs, going from the current employment base of 37,780. Uh, to the 2051 forecast of just over 58,000 jobs. The 50% intensification for uh, Niagara Falls averages out intensification thresholds met the last several years and is 10% higher than the existing required target in the existing official plan. And this target is a minimum. Next slide. There are two strategic growth areas planned for Niagara Falls, a protected major transit station area or GO station area at 125 people and jobs per hectare, which is shown in green on the map, as well as a Niagara Falls hospital area at 100 people and jobs per hectare, which is shown in uh, orange down in the south part of the city. This slide also depicts employment areas identified for protection. These areas were identified in consultation with local planning departments and staff. And these are the areas we want to protect for the long term for, for employment purposes. Next slide. So I've talked about a little bit about urban boundary expansions and the region is responsible for determining whether settlement area boundary expansions are needed to accommodate growth and, and where they should be located. Uh, and there's several, several stages to this. Uh, one is a land needs assessment, which I'll talk about. The other is the establishment of criteria for that assessment. And the other is timing. And, and we, as we determine whether we need settlement area boundary expansions and where they should be, that's done through this official plan process or what's called a municipal company. Next slide. In terms of la land needs, um, draft versions of the land needs assessment were presented in May, August, and December of 2021. The draft assessment identifies the need for additional regional settlement area lands, including 785 hectares for community area, 260 hectares for employment area, and 115 hectares for rural area. The total developable area of community land needed in Niagara Falls was determined to be 310 hectares. And the official plan review is also the time at which Niagara can make comprehensive revisions to the agricultural land base and natural environment system. As shown here on, on the slide, the Niagara official plan is adding 14 
hundred hectares of greenbelt protected countryside, 3,300 hectares of growth plan prime agricultural area, and 38,000 hectares of growth plan provincial natural heritage mapping, which is a natural heritage system established by the province outside of settlement areas. Next slide. This just identifies where we are in the settlement area, uh, settlement area boundary review process. And I'm gonna be talking a bit about uh, the establishment of criteria next. And we're at the stage where we've made a recommended settlement area expansions. Over the last year, the region has undertaken a significant amount of work to review settlement area boundaries. The work started with the creation of SABRE assessment criteria to ensure a consistent approach to reviewing all proposed expansion locations. The region received a number of requests for expansion, as well as the region identified land suitable for consideration. The result of this was 134 uh, areas reviewed. Uh, the assessment involved a multidisciplinary team of regional staff with expertise in various areas of the criteria. It also included local staff for input and staff recommendations were advanced in December and this kicked off a period of consultation. The urban area assessment criteria, as you can see on the slide, were developed based on direction from the provincial policy statement and growth plan and regional considerations. It is a comprehensive set of considerations, including impacts to agriculture and the environment, ability to connect to servicing and roads, and how it fits with the surrounding neighborhood, among others. Leading up to the recommendations as far as Niagara Falls is considered, we there were 49 sites in Niagara Falls which were reviewed and three requested locations were removed in step one, meaning they were two were in the Greenbelt plan and, and one was an isolated area in the south and you can't establish um, an individual new settlement area. It has to be adjacent to an existing settlement area boundary. And 46 sites were assessed through step two as we moved along. Next slide. Since December, regional staff consulted with landowners and the public on recommendations put forth in December. Uh, the region held a PIC specifically on Sabre in January prior to rec uh, recently recommending areas for endorsement by regional council to be included in a proposed draft official plan for more formal consultation. You can see the three areas identified on this uh, schedule. Next slide. So I talked about uh, the official plan talks about how we grow. The official plan also talks about what we protect. And what we protect are resources important from an ecological perspective or climate change or food supply perspective or heritage or economic perspective, as you can see them outlined here. Next slide. I'm not gonna talk about all of them this evening, but I will talk about one. Uh, Regional Council selected option 3C for its natural environment system in terms of mapping and policies. And, and those have been provided in the consolidated draft for consultation. And you can see here in the slide what the system includes. There has been significant consultation on the NES mapping and policies. A PIC was recently held on February 10th on the NES system mapping and policies. And on February 17th, a session was held for property owners in the urban area with new mapped features. Letters were sent out to 1,700 land, landowners in the region, and about 270 letters were sent out in for Niagara Falls uh, living properties. Next slide. So this map, I talked about the natural environment system. This map identifies, you can see visually the coverage of that natural environment system, but also the types of features that are, are also protected uh, to varying degrees in the natural environment system. Provincially significant woodlands are, are no development. Significant woodlands are also no development as well. 
So it gives you an idea of where these features are in the coverage. Next slide. So the other aspect, uh, you know, we talked about how the official plan identifies how we grow, what we protect, and then the tools or systems that we use to achieve those other two first two matters. And, and one is district and secondary plans, and, and you kind of you probably have a good idea of secondary plans are kind of the blueprint for how a community can grow and identify your intensification strategically. You can blend in your sub watershed planning, which is uh, identified here as another tool. Uh, incorporation of your infrastructure and transportation policies, particularly involved in, in looking at uh, things from a secondary plan or district plan level, and urban design, uh, which we think is really important. And we tried to take a leadership role and we'll work with our local planning departments on an urban design front and offer any assistance. Um, we think that's very important as well in uh, ensuring intensification, you know, is, is locates compatibly with, with the neighboring areas. And, and fits into the public realm. Next slide. So these are kind of our, our some of our key outcomes we see coming out of the Niagara official plan, helping to address affordable housing opportunities, climate change adaptation and mitigation, efficient use of infrastructure, investments in public amenities, protection of the natural environment and rural system and support for economic Next slide. So these are our steps of where we are. Um, we're holding a public open house on April 7th, the statutory public open house, and a public meeting, statutory public meeting, April 28th. The, the draft consolidated official plan has been out since uh, early January, and we we uh, received consultation feedback till March 4th. We're analyzing all that feedback and making revisions. And we will provide a, a revised plan, which will be the proposed consolidated uh, Niagara official plan for further formal consultation under the act. Everything we've done to date has been preliminary uh, and, and supplementary to, to all the required consultation under the act and has been very important in, in developing a good plan for Niagara. Excuse me, Mr. Mayor. Hello. Sorry. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead, Councillor Ayanoni. Uh, Excuse me one second, uh, Mr. Hayworth. I'm just wondering if Mr. Hayward could, could just clarify your statutory public open houses. Are they in person now and no longer Zoom? Uh, my understanding, I mean, this is a corporate decision uh, through the mayor to to Councillor Iononi. Uh, that is a corporate decision, but uh, my understanding is uh, there's Zoom. So, uh, to date. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, um, if, a couple of key takeaway points here. The official plan is adopted by regional council and approved by the province. The provincial approval is not appealable, and the official plan is not a static document. Although we're planning for the next 30 years to 2051, I mean, that's what we have to plan for, but it's not a static document. We'll be monitoring the official plan and we will update the official plan as we go along as necessary to address a change in growth trends, um, a change in technology, which maybe impacts how land Land, uh, land use systems and how land develops, et cetera. Next slide. And that concludes the presentation and myself and, and Commissioner Marcel Shurji, who's in attendance also, is we're available to answer any questions. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hayworth. Do we have any questions of council for, uh, for the presenter? Uh, Councilor Peter Angelo. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. Uh, through you to Mr. Hayworth, a uh, former employee yes, of the City of Niagara, Niagara Falls. Falls I don't employee. know if you mentioned yes. that. Hi, Dave. How are you? Um, Good. Thank you. I, I just had a question in regards to, uh, I know it lists on there mineral aggregate resources, um, but there, isn't, uh, there wasn't any information about that. 
Um, and I think everyone in Niagara Falls, especially in the one subdivision, uh, Fernwood knows that uh, there's an application that's been made for a quarry um, that's close to that subdivision. So I didn't know whether or not uh, in the region's new official plan there was an actual update to mineral aggregate resources. I wanted to ask if you could expand on that, please. Uh, yeah, through the mayor to the councillor, there, there is updated policies to address changes in legislation. I, I will say this, uh, uh, an application that's deemed complete is, is reviewed and processed under the current regional official plan and the policies that go along with Okay, so it's the same as any planning application in the sense that the day that the submission is made, those are the rules that the submission falls under as opposed to any new updates to the region's official plan. Right, that's correct. I mean, uh, the applications, if they're deemed complete and are in, um, you know, this official plan still has to be adopted by regional council and, and we want to get it adopted by June to meet the provincial target of, of uh, July, beginning of July, to get to the province. And then it's in the province's hands as to the timelines for approving the plan. I will say we're, we're in obviously in communication with the province and, and, uh, and there are, uh, we've had meetings and they assist in the review of the plan. So we're hoping that when it goes to the province for approval that, you know, approval comes expeditiously um, but that is under the province's control. Okay, thanks. And um, I, I guess through the mayor, would you have any insights as to what the, um, I guess, updates would be for, the, for, like for that item, for the mineral aggregate resources? Uh, I know we have some updates on haulage routes. There's, um, uh, I think, uh, a, there's updates on uh, what happens with with respect to decisions there's little there's very finite environmental type of updates that are related to it as well it's it's pretty uh, you know uh pretty complex or detailed in terms of the types of uh, policy changes um if that is something the council is interested we can provide a uh, uh, uh an update separately on on the difference between the existing plan and, and the new plan. Okay. Um, I know I would be interested, Your Worship, um, and I, I, I don't know if you need a motion for that. Uh, if you do, I'd be happy to make it. Uh, I appreciate Mr. Hayworth's uh, insight, and uh, if the information is forthcoming, that would be great. Well, but I think maybe you, why don't you, you might as well put it out there because you know sure. municipal yeah. and regional might be easier if you. Want yeah, I'm to happy to make a motion, Your yeah. Worship. I mean, I'd be interested to know what the policy updates were, just in regards to that one specific item, which is the mineral resources aggregate. Okay, motion so. by Councillor Peter Angelo to get an update from the region on miner mineral resource aggregate updates to the official plan. Second by Councillor Strange. Any discussion to to that motion? Okay, we'll call the vote. All those in favor. Okay, and that is approved. Thank you for that. Anything thank else? No, thank you. I wanted to thank Mr. Hayworth, but I have my microphone on. So okay, uh, so Mr. Hayworth, uh, Councilor Peter Angelo says thank you. <laughs> Appreciates that. Um, any other questions? Uh, how about um, uh, Ms. Dolch, was there anything you wanted to add to this uh, planning uh, update? Thank you, Your Worship. The only thing I will add is, is city staff have been working uh, diligently with the, the region on this official plan. We have been providing comments to the region on any concerns we do have. Um, and some of them we have outlined in our report, uh, some of the concerns, not concerns, but some of the things the city has to do to start to implement this, this plan as it moves forward. That's really all I have to add. Okay, that's great. Thank you for that. Yes, Councillor Coco. I have comments, not questions. Do you want to do that after? Yeah, well, there's no other questions right now. Probably now is as good a time as any. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I had four, four comments. Um, one of them is, I, I know in the reports and the plan, it talks about preservation of woodlots, animals, environment, natural environment, PSWs, uh, woodlands. We really need to focus on that. I know it's in there, but I think we, we should be doing more. Um, we talk about affordable housing. All of the plans that we're seeing is about affordable housing. We need rental affordable housing, so I want to put that there, out there because that's very different than affordable housing. Mm -hmm. There is a theory about single-family homes. Niagara Falls and Niagara has a very high percentage of seniors. Um, in, in the 2016 
census data, 21.4% were people over 65. Those people are eventually going to either A, sell their house or pass away eventually, and we're going to have a whole bunch of single family homes. So some, some theorists are saying that we don't need as many homes as are in some of our, our prospective plans because there's going to be a whole bunch of them coming up from our seniors either moving to other long-term care or other ones. So keep that in mind that there's going to be a bunch of um, single family homes coming up. Um, council did approve an urban boundary expansion and I believe that that was a mistake. Um, staff gave us a great opportunity to intensify within the urban boundary and we didn't do that. And those are my four points. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I did know if uh, Mr. Hayworth, if you had any comment on the rental afford affordability housing uh, that Councilor Lococo brought up. I know we, uh, we had some discussion on that. I wondered if there was any kind of feedback on, on that. Um, to the mayor, uh, we do have targets established in the official plan. Uh, I think the rental is 10% um, target. Um, there's also the opportunity for uh, for the uh, protected major transit station areas for the local municipality to work and they can do that in consultation with the region to establish like inclusionary zoning for protected major transit station areas uh, to to help a deal with affordable housing in that, that particular location as well. Okay, thank you for that. Yeah, Councillor Lococo and then Councillor Iannone. Next. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, to that point, the official plan, we've been working on it for a while, but the provincial government has put, a for, um, put the affordable housing task force report. And when I was attending one of the official plan meetings, I asked how those two are going to go together. And the, re the response was that they still have to go through all of those recommendations and figure out how the official plan is going to come out in the end of that. This affordable housing task force report, they want to talk about exclusionary zoning and we want to talk about inclusionary zoning specifically at transit hubs. So sometimes there's two reports and, and they have opposite ideas. So I, I think we really need to, to focus and, and get a plan together. Okay. Thank you for that. Any further comment from Mr. Hayworth or anyone on region in that regard or just leave it there? Uh, to the mayor, I know we've prepared some comments on, on the housing strategy that uh, the councillors mentioned, and I'm sure that'll be shared with the local municipalities. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Iannone. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Right now, we have such a shortage of affordable rental units. When we talk about affordable housing, um, there's a criteria that the benchmark, this is where if you make X amount of dollars, this is where your affordable housing um, kicks in and that's what you can call it. There are so many people right now don't have, who cannot afford to rent and will never be, afford, be able to afford affordable housing. They, they laugh when you say $400,000 is affordable housing. We are so fortunate that we own homes already. Um, Councillor Lococo and I attended a session online. Uh, all of council was invited and it was planning. Um, it was planners talking about our need for housing in the future, um, how we were, we need, maybe need to change the way that we're looking. I don't know, were you on there, Mr. Hayward? Do you know which uh -huh. meeting I'm talking about? Um, regional councillors and municipal councillors were, were invited on and we sat through, it was about an hour and a half, two hours. And at the end of the day, they said, you can build as much affordable housing as you need, but if you're not building affordable rental housing, you are not helping that market that has nowhere to go. So while we're all fortunate that we go home to our homes that we own after our council meetings, um, it's the people that don't have anywhere to go or who are waiting for assisted housing or, tr or spending two thirds, almost three quarters of their salary, uh, monthly salary on rent because the prices are so high now. So I, I don't wanna forget, statistics sound great and when you're watching, when you're a resident sitting at home watching us spew out statistics, we know what we're talking about and all they understand is, I can't find an apartment I can afford. And that's the end of, that's the bottom line for them. So I think that segment of our population is something we need to aim 
little bit stronger for. I read the same plans Councillor Lacoco did. She and I are online all the time trying to find initiatives. Um, we get called all the time from people looking for affordable housing. And what I think is affordable is not necessarily affordable for many people looking for homes. So I just want to put that out there for them because they often say they're yelling at the TV, what's affordable for you is not affordable for me. We need to keep that in mind. Thanks. Okay, thank you for that. I got Councillor Campbell. <clears throat> Excuse me, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, respect, with respect to uh, affordable rental units, about three months ago, my wife got a letter from the income tax department with respect to the home that we have next to us, which are rental units. And we have taken it upon ourselves to maintain the rents that have been there from day one when the people move in. And they're saying that because we're not charging enough money, we can't, or my wife can't, uh, apply any losses on the uh, income from the uh, apartments. I think that the uh, province and the federal government really have to get their act together with respect to affordable rental units and uh, the criteria with respect to the Income Tax Act, I think is a stumbling block and I'm gonna push this further with the, uh, the uh, federal MPs. Yeah, uh, good, good point. Um, didn't know if anyone wanted to win on that or we'll just leave that as a comment uh, for everyone. Thank you for that, Councillor Campbell. Well, if there's no further questions or comments, we're looking for a motion to receive the presentation and approve the, rec the report, uh, the staff report. Motion by Councillor Strange, seconded by Councillor Cario. We'll call the vote, all those in favor? Okay, and that is approved unanimously. Thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Hayworth uh, and uh, company. I know they're all there. I know we've got uh, Michelle Sergi, our Commissioner of Planning, and Diana Morielli. So thank you to all of you for being on the call and being available for us. Thank you very much. It was our pleasure and good evening. Thank you very much. Okay, moving along. Item 6.2, Presentation Advisory Services Draft Core Assets Management Plan, and we invite our Director of Municipal Works, Mr. Nickel, to take the floor. The TAN, Mr. Nickel, to take the Hi. floor. Good evening, it's nice to be back in chambers in person. Uh, today's staff are pleased to present to Council our Draft Asset Management Plan for our core assets. Uh, the intention of today's presentation is to introduce the asset management plan to Council and to take note of any of your feedback. We'll also be creating a landing page on our website for the asset management plan that will post the draft plan and it will be there for future reference. The draft will also be replaced with a final plan and any future references and updates to the plan once approved by Council. All of your feedback today and any other comments we receive from Council or the public will be reviewed and considered prior to our return on the 21st of June when we plan to come back to Council for approval of the final asset management plan for our core assets. This is in keeping with the provincial deadline of July 1st, 2022. On top of that, our work on the non-core asset management plan is expected to kick off later this year with a completion date no later than 2024 and we'll follow that up with a deeper dive into levels of service. You'll hear more about this during an up upcoming presentation. And now to share some more of those details, I'd like to introduce Tara Gudgeon, our Infrastructure Asset Manager, who's a newer member of Municipal Works and has been doing an amazing job leading our Asset Management Plan project. She has a few words to say before introducing our consultant who will walk you through the presentation. Thank Thanks. you, Eric. Thank you, Eric, and good afternoon, everyone. Through the chair, Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of City Council. As Eric mentioned, I'm Tara Gudgeon. I'm the Infrastructure Asset Manager in Municipal Works. And for you this evening, we're bringing forward the draft asset management plan for our core assets. Thinking backwards, the City released its first asset management plan documents in 2013 and 2014 to align with the province's program Building Together Guide for Municipal Asset Management Programs. In 2017, the province approved Ontario Regulation 588-17, Asset Management Planning for Municipal Infrastructure under the Infrastructure for Jobs and Prosperity Act in 2015. 
This regulation dictates how cities and municipalities must undertake asset management planning, documentation, and reporting. In response to the requirements under the Act, the City has developed the 2022 Asset Management Plan for Core Assets, with, which describes the actions required to manage the City's core infrastructure assets that meet service levels while managing risk and costs. Core assets for the purposes of the Act include our roads, bridges and culverts, water, wastewater and stormwater infrastructure. Ontario Regulation 588.17 also sets forth specific recording requirements for municipalities. As an example, by July 1st, 2019, the City had developed and published its strategic asset management policy, which was required under the reg regulation. As Eric mentioned, by July 1st, 2022, every municipality must prepare an asset management plan for core infrastructure. And as such, this evening we're presenting our draft asset management plan for core infrastructure for Council's consideration and feedback. As Eric mentioned, tonight's feedback will be incorporated into the final document before we bring back the Asset Management Plan to Council for endorsement in June. A draft copy of the report has been included in the Council Agenda Package for those of you wishing to review it. Once the Asset Management Plan for Core Assets has been filed with the Ministry in July of this year, staff will work to develop an Asset Management Plan for the rest of the City's assets, or the non-core assets, which is due by July 1, 2024. Those assets do include um, uh, recreation assets, fire, fleet, facilities, our library assets, our cemetery assets, our traffic assets, just to name a few. Throughout the development of the draft asset management plan, several recommendations were made to facilitate the development of asset management planning and programming capability at the city. At this time, however, recommendations are being presented for information purposes only. Specific recommendations designed to improve the City's asset management capabilities will be submitted for Council consideration in June when we present the final plan. The intent of developing asset management plans is not only to meet regulatory requirements, but the plans themselves also serve as a tool to be integrated with and to be used and or to inform the budget process moving forward. With us remotely this evening is Amon Singh and Donna Quirin excuse me, Kuring is her, from SLBC Incorporated, a management engineering firm, uh, excuse me, specializing in municipal management and asset management planning. Uh, this firm was retained by the city to help us develop our asset management plan for core assets. And tonight they're gonna to be presenting to you the key sections and takeaways from the asset management plan. If we could pass it along to our friends. Hi, my name is Donna Coringesser. Um, I hope you can hear me. Um, and thanks for having me um, this evening. Um, I wanted to, uh, I'm just gonna go walk through the presentation. The agenda, whoops, I'm gonna put a bit in presentation. No, I'm sorry. The agenda essentially follows the table of contents for the asset management plan. So just give a brief introduction, talk about the state of the infrastructure, levels of service, risk management strategy, a life cycle management strategy, a financial strategy, and then um, talk about improvements and next steps. One of the things that's important, and um, Tara talked about the, the history of your asset management program, is that you're continually improving and updating information on, uh, on your assets and the services that they support. So the first thing is just a, a brief introduction. And I thought it would be good to start just about what is asset management, because I think there are a lot of different ideas. Really what you're doing is realizing value from your assets to deliver services. A lot of, one of the, 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 the things that differentiates um, municipalities is you use a lot of assets to deliver services. So um, asset management makes a lot of sense. And the other things you want to do is to minimize the total cost of as the asset ownership and um, manage those assets at an acceptable level of risk within an environment of limited resources. We like to think of it as really juggling the three balls off to the right here. So you're looking at what level of service should I deliver? What is the cost to deliver that service? And what is the risk of me not delivering the service that I've stated that I'm going to deliver? Uh, Tara went into a fair bit of detail about um, the new regulation, new-ish. New um, 
from 19, uh, 2017. It's um, basically asset management planning for uh, municipal infrastructure. She talked about the difference between the core and the non-core assets. And um, essentially what we've done is we've captured the requirements of the regulation in this graphic here. So it really follows the the table of contents that I just went through, state of infrastructure, levels of service, management strategy, financing strategy. So these are all requirements of the regulation, and this provides the details. Um, there are three deadlines. You've already hit the one deadline, which is the July 2019 for your asset management policy. So the next deadline, according to the regulation, is July 22nd, uh, 2022, which is the reporting of your core assets and then uh, 2024 for your non-core assets, and then July 2025 for both, for something that's called proposed level of service. So what we're reporting on today is for the current levels of service. So what are you currently providing? And then in, in the future, by July 2025, it'll be for, um, for the, uh, the proposed levels of service. Uh, in pretty big letters over here, we have grant eligibility. So why asset management? It's to meet the regulation, but it's also a requirement in many cases to be um, eligible for grant monies. So it's um, it's a, a good idea to um, to provide the, the information that we're providing to the province. Another thing that asset management does is it supports city planning. Um, we just we just heard from uh, on the official plan. Um, Asset management supports your um, strategic plan as well as the official plan. So we, what we're looking at is, is defining in the asset management plans the levels of service and understanding how this, the assets support that, those levels of service, understanding potential risk of not meeting your asset and your, and your, your customer levels of service. And then if there's a risk that you may not meet those levels of service, what activities do you need to undertake? If you're not meeting the capacity needs, and um, we just heard about the you know, growth, if you're not meeting those capacity needs, there may be a requirement to expand your assets, to upgrade your assets. Um, if you're, you certainly want to be, be providing reliable services, so you, you may need to renew or you do need to renew your assets. That might mean rehabilitating, it might mean replacing your assets. And then you're going to undertake operating and, uh, on, and operations, and, and that includes things like snow clearing. And you also are going to maintain your assets over time. And these activities cost money, and um, that's why we have a financing strategy. Some of that money comes from development charges, but the bulk of it comes from your capital budget and your operating budget. And after you've undertaken these uh, activities at, at a cost, there could be uh, – there, there, there will uh, – naturally be some residual risk, but you're, it's deemed to be acceptable once you've undertaken these activities. So again, what we're doing is we're looking at these three things, the levels of service, um, the risk, the cost of service, which is a link to the activities that you undertake. So it's, a, it's, a, it's pretty um, important to understand uh, what you're trying to achieve and, and link, um, Tara mentioned linking your um, your asset management to your budgeting process, and that really comes in when we talk about finance and strategy. So I'm just going to dig into the um, to the to the actual meat of the report. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the state of the infrastructure. So this is what the regulation requires. So an inventory of your assets, the replacement costs, the average age, the condition, and the approach to assessing condition. So the assets that uh, that you have that are considered, again, uh, Tara mentioned core assets. So it's roads and related assets, so your paved roads, your unpaved roads, sidewalks, medians, and barriers, your bridges and your culverts, your stormwater management assets, and, and there they are there, your water assets and your wastewater assets. So all told, you have over $2 billion worth of assets in 2020 do uh, dollars. And what we've done here is broken it down by percent, so you can see that the lion's share of your assets are in roads and related assets. The next um, largest group is your water, then wastewater, then stormwater, and your bridges and your culverts. Um, the asset age and estimated life. Um, what we have here is the, the bottom number and the, the size of the bar here is the age, the average age of your assets. So the oldest assets that you have are your bridges and culvert assets. The top number is the expected service life of those assets. So if, you, if we look at your stormwater assets, they're sort of in uh, lower mid age, whereas your bridges and your culverts are, are getting a little bit older. 
Um, so it just sort of, sort of goes through them all. They're, it's all sort of mid, mid range, but some of them are a little bit younger and some of them are a little bit older. In addition to understanding the, um, the age and the expected service life of the assets, we also want to know, and it's, it's more in, informative to understand the actual condition. So we have a grading system here from very good. It's just a five point scale, good, fair, poor, very poor. And then we have some assets that we, aren't, we don't know the condition of. Um, so some of the assets are assessed based on industry standard um, condition uh, protocols. And some of them we've used age as a proxy for that, for the condition. And some of them we don't know because we don't know the install date and we don't have any condition data. Those assets are the catch basins, which show up here in the stormwater and the, um, the water services, water mains and, and curb stops, which show up here. Um, just so you know, the dollar values here are, you know, the, the, this scale over here represents the dollar values. So you can see that the roads and related assets make up the, the, the I think it was 34% of your, your asset base. Um, so you can see here the, the, the amount of, uh, the dollar value of assets that are in very good, good and fair condition, poor and very poor. And then the, the small gray bit there is unknown. Um, what we're, we, I ha we have is the number on the top here is the percent of assets in fair or better condition. So 80%, this, uh, the yellow, the green, and this green represent 80% of the total size of that bar, excluding the unknowns. What we're generally aiming for is 80% or more of your assets in very good or good condition. So you can see that you're actually in really quite good shape here. The, the bulk of your assets, which are the, your roads and related, are 80% 80, 80 are in fair and better. Your bridges and culverts, 93% are in fair and better. Stormwater, 96. Water, 84. And your wastewater assets have a fairly significant proportion of assets that are in, um, are in poor or very poor condition. And what you're going to see is this is going to be reflected as we go through um, and look at all the different sections of the asset management plans, these assets that are in poor and very poor condition are, are gonna come, come to the front because those are the ones that we need to do, um, to, to do work on. Um, the other thing that the regulation asks for is um, how you've assessed condition. We use the data to make decisions. The confidence we have in the data is reflected in the confidence that we have in the decisions that are made. We prioritize the data quality based on the importance of the decision. And this table down here shows the different, the five different condition grades. And I'll, I'll skip over the first one, but essentially what you're using is a, a, an industry standard condition index for your pavement. So pavement's a lot, it costs a lot of money, it's worth a lot. Um, so it's a good idea to use an industry standard and, and that's what you've used. And that's how we've determined what the condition is of your pavement. You've also, and, and there's actually a regulation that requires that you use a, an industry standard bridge condi condition index to assess your bridges every two years. We've used, uh, or you, when you have a water main break, you, you observe the condition and record that. So we've been able to use that to assess the condition of your water mains. And then you've just recently done a uh, closed circuit TV inspection to, to develop structural condition scores on your wastewater sewers. So all of these assets, we have a, a high degree of confidence in the condition that we provided. However, there are a number of assets and say um, your uh, sanitary sewers, we don't have, or sorry, your storm sewers, we don't have this level of confidence because we're just basing it on age. Some assets, we don't know the year it was installed and we don't have condition data. So we don't, we, that, those ones were unknown, but these ones, um, some of your other assets, we're using age as a proxy for condition. So it, this is something that says to us, we don't have as much confidence as we have with the pavement, as we have with the bridges, the water mains, and your, um, your uh, wastewater sewers. So again, that's a pretty good story. Like if you had all of your assets were below 80% fair or better, it would be um, uh, a, a bit more of a concern, but it's, you're in and actually in fairly good shape. So the next category is to talk about the levels of service. And um, so we have customer levels of service. So this is very clearly should be linked to your strategic priorities. And then we have um, your asset performance. Your assets enable you to deliver the services. If your assets are not in good, in good shape, it's difficult and you're at risk of not delivering those levels of service. So the levels of service really are the bridge between your strategic plan and your official plan and 
the your 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 uh, capital and operating budgets and the the activities that you need to undertake to improve your levels of service and your asset condition are the the needed activities that you you uh, undertake on those assets. So levels of service are very very important and a starting point really. Okay, the uh, the um, the uh, Ontario regulation has required reporting for core assets. And these are the um, the indicators that you're required to report on. These first three are just um, really it's about the density of roads, different types of roads within the city. And we we um, we we've calculated based on information from from your staff what those are. Um, and then what we've done is the, the next one is around um, uh, your pavement condition index. And again, that's a, a, a an, industry, an industry standard. And that's for your paved and your unpaved roads. And then the bridges, again, it's we're using an industry standard. There's one related to loading restrictions or dimension restrictions. So, so essentially, the, the province is asking for every municipality to report on these, these same metrics with respect to the roads, the bridges, the stormwater, the water, and the wastewater. And you can see that you're, you're looking actually very good. Uh, from fair to very good for all of these, and, and a lot of it, a lot of these are related to physical condition, but some of them are related to um, other things such as the boil water advisory and the number of breaks. So that's again a pretty good news story. Now I wanted to share some things with you just so that you understand that that's sort of a bit of a high level, and we've done we've dug a little bit deeper, but. For this five-year um, storm, which was one of the regu re regulatory requirements. We wanted to show you about the confidence in that information. Your grade is good. Your performance is good. The grade is good. It's just that there's a, not a lot of confidence in that, that number because it's based on um, the fact that you're, you, you, the, the, the low confidence is, is based on the fact that you've got, if they're asking for a two-year storm and you've only really got your, some of your system is only designed to a, a two, sorry, it's based on a five-year, you're only, some of your design is only to a two year. And also you've got the complication in that some of your sewers are combined. So you basically got um, combined uh, storm and um, sanitary running in some of your sewers and that's creating a bit of an, of an issue. The other thing here is that's low is as we pointed out, you have some, um, some of your assets are in uh, your storm sewers are in, um, poor condition, but we, we're not really confident in that information because it's age-based. The, the, um, the city staff has plans to conduct CCTV inspections as you did on your, um, on your sanitary sewer, on your storm sewers. So the confidence is low. This is based on age. Once we get the information back from the CCTV inspection that's it's going to be ongoing over the next several years, we'll be able to say with higher confidence, perhaps, that you're in very you're you're in very good condition. Right now, we don't have that confidence because we're we're working on um, information that's age based rather than condition based. The next thing that we wanted to just point out, we're not going to go through all of this, is um, you just finished you looking um, doing CCTV inspections on your sanitary sewers, and they're coming out poor. It's just poor. It's not like really poor, um, but we have a high degree of confidence that your assets are in poor condition. We just wanted to point out that the, the value that you get from doing these inspections is that it gives you a high degree of confidence. And now you can say with confidence that these are in poor condition, whereas we're not really that confident that your, your storm uh, sewer assets are, they're, they're listed in very high, con or very good condition, but we're not that confident because it's based on age. It just, we just wanted to highlight the benefit that you get from doing those inspections. So that's looking at levels of service. So once we've looked at level of service, if you, if you sort of remember back to that one drawing, we wanna look at, um, at risk. What is the risk of not meeting that level of service? And the regulation doesn't actually separate levels of, uh, of risk out, but they do um, state that you are, for, for life cycle strategies, that you are to um, look at least cost and an acceptable level of risk. So you really do need to understand what level of risk those assets um, pose to you delivering those services. So when we talk about risk, we talk we, we can talk about two separate things. 
So one is, what's the consequence of failure? So how critical are those assets to the delivery of your services? And what is the probability of failure of an asset? So we, we use the symbols consequence of failure and probability of failure. And when we talk about how critical something is or what's the consequence, it could have a financial impact. It could have a health and safety impact. It could have an impact on the service delivery itself or your rep the city's reputation, or it could have an impact on the environment. So there are a lot of different ways to look at the consequence of failure. So if a, if a bridge is, is, um, is on an arterial uh, road, it is deemed to be very highly important because if that bridge failed, um, there could be health and safety issues. The, you, it would take a long time to get your service back. It would cost a lot of money to replace it. You may end up in the front page of the newspaper and it could, it, if it's over a water course, it could cause some environmental damage. So we've, this, the city has rated all, all of their core assets with respect to the consequence of failure. And the probability of failure is determined it for reliability with respect to condition. So we use risk to select an appropriate management strategy and we use risk to prioritize if we don't have enough funds. So we talked about the consequence or the criticality of the assets and we have rated the all of your assets, the criticality from one to five. And as I said, some of your bridges that are on arterial roads are considered to be um, sort of very, very critical. Whereas some of the things, um, I think you have some, some bridges say over um, uh, on road allowances, which are deemed to be very low um, criticality of failure. But the thing that's that's important is this is the criticality and i said there are sort of two dimensions to risk and then the other thing that's important is the probability of failure which in the case of reliability is is the condition so um you may have a bridge that's in very highly um critical but if it's in very good condition we're not that concerned about but if you have a bridge that's highly critical and is not in great condition then we, we want to pay attention to it. And that's really what we're showing up in this corner here. It's the, the assets that you have that are of high criticality and, and are, in, are in poor or very poor condition that are showing up in this corner. Um, so the, the good news for the city, again, is that the, the, the assets that show up in the, this, this top red corner are shown here. And that's 7.76. Um, million dollars worth of assets and it's but it's only makes up less than half a percent of your overall asset inventory so the bulk of your inventory 95 almost 95 percent of them are showing up here under the moderate to low so they're all down they're all in this section here and that's exactly what you want to see so um, this sort of begs the question what what are the assets that are showing up in this corner so there's a bridge that you've got, the Beck Road Bridge, that has a bridge condition index of 49, which is not good. It's, it's deemed to be in poor condition. It's not very poor, but it's poor. And then you've got a number of roads that are deemed to be highly critical um, that are in very poor condition. So these are the, these are the bridges that are the, 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 the assets that we want to pay most attention to. And these are the ones that should be coming up in your 10-year capital plan. Um, a th another thing to note, though, is to watch because basically what happens is assets are going to move up like this over time because this is the condition here and, and they will deteriorate over time. So you also want to keep your eye on what's coming up in the um, in the near future if you don't do what you need to do to, to sustain those assets. So if I have an asset that's in that as soon as I, I you replace and this bridge is, is due for replacement, as soon as you replace that bridge, it's going to move down to here because it's now going to be in very good condition. So you're you're essentially managing um, your assets in these these streams of, um, of depending on what criticality stream they're in. So again, we're using risk to understand what we need to do to those assets, the strategy, and we're using that risk to prioritize the work if we don't have enough money. There's no, it, it just doesn't, wouldn't make sense to spend money on doing something down here when you've got assets that are up in here that, that need to be worked on. Unless, it, and sometimes it's not perfect because you may need to, um, to do something because you're doing something else in the area and it makes sense, but often um, you, you wanna wait until the right time to do the work. So that's risk. And that risk uh, really relates in very, uh, very much to the life cycle management strategy. So it helps us decide on what we need to do or what we want to do 
on the assets. So the regulation requires us to look at the population and employment forecast, which we just heard about in the, from the official plan. Um, and we, then it, it requires you to list the life cycle activities that are needed for each of the next 10 years to manage the demand caused by growth or upgrade to of existing assets, but also to maintain the current level of service at least cost and acceptable level of risk. So that's why we really cared about risk. So when we talk about life cycle management strategies, we're looking at a number of different categories that we put them into. So you acquire the assets, you operate them, you maintain them, and then you renew, you renew them. Um, and then it's sort of a, a very much a, a cycle around and around. So when we talk about the different strategies, this is looking at maintenance. So if you, if you choose to just continue on with a, a, your, your current maintenance stream, you, your assets deteriorating, this is the condition of the asset and this is time along here. You, your asset deteriorates over time and at some point you may not have enough money. You may say, I'm gonna cut my maintenance budget. And what that's going to do is it's going to cut the, the, the life of the asset. If it, was, if it was going to go to say, say here and then get replaced, it may be that you need to replace it much earlier because you're not maintaining the asset. So the, the, the amount of maintenance you apply to, um, to your assets definitely has an impact on their, their life. So this is looking at maintenance. And then if we look at renewal, this is what this is all this picture is about is your assets going to deteriorate over time and you're not going to want to do anything while it's in in um, very good condition it's going to drop into um, good condition and while it's in good condition you may choose to do some form of rehabilitation and it's always about whether it's even feasible some assets you don't there's, there's no refurbishment or rehabilitation that can be done you just run it to failure um, and then um, you, you replace it at the end of its life. And it also depends on what risk category it's in. The more, um, the more risk it, 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 the more critical the asset is to service delivery, the more likely you're going to undertake these, act, these renewal activities earlier in its life so that you don't end up in a, in a situation where you have an unexpected failure. So this is just sort of explaining to you the different types of activities that are involved in life cycle management and there are, there are a whole host and it's it's interrelated so if i choose not to maintain my assets it's going to deteriorate more quickly and therefore the time in which i'm going to be required to rehabilitate it or replace it is going to come sooner and that drives the overall cost of um of main, of sustaining your assets higher over time um, I'm just, this is just a picture of, of the growth in the upgrade needs. It's a requirement of the regulation that you provide uh, a graph that shows, or at least a listing of what your historic growth has been and what your planned growth is. We'll have to compare this to what the region has in mind now, but th this, was some, this was what we had at the time that we, we produced this. So the assets are being added in two ways. The developers are constructing assets and you're assuming those. So you end up owning those assets and you have to now go through that asset life cycle and you need to operate, maintain them and replace them over time. It sounds like a great deal that you're getting these for free, but you have to, you have to sustain them over their life cycles. And the city constructs um, assets as well. And we used the 2019 um, development charge study which listed a number of projects that the city is going to be undertaking to develop the list of, of growth projects. And again, the confidence in that is not really, really high. We're, we're many years on, and I, I think you've, you've got more information on, uh, on that, and you're, you're about to, I think, update the DC study. Um, now, when we talk about renewal, remember we had um, acquire, so that was the, the slide we just looked at, then we had operate, maintain, and, and then renew. So this is the renewal, and this is typically where we have issues. The fact that your assets are in reasonably good condition is a plus because generally you're at the top of that curve that I, where I showed your assets deteriorating. However, so what this graph here shows is the, the next 10 years. So if you remember, the regulation required us to look at the next 10 years and it, include, it, it provides the renewal needs over the next 10 years. And it's divided into two, two different com, uh, compartments of assets. So these are all core assets. We divided them into two groups. The blue is water and wastewater, and the um, the gray is roads, bridges, and stormwater. And so, it's not it's not unusual for the first year to have a lot of need because 
there's there's some work that hasn't been done and this is basically called the backlog so you've got a fairly substantial backlog here which is the difference between this 90.8 and this is the average amount that you need over the next um the next 10 years so that's that it, it, there's there's a backlog of work here and what we've done is we've listed what that is so for water there's a backlog of water main work and for wastewater sewers remember we it, it, right back in the beginning we talked about a um, uh, your your storm or sorry your sanitary wastewater assets are not in in great shape. They're the of, of all the assets you have, those are the ones that are not in the best shape. So that's what this twenty million dollars is. There's a twenty million dollar backlog in sewer work. And remember, again, you just re, you just did your CCTV inspection, so we're very confident that that is the case. So that is the uh, the sewers, the manholes, and the laterals. And then remember on the risk graph, there was that one bridge, the Beck Road Bridge. So that's what's showing up on the, in the backlog here for your um, roads and bridges. And then we have almost $12 million worth of sidewalks that are showing up as backlog. But we're not very confident in that information because it's age-based. So one of the things the city will plan to do over the next little while is to, to, to get out there and inspect those so that you can confirm whether this is true or you can you can then be more confident. You can lower the number and be confident in the number. So um, it, this is just an, it shows how the, the the condition flows through into the renewal needs. So what what this average here of 32.8 uh, million for both it, it's combined for water and wastewater and bridges, uh, roads and stormwater. What what we're really doing is taking this this bar here and we're spreading it out underneath between this average and all these bars. So on average over the next 10 years you need to have apply 32.8 million dollars to um, to renew your your core assets. Now this red line here is what we're calling the life cycle annual renewal need. Because your assets are in good condition this number is actually lower than this number which is because your, your assets are in good condition that makes sense. This comes from the Canadian Infrastructure Report Card. There's a, a document that the, um, the, 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 the uh, federally they publish that shows across the country where everyone's assets are, and it includes rates for renewal for um, basically the core assets, but some of the other assets as well. So this is a good indication that you're you're in, you're you can expect in the longer term for this 32.8 to get closer to 40. So you've got some time here to catch up and um, basically take, get rid of the backlog over the next while. Uh, but overall, you can expect that your water, your um, your core assets are going to cost you somewhere around forty million dollars a year just to renew. So it's a fairly a large piece of money, but it's um, it's what it is. Um, so if we apply the plan strategy, so we've got a, a, a strategy to undertake to the, those, those works, you'll take, this is your current condition, and what will happen is once, once we start applying those, um, those strategies, the condition will improve over time so that we're, our, our objective is to keep all of your assets at 80% um, uh, fair or better condition. So it's, it's fairly easy to do that with, with the amount of money. If you don't pl apply any money, if you don't um, have that 32.8 uh, million dollars a year, this shows how how rapidly your assets are going to fall off. So, in 10 years, you will be nowhere near for all of your assets on average of having that that pretty nice picture that you have at this point in time. So it just gives you a, an idea about the impact of undertaking those renewal strategies, and it it starts catching up on on you pretty quickly. Um, so just a little bit of a word about maintenance. Um, maintenance um, needs have been have been shown here. So currently, your budget for operating operations and maintenance for your core assets is 45.6 million dollars a year. That's shown with this this yellow here. In um, discussions with your staff, they believe that they need closer to it looks like about 51 million dollars at this point in time. And then as you add assets that number is going to increase over time because you've got more roads to plow, you've got more um, you know, roads to crack seal and, and, uh, and other operations and maintenance activities to undertake. So this is just, it, it's not a, a horrible um, picture, but 
you just have to be very mindful that as you add assets, you're adding a liability in the future for operations and maintenance. So this is a summary with all of the uh, different life cycle activities. So the, the renewals in blue, the upgrade, which is uh, this tiny sliver in red, the new assets, assets due to growth are here. And then this is your maintenance and operation. So overall, when we, to we total it all up, there's a need of um, $93.5 million per year um, to, to uh, undertake the life cycle needs that you've got. So now that we understand what the needs are, we can um, look at what funding is available. And, and just so you know, the, the current, the, 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 what you need to report for July of 2022 for your core assets includes what we've just discussed. It's, it's what, are the, what are the costs for the needed activities? So what are the costs of the needs for, for growth, upgrade, and, um, and to maintain the level of service? Whoops, what did I do there? Sorry. Um, but what we've done in this plan is we've, we've gone ahead a little bit because it's quite informative to make a comparison between what the needs are and what the funding projected to be available to undertake those needs are. That's really where we start getting at understanding uh, whether you're in a very good or, or not a very good financial position and then identifying the shortfalls. This is not required until 2025. But we, we did it because it's, it's best practice and it really gives you a heads up and, 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 and allows you to understand where you sit. So this gets fairly complicated, but I'll just walk you through it fairly slowly. So this is what we show. This is for, for transportation and stormwater. So what we've done is we've divided this into two bits. One is for transportation and stormwater. The, the next slide is going to look, take a look at water and wastewater. And the reason we've divided it into these groups is the funding sources are different. So transportation and stormwater are funded through taxes, whereas water and wastewater are funded through uh, rates. So this is for transportation and stormwater. So we have this backlog, and then we have for each of the next 10 years, these are the needs. And this is the average need for transportation and stormwater, which is 21.7. We've also shown you here what you've spent over the last five years and the average for that. So the need that, that what you've spent to spend over the last five years is 13.6. Your need over the next 10 years is 21.7. So there's a pretty substantial increase in needs. And in large part, that's because we've got this backlog that we need to get rid of, which will fill in this, all of these little white spaces here. Then what we've planned, we, and, and this, is, this is providing that CERC number that we talked about. So this is sort of like your long-term need so you can expect over the longer term to need $30 million a year. Right now, you've got to, because your assets are in pretty good condition, you, you don't have as much of a need. But this is what your current budget is here, which is 15.5, which is, you know, you, you had 13.6 on average over the last five years. It's been bumped up a bit to 15.5. But in fact, you need over the next 10 years, 21.7. So that leaves a funding gap, an annual funding gap of 6.3 and it the requirement of the regulation is in fact that you you provide the the annual funding for a ten, the the, ten, the full 10 years so what you'll be required to do is to provide that by 2025 you don't have to provide it now but you need to be working towards having a 10-year um, forecast or budget forecast of budget so there is a gap here and if you if you look at you you you've got a backlog, which means you've had gaps in the previous years. And if we look at, if this is 6.3 this year, and if you only have that same amount of funding for the next 10 years, you're gonna accumulate more backlog every year. So you're, if you, it, you there's 6.3 gap now, next year, if you, there's 6.3, over that 10 years, you will, ha you will acquire a gap that totals $63 million. So this $40 million gap, dollar gap that you've got now will rise to almost $100 million. So it's really important that you're doing this now and that you understand that you need to, um, to, to look at additional um, funding for, uh, for these assets. So that's the transportation and stormwater uh, picture. Um, this is the water and wastewater picture and it's a much, much nicer picture You've got, in, in fact, it's it's ironic. You've got a huge backlog here, but you also have the funding in place 
So this is, this is the need. The average need over the 10 years is 11. Your historic spend is, is um, 6.8, and your, your current funding in 2022 is 9.5. So that leaves you with a, a much smaller gap for water and wastewater of, of $1.5 million per year. It's not nothing, but it's certainly not as, as bad as your, um, as your water and your wastewater, or sorry, your transportation and your stormwater. Now, one of the things that's really quite important is um, water and wastewater are, are paid through user fees. So the, um, the, the studies that you do to determine how much, what those fees should be, take into account these needs. So there's been some planning that's been done already to, and that's, that's in our view, why this, this gap is much lower for your, your, um, your water and your wastewater. Now, one of the, the, the things to keep no, to note though is we talked about sewers and um, combined sewers, and you've got some programs about separating those sewers so that you are not you're you're not taking wastewater and putting it in back into the environment, and this is going to take some of this money away. So not all of this budget is going to be spent on renewing those assets. Some of that money will be spent on separating your sewers, um, and we heard about climate change, and um, there's Certainly, one of the the things that it will could possibly do is to um, wreak havoc with your water and your wastewater um, assets, as well as your stormwater assets. So again, a pretty a, a much much better picture um, here. And and if you note the the long term is is not that high either. So you're you're certainly your budget is in the ballpark for not only the short term, the next ten years, but it's it's also looking pretty good for the long term. Um, so about uh, closing the funding gap, um, you can reduce um, the needs by deferring projects on lower risk assets. So if you think about that 10 year window we, we, we were looking at, you can push some of those out so that you don't need the funding in the near term, but recognize that as we talked about, that will increase your maintenance costs. So it, you're, 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 you're adding to, the, to those costs or your assets are not going to last as long and and the overall big picture over the longer term isn't going to be that good. So you can look at, so this is reducing the need. This is increasing the available funding. So that's leveraging the, the third party grants. And again, we talked about <coughs> needing um, uh, the, to meet the OREG in order to be eligible for those grants, or you can increase taxes or rates. Another thing that many municipalities are doing now is to, um, to change from a, um, a tax-based stormwater funding source to a dedicated stable stormwater user fee to recover the full cost of the stormwater system very much in the way, same way that you're, you're doing that for your water and your wastewater um, assets. And the next, um, the next thing here is to look at um, updating the rate studies for water and wastewater to make sure that the, the rates that you're collecting on, on those assets are adequate to cover the, the longer term. And then updating your master plan and your development charge background studies just so that we understand growth better because growth plays a, a part in um, in your operations and maintenance costs and then um, you know as i talked about the fact that in by 2025 you need to have a 10-year operating and capital budget forecast you only have single year right now which um, is not in, in accordance with the it's in accordance with the, the reg right now but not in by 2025. And I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, uh, Aman Singh, if he's on the line. Yeah, thank you, Donna. So the next few slides will summarize key improvement recommendations focused on improving both AM planning processes and governance at the city. Next slide. So in terms of the AM planning recommendations, uh, a number of recommendations were put forward uh, based on the, the process of developing this asset management plan. The first recommendation would be to improve the understanding of the condition of the city's sidewalks, stormwater mains, manholes, and ponds to optimize future asset interventions and the timing of those interventions. <clears throat> the second recommendation would be to establish formal service measures for operations, maintenance, and financial sustainability targets, which will enable the city to focus its resources on the key operational and maintenance activities, as well as longer-term goals and objectives 
related to financial sustainability and affordability. The third recommendation is around master plans, and it's really focused on ensuring that the city updates its master plans regularly to improve growth forecasts, as well as opportunities to reduce cost of service through advances in technology and non-asset solutions. The fourth recommendation is to, as Donna just touched on, develop budgets by asset class year over year over a 10-year planning horizon. Again, this is a requirement to meet compliance with the AM planning regulation. <clears throat> and the final recommendation would be to um, consider or review a dedicated stormwater user fee to support management and operations of the city's stormwater assets. Um, a number of municipalities already have this in place and um, a number of them are sort of undertaking studies to understand the implications of an additional stormwater uh, levy uh, in addition to taxes and the water and wastewater rate. <coughs> Next slide. From an AM governance perspective, it is also recommended that the city establish a formal AM governance model that would operate similar to an asset management office. The idea would be that the AMO, the asset management office, would have a mandate to build asset management capability across the city. <clears throat> As such, it should sit closer to the top of the organization where it's able to influence and uh, achieve economies of scale. The purpose of the asset management office would be to help the city prioritize resources related to service delivery, <clears throat> also to ensure it's doing the right activities at the right time for the right reasons and the right costs. It would also standardize asset management processes across the different service delivery groups and serve as a center of excellence for asset management and service delivery. Staff will be bringing recommendations for an AM governance model and structure in June for Council's review and consideration. Next slide. In closing, um, City staff will continue to work with Council on strategies and recommendations with the aim of managing the infrastructure gap in the interim. With a long-term objective of decreasing and eventually closing the infra infrastructure gap over time. The AM plan that we presented today focuses on the city's core assets. And over the next few years, the city will develop asset management plans for its non-core assets. Um, and it is suspected uh, that the AM plan for the non-core assets will share a similar narrative as the core assets. With that, we'd be more than happy to answer any questions uh, that you may have. Okay, thank you for that um, thorough presentation. Do we have any questions of council for the presenters? Okay, seeing none. Um, yes, I'm sorry, Councilor Peter Angel. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. I don't know if I have a question of the presenter or if it would be of staff. Um, I mean, I know that we've heard for years actually about the asset management plan coming, and I don't know if others have been as interested, but um, I mean, to me, it's probably the biggest test that we've ever had. Um, you know, we've now entered the age of cataloging everything so we've been able to go out and you know get an assessment of all our roads and our sidewalks and our sewers and our water pipes and and you know things of that <coughs> nature so i mean to me the you know the biggest question is are we spending the taxpayers dollars responsibly mm -hmm. and um so it's nice to now have some information back and i think it's the first information that we've ever had in the history of niagara falls which is you know a little bit more than 150 years old um, you know, the numbers are there. It says that we have over $2 billion in assets. And while we do have some, you know, some small funding gaps, um, you know, just like the presenter said, it's nothing that is insurmountable. Um, you know, mm -hmm. Mr. Nickel or some other staff can probably, you know, give us some other stats of not to compare us, but there are other municipalities out there that are half our size, have half our budget and probably three or four times you know, the funding gap. Um, I mean, I know I heard the presenter Donna say a number of times that, you know, the city of Niagara Falls is in very good shape. Um, and I think if any credit really should be given, it's not really to the council, it's to the staff because, you know, we're the ones that rely very heavily on, on staff's opinion. So staff brings us the budget and says, 
this is the infrastructure that you need to replace. This is the infrastructure that you know needs attention. So uh, I guess kudos to staff. Um, the only question that, that I would have, Your Worship, is uh, in one of the slides it talked about closing the gap. And in specific, it was in regards to uh, stormwater. And it said that the city of Niagara Falls should be looking at putting in a specialized user fee. And I guess my question would be, is that something that would be tied to water wastewater, or is that entirely uh, separated? Um, because I know that, you know, this year in our budget, we just did pass an infrastructure um, tax, so there's now a 1% dedicated fund that goes straight towards infrastructure. So would this uh, wastewater item, or sorry, sorry stormwater item be the exact same, or would it be something that's tied to the water and wastewater bill? I think we'll get an answer from uh, Mr. Nickel and the team. Yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, it's a great question. The, the current funding for stormwater is funded through the tax base, so any infrastructure improvements that are needed on our storm system comes from the, the tax base in general. A user fee would spread that out over um, it to be a user pay system, so if you contribute more to stormwater runoff, you would pay more for your contribution. Right now, we don't distinguish that. It's strictly based on the tax assessment, and we collect those dollars and their use to go into our general reserves for that storm uh, sewer improvements. So it would be a third rate. We have a tax rate. We have a water wastewater rate. This would be a stormwater rate. It would be in addition to that dedicated infrastructure levy that council approved earlier in the budget. And uh, through you, Your Worship, to Mr. Nickel, thanks for that. Um, it, is the generation of stormwater uh, based on, I, I guess, yeah, yeah. Uh, items on your property? Um, perhaps you live in an older area of town that has a combined sewer. Would you be penalized for that? Thanks, Councillor. It's a great question. The other, um, through the mayor, the other municipalities that have implemented a stormwater rate have done so with incentives. So rather than be, be um, providing penalties for those who may not have any control over the size of their lot and where their runoff is going, but there's an incentive to use things like rain barrels and to ensure your downspouts are disconnected. And so there's some equity there amongst those um, similar size properties, but it, we, when we start talking about a storm rate, it's an increased um, cost for large properties. So I'll use an example of a shopping mall with a thousand parking spaces contributes a lot to our storm water and so accordingly there's an increase in what they would contribute. We would expect if we implement a storm water rate there'd be a sort of adjustment tax reduction, increase in storm water rate to reflect that size of property but we would want to be a bit more consistent with a, a local user rate and quite frankly it's, it's a lot of work because we'd have to go and measure and make sure we're being as fair as possible. Um, to not penalize somebody for something that's a little bit outside of their control. Okay, um, and Your Worship, I, I, I trust Mr. Nickel and his staff, so I'll look forward to the report when it comes back. What I did want to ask uh, Mr. Nickel, and perhaps Mr. Burgess can jump in as well, is I, I know the asset management plan is largely, like the, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. overall numbers are largely based on the level of service <clears throat> that, uh, that the city has. Um, so. I was hoping you could talk a little bit about the level of service. I know Mr. Burgess likes to say that, you know, the city of Niagara Falls has a very high level of service as compared to other municipalities in the region. If we were to lower our service level a tiny bit, it would really drop uh, any funding gap and perhaps put us in a surplus position. Perhaps you can talk about just about the level of service for me. Thanks. Thank you. And through the mayor, um, it's a great comment. The levels of service drive uh, the services we deliver. And so um, I'll use an example. Uh, um, our roads, for example, we are targeting in our asset management plan an increase from our current levels of service. So we're targeting um, you know, a minor increase because we know that that's industry standard and it's a benchmark um, that, that staff are confident we should be um, providing to the community. When we don't have those benchmarks, we're using the current service levels as a predictor of where we need to fund our, our efforts or what where our efforts need to be dedicated to make sure that we don't reduce those service levels. We saw the one graph with the red bars. We don't want those red bars to get any larger. Um, and so uh, to, to, I guess, answer the question, reducing service levels is an option. 
in order to help close the gap. Um, in order to do that, there needs to be frank and open conversations and engage a public about what it means to reduce service levels because they, they're directly tied to um, the, the revenues that we receive from taxes and from water and wastewater rates. And so if there's a willingness of the public to accept a lower level of service, which might mean more water main breaks, poorer roads, poorer sidewalks, um, that will be more affordable, but it will also result in lower levels of service. So that conversation will come over the next few years. Um, it is a, a, an option, but not something we would immediately recommend. Thanks, Your Worship. And the reason why I wanted to ask the question is because I wanted the answer from Mr. Nickel. And I wanted to be able to say as well that I'm not interested in dropping the level of service that we have. I'd rather fill the gap, to be honest with you. So um, those are all my comments. If you're looking for a motion to approve the staff yes. report, I'm happy to do that. And, uh, and to receive the, uh, the draft asset management plan? Yes. Okay, motion by Councillor Pietrangelo, second by Councillor Strange. There's no further questions. All those in favor? Okay, and that is approved unanimously. Thank you very much for that report. Uh, and apologies to our planning application groups. We're almost there. Uh, it went longer than we expected. Our uh, last presentation before we get into our planning application is a presentation from Dylan Consulting regarding our housing, Niagara Falls housing direction study. Um, so uh, we would just request that we get the high points, um, if we would, please. Um, we've got the reports and uh, we appreciate the high points and then the questions. Councillors may have already prepared questions in anticipation of this presentation, and then we can get to that point as soon as possible. So, uh, Ms. Martell, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I just want to confirm everyone can hear me. Oh, yeah, perfectly. Oh, great. Oh, fabulous. Um, I believe I will be sharing my screen here with the presentation. So, if you'll bear with me one moment, I will do that. Um, thank you so much, uh, Mayor and members of Council for having us here today to uh, meet with you again on this very important initiative that the city's undertaken. I'm joined tonight by my colleagues from Tim Welch Consulting, uh, Tim and Ryan, who will um, also be providing some of the high points on this presentation and uh, we will for the sake of brevity try and run through this as quickly as possible but um, I did want to identify that you may recall we were here before in June of 2021 and we presented the findings of the housing strategy uh, housing needs and supply report at that time which was um, a compendium of detailed uh, factual information and research that really form the basis for the housing strategy which we'll uh, pre present to you today. So quickly, uh, we have a quick agenda, we'll do a quick recap, present the vision, run over the actions with you and then open the floor for questions. Um, so where we've been, as I said, we started this project in, I believe, uh, late 2020, uh, and we have completed a considerable amount of work since that time. The project was prepared uh, kind of in this two-phase process, first phase data collection and monitoring, uh, second phase recommendations, and really we're at kind of uh, the final steps here with the council presentation on the housing strategy itself. Um, as I said, we did present to you in June of 2021, and that we had housing needs and supply report. We presented an introduction of the purpose and some preliminary findings. Um, I did want to highlight a few key findings, and I'll pass it over to Ryan um, to note uh, with respect to this strategy, but also with respect to um, what Mr. Hayworth had presented earlier today on the ROP and some of the questions you had in relation to rental and affordability. Uh, there's probably an opportunity to clear some of those up at this time. So without further ado, I will pass it over to Ryan to go quickly over the uh, affordability needs both for rental and ownership households in the city just to set some context before we go through the actions. So I will mute myself and 
Great. Thanks, Kelly. And good evening, everybody. Hopefully you can all see and, uh, and hear me, but please let me know if you can't. Um, again, just trying to move quickly through some of the, the key findings and highlights from the uh, Housing Needs and Supply Report, starting here with uh, rental households. And this does dovetail nicely with the conversation that happened earlier uh, during the council meeting today. Um, so some key facts. The median household in the city uh, was approximately $60,000, and this is based on 2016 census data. I should say, unfortunately, given the timing of the report, uh, that is the, the, the most recent census data that we had access to. 2021 census data is rolling out over the course of this year, uh, but we couldn't incorporate that uh, during the time of our analysis. 47% of renter households are in core housing need related to affordability. That means they're spending more than 30% of their income on housing and can't find suitable housing uh, for less than 30% of their income. Vacancy rates in the city uh, are low and have been very low, uh, below 3% six, uh, since 2016, and this can put upward pressure on prices. And so really what we're seeing is that average rents are not affordable to many residents, which probably is no surprise to members of council. Uh, the tables on the left compare affordable monthly rents at different income levels with the average monthly rents in the city as of 2020 from CMHC data. Uh, I won't go too in depth with this, but just to say uh, that a household would have to be earning $40,000 or more to afford the average uh, one bedroom rent um, for a one, uh, average rent for a one bedroom unit in the city of Niagara Falls. Uh, next slide, please, Kelly. Great, so moving from rental over to uh, ownership, we found that 18% of owner households were in core housing need. So this is smaller than the number of rental households, but it is still quite high. Uh, and again, with just like rental, many ownership options are not affordable to residents in the city. So this, uh, this big table right here compares affordable ownership prices by income decile to actual house prices in Niagara region in 2021 by housing type, which you can see uh, across the top of the table. A green check mark indicates when a specific housing form is affordable at that income level, and a red X is when that housing form is not affordable. So as you can see from this table, almost nothing is affordable to moderate and low income households in the city. And high income households can really only afford uh, townhouses or apartments unless they are in the highest two income deciles. Next slide, please. So just uh, to summarize with some, uh, some key takeaways uh, from the housing needs and supply report, there are considerable gaps in the city's housing continuum for its residents and current housing options do not, need, uh, do not meet affordability needs or income realities of, uh, of many of these residents, especially those who are employed in the hospitality, tourism and service sectors, which is a large proportion of the Niagara Falls workforce. Uh, there continues to be and will continue to be demand for single detached housing, uh, but there's also an increasing demand and need for higher density housing that would be affordable to more, uh, more households in the city. So the city's major areas of focus in developing an implementable strategy to address these housing gaps should really be focused on supporting and permitting higher density types of housing, uh, supporting and permitting alternate forms of housing, strengthening the city's secondary suite policy framework, protecting existing rental housing, establishing affordability thresholds and targets, and making sure that the local official plan uh, and its housing policies are aligned with regional housing policies. And we'll touch on uh, these in more, in more detail throughout the presentation. Uh, with that, I'll pass it back to Kelly. Thank you so much, Ryan. Um, so for the benefit of council, I did want to identify that this project has been guided by a technical advisory committee and we met a number of times throughout the project life cycle. Um, and the TAC really, uh, it provided a sounding board for the project and gave us an opportunity to obtain comments and insight and feedback from disciplines outside of our own to get that more well-rounded holistic perspective and there were a number of representatives from council the city's planning and economic development departments uh, regional planning regional housing and homelessness we had a real estate representative a representative from the home builders as well as uh, non-for-profit housing providers and community organizations such as project share in the chamber of commerce 
We met with them, as I said, three times, and this is kind of a highlight of the discussions and the feedback we had from the TAC, and their comments were incorporated into both the background report and the strategy report as appropriate. Um, in terms of the housing strategy itself, I will now move on to giving a brief overview knowing that uh, you do have a copy of it in your agenda package and the covering staff report. But really the key purpose of the housing strategy is to build upon that technical work we have completed to date um, that was com compiled in the housing needs and supply report <coughs> and provide a blueprint and a roadmap for the actions the city will need to address on a go forward basis to, um, to close that gap in housing needs that we've identified. So we set off the strategy by identifying a broad vision. And this broad vision is not uh, exclusive to the strategy. It's really um, a vision that should be guiding the future state of housing in the city beyond the strategy, something we should be thinking about as we're making decisions going forward. And that vision uh, is, all residents in the city have safe, stable, and appropriate housing to meet both the physical and financial needs throughout their various stages of life. Next, we did identify uh, five goals for the strategy and help uh, develop these actions and implementable items. Uh, to move us toward that ideal future state for housing in the city. Um, they're here on the screen and they're certainly in your council information package, so I don't want to read them verbatim. Mm -hmm. And uh, as Ryan noted, we did identify six themes for the strategy and under each one of these themes, there are some actions. In total, we did identify 21 actions for the city to implement over the short, medium and long term to get us toward that vision and goals for housing in the city. And um, the first three themes are on this slide. Uh, establish affordable housing targets to set the city up for success to meet affordable housing goals. And I think uh, Councillor Iannone and Councillor Lococo did uh, ask um, Mr. Hayworth earlier about targets. And what I will say briefly on this is Given the unique situation the city of Niagara Falls is in with a primary uh, workforce uh, in the tourist industry and the service industry and that um, income level that Ryan indicated earlier at that 60,000 mark, our targets are actually more aggressive that we're suggesting be incorporated into the uh, city's official plan. Uh, the next theme would be promote a greater diversity of housing types to ensure a wider range of options available to meet the needs of uh, residents. Ensuring a healthy supply of rental units to provide a range and mix of rental options, which I think as we've heard today is certainly a significant gap in the city currently and we would like to move forward to address that increase the vacancy rate and stabilize the rental uh, market availability three additional themes are increasing public education and provide advocacy for partnerships and this is really to make sure everyone understands the role they can play in addressing housing issues and uh, housing needs in the city the next theme is providing for financial incentives to promote and facilitate the development of affordable and rental housing. And then finally, the sixth theme to guide the actions in this strategy is monitoring and reporting, uh, maintaining accountability, uh, measuring the efficacy of implementation of the strategy. Um, so as I said, there are 21 total recommended actions that we are suggesting the city uh, undertake and they are grouped by each theme. And there is a time frame for implement implementation assigned to each action. Uh, briefly, I think we can go over the actions. Uh, I will pass it over, I think, to Ryan, possibly Tim, and he, they can speak more to this uh, local target for housing in the city. And I will need. 
Great, thanks, Kelly. So yes, quickly we'll uh, we'll take you through the, the targets that we are suggesting be included as part of the official plan. Um, so based on some of the projections that we had access to from the region, it is expected that approximately 22,000 new residential units will be built in the city between 2021 and 2051. And this averages out to uh, 674 new units per year. So the strategy here recommends that 40% of these units be built for households earning $96,000, approximately $96,000 per year or lower. Uh, that's 270 units then that are affordable for households at the 60th and in income percentile or below. Uh, that $96,000 represents the 2016 income deciles updated into 2021 uh, numbers by um, multiplying it by uh, the rate of inflation. So what this means is that it would be affordable uh, for ownership prices at about $499,000 or less, or monthly rents of $2,400 or below. So as Kelly mentioned, and as we've talked about um, as well earlier in the presentation, since affordability challenges are greater for the low and moderate income rental population, and that the majority of, core, of households in core housing need um, are seniors, single persons, and those working in the service industry, the strategy recommends that half of those 270 units or 20% of all new residential construction be affordable rental apartments specifically with rents at $968 or less per month. Uh, we can, we're happy to answer some more questions on that perhaps during the Q&A, uh, but just quickly just moving on to action number two, uh, it would be to update the state's official plan to include a framework for achieving these affordable housing targets um, this should be brought forward in the short term through a housekeeping amendment to the OP that I believe is currently actually underway. Uh, and for example, it would include things like requirements for development applications to demonstrate how proposals would contribute to achieving affordability, uh, affordability targets, as well as additional policies uh, geared towards incentives and monitoring. And with that, I'll pass it back to Kelly. Thank you so much, Ryan. So under the promote a greater diversity of dwelling types theme, there are a number of actions that are uh, aimed at broadening the housing options in terms of built form in this city. And I think what we heard earlier from Councillor Lococo was that the city does have a lot of single detached dwellings right now. We know that there is still a demand for more single detached dwellings, but we also know that uh, higher density types of housing, um, grade related housing, such as townhomes, um, your back to back townhomes, provide those more affordable options for um, middle income earners uh, to, to get into the ownership market. And they would also provide opportunities for um, secondary rental units as well. And there are the there are three actions here that we're showing, which is to support and permit higher density types of housing. This can be addressed through um, the city's official plan review following um, the regional official plans completion, as well as supporting and permitting alternate forms of housing. These are things like your um, your tiny homes, your modular homes, laneway homes, um, and, and not only alternative forms of housing, but alternative ownership types, uh, providing opportunities and a policy framework that's flexible enough to allow for a multi-generational type of house to be developed on a single lot and providing opportunities for the creation and ongoing monitoring of second units. You have a significant supply of single detached dwellings that would provide an opportunity for a lot of great gentle intensification through second units, which could provide opportunities for aging in place and um, alternatives for people who may not want to live in your traditional rental building. And what we did find is that the city currently doesn't track these, so it's very difficult to understand the actual quantum on the ground. So not only providing opportunities for those through an official plan amendment that would set a framework in place that would promote and incentivize these, but also to monitor on an ongoing basis would um, provide opportunities for that. And 
Next, let's go, okay. Ensuring a healthy supply of rental units. Again, there are a number of actions under this theme, which we're recommending the city implement over um, generally the next three to five years. I think one of the biggest impacts the city can make certainly is preserving the, those existing purpose-built rental housing units through uh, the introduction of a demolition and conversion control po policies and uh, bylaws. So especially now that land may be assembled uh, for redevelopment and intensification, there may be a loss to an already strained rental market in the absence of this demolition and conversion control policies and rental replacement bylaws. So it's really important that the city is proactive in introducing this into their framework. Uh, the next one would be to undertake a formal assessment of the potential to introduce inclusionary zoning. So as Mr. Hayworth did say earlier, the region is identifying your GO station at, at, your, the, in the downtown as a protected major transit station area. That enables you, once the region's OP is in place, to take the assessment uh, to the next step. and. Following the completion of the assessment, you could introduce inclusionary zoning there if the assessment demonstrates that it would be a viable from a market perspective. Um, the next action we did identify as part of this uh, ensure a healthy supply of rental units theme is exploring the formalization of the use of motels as long-term stay accommodation. And we do know that this is a previous study that has been completed. We're recommending that um, this get picked up, recognizing that a lot of the motels are currently used to, um, for better or worse, offset the lack of rental housing options in the city. And um, it is important to ensure that they are protected and that those who are living in those units are provided with a standard of living that's adequate. Um, the next theme area with some actions identified is increasing public education and providing options for advocacy and partnership. We know that the city in a two-tier system doesn't manage housing. They, you guys aren't the service provider, the region's the service provider. So what can you do to work with the region and other levels of government to um, improve the housing situation in the city. And what we're suggesting is that under this uh, theme umbrella, developing an understanding of what the upper level government housing programs are and working with the region to advocate for your share uh, of any sort of provincial or federal funding, as well as uh, defining your role and responsibility in supporting housing affordability and where I think the city in their role as a lower tier can make the greatest impact is through ensuring you have a flexible and supportive policy framework. You have uh, policies and regulations in place at the local level that would uh, direct and encourage development and streamlining your development approvals process. And then the next action would be developing a policy to review all surplus municipal land for housing suitability. And we do know that the city has, in fact, um, done this a number of times over um, the years to provide opportunities for um, housing affordability and the reuse of sites that are no longer needed for municipal purposes. Well. Continuing on, increasing public education and providing advocacy for partnerships. There are a, a few other uh, actions you can see on this slide, really trying to foster those connections between the community organizations, developers, service providers. Um, those are three of those actions here. And on the other side, uh, this exploring private workforce housing for hospitality and tourism employees. We know that you're, you have a significant amount of residents who are working in the hospitality and tourism industry. Those are at generally lower wages. And as you had seen from the slide Ryan presented, the housing options for people who are earning those incomes are very, very limited. So taking a, 
an initiative to see what the city can do to work with the hospitality and tourism industry to help provide housing for their employees may be uh, an avenue to explore. And then finally, trying to provide um, the, the foundations in place to reduce neighborhood opposition to affordable housing developments through um, information packages or updates to council on all of the all of the um, positives associated with neighborhood mix um, and advocating uh, among your constituents to reduce the opposition is uh, the next uh, action under this and then finally um, a lot of this can't be done without a commitment to provide financial incentives uh, uh, to specifically promote and facilitate affordable and rental housing. And this could be done through a review of exemptions to city fees for certain development proposals where there's a specific percentage of affordable units that will be provided or there's a specific uh, percentage of rental units that will be provided. We would also recommend developing a community improvement plan for affordable and rental housing, which could incentivize that and address that vacancy rate gap right now. And then uh, finally, uh, a very important action is certainly allocating appropriate staff resources to implement and administer the action. So there are 21 actions here. Uh, they should be implemented over the short, medium, and long term, but without the appropriate staff complement, uh, you run the risk of this strategy sitting on a shelf and the status quo being maintained. And I think that um, if anything, now is not the time to maintain status quo. So with that, finally on the monitoring and reporting side, there are three actions and that is really stopping them to better track the uh, the attaining like attaining your targets that we've set out uh, ongoing monitoring and reporting to council to make sure that we're all accountable to these actions and then reviewing and updating the housing strategy on a five-year basis so that you're you're able to proactively uh, monitor and address uh, any changes that may have occurred throughout time certainly the strategy is not a static document and without reviewing it, we would um, we would run the risk of not being able to adapt to actions for changing circumstances. Um, so we did identify some priority actions that, if if anything, the actions on this slide, if we if we can get to those, that will help to start move the dial for housing in this city. And as Ryan indicated. The first one would be this housekeeping amendment, which as he noted is underway. The second priority action would be allocating the staff resources. Next, preserving the existing purpose-built rental housing stock while you work on increasing uh, new options for purpose-built rental over a longer period of time. And the community improvement plan is certainly a key priority action that will help uh, address that uh, rental housing gap. Uh, monitoring, again, is a priority action specifically for second units, but monitoring broadly. Uh, reviewing exemptions and then exploring private workforce housing. And with that, our next steps are to come forward to you with a draft official plan amendment to implement some of those short term actions which are underway and then we would enter into a formal planning act process for approvals on the OPA. I know that was a lot to take in in a very short time but um, we are here and happy to answer any questions you might have. Okay that's great thank you very much Ms. Martel. So uh, questions of council for the presenters. Uh, we've got Councillor Lococo. Thank you Mr. Mayor. Through the mayor to the presenters thank you so much for this report it's so extensive i really enjoyed being on the tac committee i learned a lot and i was able to apply some of the the suggestions that you've had in some of the other work that i'm doing there was one thing we did talk about on the tac tac force 
um, that didn't make it to the report, and I think it's really important that I bring it up. It was talking about um, house sharing, that there be some sort of plan to do that. It's not in the report, but it's something that um, maybe one of our organizations within the community could help with. There are a lot of people that just can't afford to live on their own, and they're doing some house sharing. So I wanted to put that out there. And again, thank you so much for this report, and um, I'd be pleased to, to move the report once um, the discussion's finished. Okay. Do we have any other questions of yeah, Councillor Cario and then Peter Angelo? Your Worship, I thought it was a great report too. Um, um, the, the only question I had was, um, I know that we, we want to do all these things, but the question would be, I, as I read through who participated, I didn't see anyone in there that is um, a, a developer of apartment buildings or rental units. Um, I've had calls from them after some of our meetings where we talk about uh, rental houses and they've said to me, uh, it's very good to get up and talk about rental houses, but why haven't you, have you, asked, why have you not asked the experts that you have in your own municipality? We have four or five that I know, very large uh, apartment builders, developers, rental providers, and I don't think they've been talked to. I, I don't know if I'm wrong or not, but those are the people that can tell us. If you talk to them, they'll tell you why they're not building. So I think we got to address those problems as well. Why are they not building these units? They'll tell so maybe, you. Maybe I can jump in a little bit on that yep. from Welch here. Uh, we, we did certainly on the TAC, we had someone from the Niagara Home Builders Association, which does include both ownership building as well as rental building. And in some of our key stakeholder interviews, we, we certainly interviewed uh, developers who are building rental apartments. Um, they are building market rental apartments. And then, again, there were certainly some interesting comments about as the ownership market prices have just increased astronomically over the last few years that they think there is an opportunity from a market perspective to be creating some uh, mid-level rental buildings, some mid-market rental buildings. Um, so we certainly got feedback as well as some of the, the challenges in, in developing uh, um, rental buildings and multi-residential buildings in general. So, um, so there was some of that certainly through the process. Thanks, Tim. The, the problem and the challenge is at the lower end, trying to build the more affordable ones because the financial mm -hmm. model doesn't work. So I saw in the presentation where we talked about incentives and things for them to build them, I think that's key in order to have them get interested again in building at that level. No, and, and there's certainly um, a range. I mean, the, the housing challenges are not going to be solved all by one level of government. They certainly need to be all four levels of government involved having financial incentives. And there are um, certainly uh, uh, incentives at the federal level right now. Um, there are some at the, the regional level. Um, we've got recommendations at the city level. But also contributing can be, um, whether it's a private sector, putting in some equity, putting in their land or nonprofits. And there's certainly lots of good positive examples of nonprofits coming to the table with equity contributions of land and other resources to make that housing more affordable. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Peterangelo. Uh, yeah, thanks, Your Worship. Um, if you don't have a seconder to the motion, I'd be happy to second it. Okay. But I did have some questions, actually. Um, the first, I guess, was in regards to Action 5 and 19, which talk about uh, second dwelling units. Um, I know under next steps it says prepare OPA to implement some of the short-term actions. Number five is there. Are we, are we saying that we're going to change our official plan to include second dwelling units? Um, I can answer that through the, through the chair. Um, your official plan has not been updated since the Planning Act changed the regulations to allow for further opportunities for second suites. Right now, the Planning Act does allow up to two second units in the primary dwelling and an additional unit on the property. So what we're suggesting we can do right now through this housekeeping amendment is certainly get the policy framework in place that would align with the Planning Act and allow for um, less red tape for those who are interested in implementing or developing second suites to go forward immediately on that while we work on some of the other actions in terms of the monitoring the uptake or incentivizing that type of development um, I, would, I would open it to tim or ryan to kind of expand on that if uh, there's anything i did not catch 
think that's good. Okay, uh, so just so I understand, right now our official plan does allow for one second dwelling unit. Does it not? I believe so. Uh, 60% of your primary, yeah. I, I thought we already allowed a second dwelling unit. Um, through you, I guess, to Ms. Martel, are, are you saying that the, uh, planning, uh, the planning act allows for multiple dwelling units on one single property and our official plan just has not caught up to that speed? Yes, through the chair, that is what I'm saying. In fact, the Planning Act allows now for them to be permitted in single, semis, and townhomes. And you can have up to two within the, within the primary dwelling and an additional one, let's say, if you had like a laneway. You could put one in the laneway or you could put one in the garage as well. So yes, you do permit it. It is permitted. Uh, subject to the old planning act requirements but not updated to the new ones i see so our official plan allows us to take a single family home and split it into two units or to build a second unit on the property somewhere the planning act though allows a single family home to be split into three units and also to build a separate unit on a single property would that be correct yeah, I, I, my math may be rusty, but I'm pretty sure it allows for up to three additional three additional units. <laughs> Tim or Ryan, if you want to confirm. I, I think it's I think it's three units in yeah. total. So you could uh, either have three units in the in the primary or two units in the in the main house plus an accessory dwelling unit, whether it's a laneway house or a garage conversion. Okay, and, and just so I'm just so I'm understanding. Um, the monitoring of that we would want to monitor it for the perp or we would want to monitor it for the purposes of and that's where i fall short S certainly so through the chair to uh you what you would be monitoring first of all is um in terms of the region's intensification rates and targets established for the city um, secondary suites contribute to that intensification target and achievement of that. Mm -hmm. So there's one reason to monitor it. Another reason to monitor it and register it is um, to keep track of the overall quantum of units in the city and get like make sure that they're up to code and safe and uh, livable for those people using them. If we're not monitoring that you could have a number of illegal secondary units that may not be meeting safety standards. It could be proposing risk to those in there. And you would certainly wanna monitor it for that reason. And I think the final reason is certainly to monitor it to see year over year what the uptake is. And if we know that these are a very um, easy way to provide uh, a, housing options in the secondary market and we're finding that there's not an uptake maybe we need to look at why there isn't an uptake but without the data you wouldn't be able to correct course or provide incentives or some other option or opportunity to increase their uptake okay and in terms of incentives i i, I do believe that the province has already uh exempted development charges from from all second dwelling units um the city of niagara falls i don't believe has caught up to speed in regards to that and neither has the region for that fact so if a second dwelling unit is built in inside a primary house so inside its current foundation it's exempt from development charges but if there's a second unit that's built on the same property as a dwelling um Right now, our DC bylaw and the region's DC bylaw also um, ask that those development charges be paid. It, would that, I'm sorry? I'll, I'll check with, but I believe if it's a secondary unit on the existing property, it's considered an outbuilding under the DC bylaw and exempt from uh, development charges. Through you to uh, the councillor, that's correct. We do exempt them. Uh, sometimes they do get missed, though, however. I know there's been some issues in the past just uh, with regard to development charges. Uh, we are going to make sure, though, that it's very clear in the next DC bylaw that it's definitely exempt, but, but that's the way we've been dealing with them uh, so far. 
Okay, so right now a second unit that's built on the same property as a primary residence, even though it's detached from the primary residence, it would be exempt from development charges? Through you to the councillor, that's correct. Okay, I'll, I'll have to let the person know that contacted me. Um, the other question I had, Your Worship, was just yeah. in regards to Action 16 and 17, which is around uh, the CIP and offering uh, different types of incentives. I know I had a conversation with yourself and with our CAO about this. I, th I think it would be really neat to uh, bring in a citywide CIP that would offer different incentives. But I also think to myself that um, the state of Niagara Falls is not really that much different than you know, the state of the other municipalities that are mm. around us. And I know what the region's flavor of CIPs is. So I'm wondering if it would be worthwhile for the municipalities in Niagara Falls, or in Niagara, to get together and to have sort of a uniform CIP to go to the region with. I just think it would be very difficult to um, uh, have different CIPs going to the region because I think everyone's gonna be looking at implementing something in regards to affordable housing. I don't know if uh, Mr. Burgess or anyone else would have any comments on that. Mr. Burgess? Yeah, through, uh, through the mayor to the councillor, uh, there's a couple of initiatives. One was formed by the mayor's committee, uh, <clears throat> and there's a subcommittee uh, that's led by David Oaks, I believe, as CAO, uh, and a couple other ones to develop uh, a quicker action plan to that. And I believe, you know, overall from the planner's point of view, um, uh, you know, I, th I think trying to get consistency on programs across the region because it is a priority that the region has set very clearly, and I think the region, as you said, would like to have some consistency so i think most of the planners are trying to work on a consistent approach to it thank you through you to the councillor uh, that's correct and and we do have our incentive review coming up uh, we are kind of trying to collaboratively work with the region as well um, as they embark on theirs so we will be looking and working with the region i know some of their buckets include affordable housing and some other things those are things we'll be looking at uh, in conjunction with them and, and and if I could just ask, yeah. sorry, um, in, in regards to CIPs, um, obviously DCs are already waived. So what is it that the, that staff would be looking at uh, in terms of implementing into a CIP? Would it be a uh, tax incentive? Would it be a uh, grant? Um, would it be uh, relief of density, parking, things of a planning nature? I'm, I'm just trying to understand what the CIP would be. Um, I could to, to talk about there's a, a range of uh, municipalities with CIPs. Some certainly make it clear in terms of development charges as well as not paying planning fees. Um, a number of municipalities, are, uh, uh, City of Cambridge, uh, City of Peterborough, for example, have a property tax deferral, so no payment, like the Brown, in some cases, Brownfield incentives. So the first sometimes 10 years and, and in some cases 20 years. There is no payment of property tax for the increased uh, number of affordable uh, housing units, for example, that be uh, to be provided. So that's a big difference because that can often mean perhaps 100 to 140 dollars a month lower rent on on that incentive alone on property tax. Okay, uh, and that's the one I like, Your Worship. But I appreciate that. My my questions are done. Okay, that's great. Terrific. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Oh yes, Councillor Ianoni. Sorry, um, through you to Mr. Burgess, you just said that there's a quicker action committee? Mr. Burgess? Yeah, through the uh, chair, there's, um, I think the meeting was originally arranged by uh, Mayor Easton, if I remember correctly. Um, and this was out of the province's uh, report on housing. So they wanted to, uh, they wanted um, a focus group on seeing how we can take a look at uh, mobilizing some of these strategies on a, on a quicker basis. So they assigned, um, I believe it was David Oakes. I, I'm, I'll, I'll uh, apologize for not remembering who is ex assigned to that task. And they're gonna report back to um, our CAO meeting um, in, the, in the coming weeks. So they're just looking at ways to put some of the practices or best practices in in practice on a quicker basis uh, so that we're not uh, we're not accused of slowing down the process so they're looking for different efficiencies thank you okay councillor Campbell <coughs> thank you your worship uh, with respect to uh, funding from the province to the regional government 
it's my understanding that the amount of money or the size of the city of Hamilton population wise is approximately the same as Niagara Peninsula, Niagara region. They get three times the amount of money to help homeless people per resident than what we get in, in the Niagara region. And I think that that has to be looked at seriously. Anybody want to tackle that one? We just let that one go as a commissioner. Do you really would agree with? Yeah, she would, she would, and and that's a good point. You're right. Any other questions or comments? So we do have a motion from Councillor Peter Angelo. Oh, and, oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Coke was seconded by yeah. Councillor Peter Angelo. That's right. So there are two <laughs> recommendations. One, the council receive the presentation regarding the City of Niagara Falls housing strategy, <laughs> as attached, and secondly, that the council endorse the strategy and direct staff to begin its implementation through an official plan amendment, including consultation with the community. If there's no more comments, we'll call that vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that is unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of our presenters. We appreciate your time. Have a good night. All right, on to our planning portion of our agenda. Now I'll ask our city clerk if he'd be so kind as to introduce the next item on the agenda. A public meeting is now being convened to consider a proposed amendment to the city's official plan and zoning bylaw to permit a 35 story hotel and a 36 story apartment and on street dwelling on a shared podium. Uh, this is located at 5613 and 5631 through to 5633 Victoria Avenue. Notice was given by First Class Mail in accordance with the Planning Act on February 18th, 2022, and by posting a sign on the property in question. Anyone who wants notice of the passing of the official plan and zoning bylaw amendment to participate in any site plan process, if applicable, or preserve their opportunity to appeal to the Ontario Land Tribunal shall give notice to the City Clerk immediately after today's public meeting. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. And now I ask our Director of Planning, Ms. Dolch, to explain the purpose and reason for the proposed amendments. Thank you, Your Worship. Actually, I'm going to have Julie Hanna, our planner too, at the City of Niagara Falls. She's uh, been working on this file diligently and is going to start the presentation. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Ms. Hanna, the floor is yours. Hello. Thank you. Can you see the slide deck? Yes, we can, and we can hear you great as well. <laughs> that's good. Um, Good evening, uh, Mayor Diodati, members of council, as well as um, the members of public who may be watching this presentation. I'm pleased to present the public meeting um, for the official plan and zoning by amendment applications regarding 5613, 5631 to 5633 Victoria Avenue. The location of the property is located north of Victoria Avenue. Um, west of Walnut Street, south of Ellen Avenue. Um, it's outlined in red um, on the screen before you. And to the north of Ellen and um, also the east of Walnut are detached dwellings. Uh, commercial and hotels are along Victoria Avenue. And of course, Victoria, uh, tourist attractions are south on Victoria Avenue. There are two applications that have been submitted to the city. The first is an official plan amendment. The property is currently designated tourist commercial and the request is to place the lands under a special policy area designation to allow 35 and 36 story towers at a maximum height of 116 meters. The second application is a zoning bylaw amendment. The land is currently zoned tourist commercial 75 and the request is to place the lands under a new site specific tourist commercial zone. To give you background, uh, the land holdings are approximately 0.56 hectares on six parcels. Um, the development consists of 35 and 36 story towers. There's a six story podium that consists of commercial uses at grade and above grade parking. A 29 story hotel tower with 404 guest suites. A 30 story residential tower consisting of 462 apartments and seven on-street townhouses located on Ellen Avenue. The site plan is before you on the screen and it depicts uh, the location of the two towers, the hotel 
um, being closest to Victoria Avenue with a 29 story tower and the residential tower um, being closest to Ellen Avenue of 30 stories. The podium of six stories surrounds uh, the base of the property in its entirety. Um, and then there's an outdoor courtyard located in the middle with a seven story uh, podium in the middle. The elevations as seen in night um, time would be before you now and uh, the Victoria Avenue uh, frontage is in the foreground. We did receive uh, several neighborhood comments um, which have all been submitted and are part of the agenda. The comments that we received are the following. Uh, residents are concerned with increased volume of traffic and more speeding that could result from the development, the changing character of the residential neighborhood, blocking sunlight and view, the height of the towers is not reasonable. They're concerned about the loss of privacy and the potential for items to fall off the building and overall um, concerned with the overdevelopment of the site. In response, um, staff provide the following, that traffic patterns and volume are not expected to be excessive, that the lands north and west of the site are designated for mid-rise development, the residential properties will not have shadowing after 10.30 a.m. There's a suitable interface with the residential uses on Ellen Avenue because of the uh, on-street townhouses, and the development of site uh, will comply with Ontario legislation. To provide a brief uh, overview of the policies, um, in terms of the provincial policies, the proposal satisfies provincial matters and proposes compatible uses that will support a livable and resi resilient community. Um, the land is designated within the built up area in the regional official plan and it is supportive um, as it results in intensification and mixed uses that will support the economy and promote increased opportunities for tourism. And in the city's official plan, the lands are designated tourist commercial. Um, the proposal is supported as mixed use high rise buildings up to 30 stories are permitted in this area. Um, the area is shown in the map to the right of the screen and the uh, location is um, generally indicated with the star. So you'll note that it's um, in the red high rise portion of the map. Um, in response to uh, examining the various documents and plans that were submitted, um, planning staff are of the opinion that the design and bill form policies are met, um, as shadowing and wind in impacts are not excessive, and that it meets the criteria in the official plan to exceed 30 stories. There are adequate municipal services available and transportation impacts are mitigated with the left turn lane that's being proposed on Victoria Avenue. In regards to the architectural design review, um, various elevations are uh, before you uh, showing the view um, on Ellen as well as uh, the view um, from Victoria for both towers. The streetscape has active uses and has clear glazing for the commercial units on Victoria Avenue and has lobbies on Walnut Street for both the residential and the hotel uses. The building design varies to reduce the structure to human sized elements. On Ellen Avenue, the on-street townhouses presents a residential form that suitably transitions the building to the budding residential uses. This slide shows the uh, north and south elevation of the north elevation from Walnut Street and the south elevation is from the abutting uh, property view. Um, in the elevations, you'll notice that the towers are set back above the podium and they maintain the required 12.5 meter setback uh, from the interior side lot line, which is shown on the south elevation. Um, that would be that property line. And the towers themselves are separated 25 meters from each other. Uh, the tower floor, floor plates above the podium do not exceed the 1,000 meter square requirement. While the six story podium is greater than the guideline height of 15 meters, it is supported as the abutting hotels on Victoria are six to seven stories in height. And this development does not contribute to a wall of development, um, which is of concern. The shadow study confirmed the development has limited shadowing impacts on the residential uses to the west. The site allows for greater than eight hours of sunlight to the surrounding neighborhood. The wind study identified 
that uh, the wind is generally acceptable at ground level. There are some impacts um, that have been identified along Allen Avenue and planning staff are requiring an updated wind study to ensure that impacts are mitigated and implemented at site plan stage. In terms of the requested zoning relief, um, the various uh, regulations that are being requested are shown on the slide. Uh, there's a proposal to eliminate the percentage of floor area for residential uses above the commercial levels to permit the dwelling units on the ground floor, and those are the on-street townhouses, and to add on-street townhouse uh, dwelling as a permitted use. They are proposing to have 100% lot coverage, a maximum height of 116 meters, and a maximum of 35 and 36 stories, to provide four loading spaces, a maximum gross floor area of 57,600 meters square. And they're proposing a parking rate of 1.02 parking spaces per dwelling unit. Planning staff are supportive of the on-street townhouse dwelling units at grade and the residential units above grade as Victoria Avenue will have tourist commercial uses at grade. We are supportive of the increased law coverage as it will create a urban streetscape the height is supported as the proposed development is within a high rise area and conforms to the tourism policies. Sufficient loading spaces are being provided. A holding provision will require the filing of a record of site condition as well as an updated wind study. Staff does not support the requested regulation of 1.02 parking spaces per dwelling unit as it is not within the transit area and is not near day to day commercial uses. The site is near residential dwellings and any offsite parking on surrounding streets would have an impact on these properties. A rate of 1.25 parking spaces per dwelling unit is supported by transportation services. In terms of the recommendation, as stated in the report, uh, planning staff recommend that council approve the official plan and zoning bylaw amendments to permit a 35 story hotel and 36 story apartment and on street dwellings subject to a parking rate of 1.25 parking spaces per dwelling unit that the amending bylaw have a holding provision to require the record of site condition as well as the updated wind study that the passage of the amending bylaws be conditional on an execution of a section 37 agreement and this agreement will secure the following amounts for the city um, for streetscape improvements 86 thousand four hundred and twelve dollars and twenty nine cents and cash contributions of one million one hundred and seventy six thousand four hundred and thirty four dollars and we also recommend that council pass a bylaw to deem uh, lots 139 and 140 to not be in a plan of subdivision to allow the subject land to merge in title and that concludes the planning presentation okay that's great thank you miss hannah do we have any questions of council for miss hannah yes Councilor lococo Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to uh, Ms. Hanna. If the staff is willing to support 1.25 parking um, spaces and the developer only has 1.02, what are the options to get from 1.02 to 125? Do you lower the number of stories so you don't need as many parking spaces? Are there more, is there more uh, land available? Are they allowed to make the parking spaces not as wide, what are the options to get it from, from there to there? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, to the councillor, um, there's a variety of options that the developer may examine. Um, there is the option to uh, reduce the number of dwelling units um, as the councillor suggested. There is uh, an option to provide uh, another level of underground parking. Uh, currently there's one level um, provided underground or to have additional above grade parking. Um, staff did discuss with the developer uh, as to whether they had examined having um, offsite parking for the hotel use. And that uh, was not something that the developer indicated that um, at this time they were willing to do all required residential parking would need to be met on site. That is the city's practice. So there are a variety of options uh, for the developer uh, to meet the 1.25 parking rate. Through the mayor to Ms. Hannah again, if some of the concerns is um, that it's over 30 stories, I don't know what the difference between 30 and 35 or 36 is, but if you were to reduce it, how many stories would that reduce per the uh, for the units? 
Uh, through you, um, Mr. Chair, uh, planning staff have not um, examined uh, redesign of, of the building and the reduction of units uh, that would result. Um, there is a variety of sizes of, of units and configuration that's being proposed by the developer. So we would work with the developer uh, to have revised plans submitted uh, to us. Um, but typically it would uh, result in the reduction of uh, one or two floors at minimum. Okay, thank you. Those are all the questions. I have comments later. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Any other questions of council for Ms. Hannah? Okay, seeing none. The section 37? No, she was, I think. Yeah, yeah, yep. Um, members of the public are advised that failure to make an oral or written submission at this public meeting could result in the Ontario Land Tribunal dismissing any referral that it receives. Failure to notify the city clerk to preserve their opportunity to appeal will result in staff rejecting an appeal as per section 3419 of the Planning Act. Council will now hear from anyone other than the applicant who wishes to speak to the proposed amendments. Mr. Clerk, do we have anyone that wishes to speak? Uh, currently, there's nobody online that uh, is wishing to speak. Uh, I believe that the two members of the public in the gallery are for a later public meeting. Okay, thank you for that. Yeah, for 7.2. Okay, um, Council will now hear from the applicant or his or her representative. Okay, Mr. Sugden. No, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, welcome. And thanks. It's been a, uh, a long night for everybody, I yes. imagine. So we'll try to keep things uh, to the point and try to not copy everything that um, uh, Ms. Hannah has already gone over. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. No problem. Um, I know that um, the applicant had had his uh, solicitor on who wanted to do a bit of an introduction and I'm not sure if Rocky back is on but I'll, maybe I'll give a quick second if he is. Okay. Rocky's going to do a quick um, one minute introduction and then I'm going to run you through um, the applicant presentation. So maybe I'll pass it over to you Rocky. That's great. Mr. Vaca, are you on? Yes I am. Good evening your worship and members of council. Uh, quite frankly I had prepared a, uh, a detailed lengthy submission but <laughs> Since it's almost my bedtime, I'll be very brief. <laughs> okay, appreciate that, thank you. Uh, before I hand the floor over back to uh, Evan and, uh, and David from uh, Bosfields, who are the planning consultants, um, who will be making a brief presentation, I just wanted to highlight the following points. Um, first, the proposed development, as you will see in the presentation, is nothing short of spectacular. I can only characterize it as a world-class twin tower building befitting our world-class destination. In short, it is without exception a game changer for the Victoria Avenue Clifton Hill district. You will hear that we agree with and support planning department's recommendations before you, except we are seeking a reduction in the parking ratio from the recommended 1.25 parking spaces per dwelling unit to 1.02 parking spaces per dwelling unit. You will hear that this reduction to 1.02 is supported by our client's parking and traffic engineering consultant and is consistent with the parking ratio applied by the city for the Stanley District development on the former Cupolo Sports property. Also, I was uh, reviewing your agenda for this evening. I had some, some time to kill. Um, <laughs> and at item 8.12, a uh, report PBD 2022-027, uh, which you will be dealing with later this evening. Um, I note that um, there is a recommendation in support of a minister zoning order which would include a reduction in parking to 0 0.6 parking spaces per dwelling for much of the downtown area, if supported by a parking demand study. Again, 0 0.6. We have such a study here, and we are seeking 1.02 spaces per dwelling unit 
not the 0 0.6 spaces which is being recommended for the downtown area. I would now ask that Evan uh, from Bousfields proceed with his presentation. Um, I understand that Mr. Stu Elkins of Paradigm uh, Transportation, um, who is our parking and traffic engineer, uh, will also be uh, specifically addressing the reasons for the requested reduction in parking. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thanks uh, for that, Rocky. Mr. Vaca. And okay, through, Mr. Sugden, through you, go ahead. Worship, the floor is yours. Members of council. Yep. Um, my name is Evan Sugden. I'm a senior planner with Bowsfields. I'm a registered professional planner, and uh, with me today is David Fletta, also of Bowsfields, and we are the planning consultants for the applicant and uh, owner of the subject site, which is addressed 5613-5629-5633-5645 Victoria Avenue, and then two other addresses on Walnut Street. Uh, before we get into the presentation, I just wanted to say that the process we've had with city staff has been uh, fantastic. It's been a very collaborative process. Um, it's been quick. It's been uh, informational and staff have done a good job, I think, working with us and working with our clients to produce a report. Um, we commend them on their um, recommendation to approve the application, um, save and accept for uh, the one minor piece, which is the uh, parking reduction, which, which we'll get into in a little bit. And um, with that underway, I'm going to um, continue with the presentation. Just to keep things running smoothly, I noticed a couple of the other presenters um, <laughs> broke up a bit. So I'll turn off my video to help keep things smooth. Um, the subject site is located um, in the Clifton Hill Central Tourist District along the Victoria Avenue, which is an arterial road in the city. Uh, this area is one of several areas in the city where some of the highest buildings are constructed and are, are planned. Um, the intent being to create an internationally recognizable skyline. In addition to being within an area that's directed for higher development, higher rise developments, it's, it's also in the city's high rise strategy area, which permits building heights as of right up to 30 stories. Um, and as you can see from the image here, the area is built out with more intense and mixed uses, including residential, commercial, and entertainment uses with the uh, Niagara Casino down to the south here. Zooming in a little bit closer to the subject site, you'll notice that there's frontages along three roads. Victoria Ave again is an arterial road. <clears throat> which is um, designed to accommodate large volumes of traffic and is one of the main thoroughfares in, in Clifton Hill. Uh, Walnut Street is a local road and Ellen Avenue is a collector road. So between Ellen Avenue and, Victor uh, and Victoria Avenue, the subject site is well situated on a, um, a destination street within Clifton Hill. Again, you can see the built up area here, primarily consisting of, of a mix of uses between commercial and residential. And as Julie pointed out, there are some existing single detached low rise dwellings to the north northwest. And what we also wanted to point out was in the fullness of time, those buildings are planned to be built up for mid rise uses. And so when we were planning out the height and the massing for this building, we've provided uh, appropriate transitions to what is essentially the established neighborhood uh, residential areas, which are even further north and further northwest of the subject site beyond the mid-rise area. So the proposal is for a two-tower mixed-use commercial residential concept, a 35-story tower in the east containing 404 proposed hotel rooms, and a 36-story west tower containing 462 condo suites, um, a mixed-use podium, and then there are also seven street level townhouses along Ellen Avenue. Ultimately, the proposal will result in the provision of 469 new residential dwelling units for the city and for the neighborhood. Um, and the intent here is to bring new permanent residential population to the city. Um, the, not to have um, short, short um, period rental accommodations um, and the tenure is still up for debate right now, but as we understand it, it's 
proposed for condominium uses at this point. As Julie mentioned, there's six levels of above grade parking, one level below, and most of that parking is going to be accommodated in the podium, as you can see here where my cursor is. Uh, note that this rendering is for illustrative purposes and it may not exactly represent what the, what the final product will bring, which would be designed through site plan. But essentially, um, what we're going to get is um, residential uses at grade along Victoria Avenue. I think maybe it's beneficial to just skip ahead a bit, just keep things for the sake of time on the ground floor plan. So commercial uses at grade along Victoria Avenue. Um, the main function of the building will be off of Walnut Street for the drop off area, uh, which you can enter into the building through a shared lobby. There'll be condo lobby here towards Ellen and the hotel lobby here towards Victoria. Townhouse units are going to be street fronting along Allen Avenue. So when viewed from the street, residents will see essentially a, a townhouse building in keeping with the other um, existing structures. And those will segue into the podium. Access is, is to the um, rear here off of both Victoria and Allen, where they will go into and down to parking garages and, and loading area. Essentially what we were trying to accommodate was an interesting built form um, for the site. And I can back it up again to the, to the image. Um, we're providing articulated building design, a podium with um, appropriate tower separation of more than 25 meters. We did not go over the maximum uh, guiding floor plate size of 1000 square meters, as Julie mentioned. We've provided step backs from the podium um, and we've also provided a unique set of um, orientation of the towers so that there's um, adequate views of the falls and of the skyline from almost every balcony. So we're here before you today to request approval of, of two applications, the official plan amendment, which is to secure um, additional height and density as set out in the official plan and then a zoning bylaw amendment to rezone the lands for a new site-specific tourist commercial zone to permit on-street townhouses uh, at the ground floor, eliminate the percentage of floor area requirement for dwelling units, introduce site-specific exceptions, including the parking ratio, and to deem Victoria Avenue as the front lot line, um, among others. Uh, Julie also mentioned we took, undertook a, a variety of studies, and, and that's true. We did a lot of work to date to get to the point we are now, uh, including speaking to members of the public, um, having an open house, hearing comments, receiving comments, making revisions to the plans and getting those back to the city. We've done planning and urban design work, architectural concept plans, renderings, sun and shadow studies, uh, municipal servicing plans, engineering, infrastructure modeling, geotechnical, uh, environmental site assessments, pedestrian wind assessment, wind tunnels, testing, landscaping plans, and of course, transportation impact and parking study. And it was through that transportation impact and parking study that we were able to identify an appropriate parking ratio for the site based on a variety of reasons. Um, and before I pass that on to Stu Elgin, one of those reasons is um, the reduction of vehicle trips on site. And then second, in keeping with um, efficient development of land. So right now, this is a, a very underutilized site in the Central Tourist District in Clifton Hill. And this, this outcome would result in a more efficient use for the site and the reduction in parking would, would be in keeping with that. It's not, it's not in the client's interest, in our opinion, to reduce the number of proposed housing units for additional vehicle parking. Um, and, our, and in our opinion, the reduction is, is in alliance with the recently released uh, March 2022 report of the Ontario Housing Affil Affordability Task Force report, which through recommendation 12 would set uniform provincial standards for urban design, including removing or reducing parking requirements. So while this is not provincial or regional policy or, regu or regulation now, it is a provincial direction. And with that, I'll pass it off to Stu from Paradigm, who has um, additional rationale for why we're requesting it. And before I, and before I pass it off, um, 
to keep things a little simple for to, for council to understand what we're asking for is a modified version of staff's recommendation essentially mod, um, recommendation number one and that is that council approve the opa and zba for the 35 story hotel and 36 story residential tower with on-street dwellings subject to a parking rate that we've proposed of 1.02 spaces per residential dwelling unit and with that i'll pass it over to you Stu. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Can everybody hear me? Yep, we can hear you fine, Mr. Elkins. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, yes, as Evan has pointed out, uh, I am with Paradigm Transportation Solutions Limited. I'm a partner and vice president with the company. We carried out a comprehensive transportation and parking study as part of the application process which we completed in December 2021. Um, as you are aware, we're looking for a reduction in the parking rate from 1.25 spaces per unit to 1.02. Um, there's 469 residential units. We're looking at providing 479 parking spaces. So uh, part of the transportation parking study uh, was to determine a reasonable parking rate or supply for the overall development. And instead of just relying on the zoning bylaw requirements, we looked at uh, four different methods or approaches to determining what a reasonable parking supply should be. The first one we looked at was uh, utilizing the Transportation Tomorrow Survey where we looked at vehicle ownership rates for apartments in the city of Niagara Falls. And what we found was that um, there were basically 0 0.74 vehicles per unit for each apartment unit based on the surveys completed in Niagara Falls. And approximately 35% of those apartment units surveyed did not even own a vehicle. So this is our initial or our first method or approach to finding a reasonable parking supply. And based on this approach, it would appear based on this stat that providing 0.74 vehicles per unit should be sufficient. We also uh, looked into the trip making characteristics for apartment buildings or apartment units in Niagara Falls. Again, based on the TTS data or the Transportation Tomorrow Survey data and found that 76% of occupants chose to drive as their primary mode of travel. And again, this 76% um, relates well with the 0.74 vehicles per unit. The third method we looked at was undertaking a survey of parking utilization at another high rise condominium apartment in Niagara region during a weekday and a weekend. And what we found was the observed maximum parking demand to be 0 0.89 spaces per unit. So looking at these first three approaches or methods they're all coming up with a parking rate of less than even one space per unit. We then looked at uh, the Institute of Transportation Engineers parking generation manual. And it's um, a manual used by much of the industry and it's based on parking surveys that have been undertaken in the US and Canada. And based on a high rise apartment land use the ITE parking gen identifies a peak parking demand of 0.98 spaces per unit. So again, less than one space per unit. As you're probably aware, the site is located directly in front of transit stops on Victoria Avenue. There is Route 104 and WeGo that are currently serving the Victoria Avenue corridor. 
Route 104 provides connections to the Niagara Falls bus terminal with access to higher order regional GO transit service and via rail. And again, this development will certainly help increase ridership and support the case for integrated transit within the region and with GO slash Metrolinx. I would like to point out that many of existing zoning bylaws in many of the municipalities in Southern Ontario are in need of updating to conform or reflect current policies. Some municipalities have recently undertaken comprehensive reviews of their parking requirements and recognize that changes are required. The city of Niagara Falls uh, requires on average 35% more parking to be provided for residential uh, apartment development than would be required by the likes of the town of Oakville, city of Welland and city of Hamilton. As Evan pointed out, uh, we did take a look at the Ontario Housing Affordability Task Force report that was recently released. And the task force um, identified the following. Setting minimum parking requirements is an example of outdated municipal approaches that increase the cost of housing. The need for parking is increasingly less relevant with the availability of public transit and rideshare services. They also found that minimum parking adds as much as $165,000 to the cost of a new housing unit. And they also pointed out in the task force report that the demand for parking spaces are actually on the decline. And this is supported by data from the Residential Construction Council of Ontario, where they've shown that in new condo projects, one in three parking spaces actually goes unsold. So developers are providing three stalls, but actually only utilizing two of them at the end of the day. So based on this information, the affordability task force is actually recommending that municipalities reduce or eliminate their minimum parking requirements, especially for developments such as this one here that are located Daddy. on streets with transit service. Okay, so that means we, last week it was Jim. Daddy. Um, I, also wanted to mention, as Mr. Vaca has uh, earlier, that uh, the city recently approved the mixed use development referred to as the Stanley District. And that development, which consists of a high rise apartment building, a mid rise residential building and a hotel, um, they supported a parking rate of one space per residential unit. You know, and uh, now they call the in summary, the City of Niagara Falls official plan embraces sustainability and creating a vision for compact and complete communities served by streets made for walking, cycling and transit. This vision is supported by policies aimed at reducing auto dependence and limiting the amount of land occupied by automobile parking. So supporting a reduction in parking for this development will help work towards achieving this vision. And based on our quantitative assessment, we find that the provision of 1.02 spaces per unit is reasonable and helps achieve many policy related goals and objectives of the city and contributes to providing the ability for more affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Sugden, is anyone else, by the way, somebody, I'm not sure, someone online uh, needs to mute out their line. Uh, we could hear something playing in the background, sound like a video or something in the background. So back to you, Mr. Uh, Sugden. Uh, thank you. And through you, your worship and members of, members of council, and thanks to the team for providing a great technical background. I'd like to just summarize by saying the intent is to provide um, a mixed use 
commercial residential developments um, with grade related uses that activate the street along Ellen, uh, Walnut and Victoria, creating a, a better, more efficient use for the site, which is currently underutilized and providing um, permanent residential population for the city um, and a rather landmark building with unique design and architectural features that will stand out um, and, and, and set the tone for the future of Niagara Falls. And, and with that, um, I'll open it up. If there's any questions, we'd be happy to answer. As well, we have several members from our consulting team through uh, several of the disciplines uh, on the call that can also help and I can direct as appropriate. Okay, that's great, thank you for that. Okay, council, uh, here's your opportunity for any final questions for the presenters. Do we have any questions? Okay, seeing none, the public meeting with respect to the proposed official plan and zoning bylaw amendment is now concluded. What's the will of council? Uh, Looking for, okay, motion by Councillor Peter Angelo to move the recommendations and what of the parking requirement? Were you gonna address that at all or? Okay, good. That's good. We can do that. You'll second that, Councillor Thompson. So I'm going to go to staff. So I don't know if that would be Miss Dolch or that'll be Miss Hanna. Where would you like us to direct that for the um, question on the parking, um, the parking requirements? So they're asking for 1.02. The report says 1.25. So we're looking for a little bit of uh, commentary from our staff. So who would like to uh, address that for us? So Yep, you're good with the reduction. Okay, well, I gotta see if the mover is uh, where he's coming. But maybe, we'll, uh, Ms. Stolch, did you wanna did you wanna address Thank, that? Sure. Thank you, Worship. Um, and and maybe uh, if if um, Director Nico wants to comment oh. in as well, obviously. But um, transportation staff did look at the parking requirements. Um, obviously, they are comfortable with the reduction from one point four one point four to one point two five. The one point zero two. Um, they felt that um, was it because the the site is not near a transit hub, nor is the site near some grocery stores or other residential amenities uh, that you can easily get to. Um, they felt that the going down to one space could be problematic, especially given the fact that these aren't just one bedroom units, these are one and two bedroom units, uh, and two bedroom plus a den unit. So some of them may have uh, more uh, some additional requirements for parking uh, beyond that one space per unit. So there was some concerns there. Uh, they also did review that transportation tomorrow um, survey work, and it did. Um, they did look at it, but felt that um, that in the city of Niagara Falls, there's a little more warrant for especially, um, you know, the standard people that would be um, buying in these units, they may not be the elderly or the affordable housing um, units that, that normally could support something like a reduction. Uh, these would be more uh, for people that would be more active and um, looking to get around in the city. So I don't know if Mr. Nickel has anything or Director Nickel has anything further to add, but um, that's all I needed to say. Yeah. Mr. Nickel, any uh, further commentary? Yeah, thanks, uh, Mr. Mayor. And uh, Ms. Dolce uh, took most of my speaking points, but um, you know, what staff are recommending is, is a situation where one in four um, units um, are, uh, um, you know, are held for people with two cars and every other third unit, the, the occupants would be held to one space. Um, we feel that that's a reasonable mix of parking demand um, for occupants and owners of this, this facility. We know that in other built up communities that have better access to transit uh, and more transit movements through the city, they can rely on um, no car ownership. In this location, however, the transit routes that we have, um, the 104, doesn't service any sh any shopping or any grocery areas. It essentially would bring you to a transit hub that you would require you to transfer. And there is no efficient way to walk to any of those types of shopping amenities. So we feel that the mix of, of um, I'm, I'm sorry, we actually, we feel that the, the type of units warrant a greater um, parking demand than the transportation tomorrow survey, which 
as Mr. Elkins mentioned, did have a 0.74 conclusion for apartments in Niagara Falls, but the demographics in those apartments don't really reflect what we expect the clientele will be here. So if council chooses to accept a lower rate, that would, in staff's opinion, result in a 106 parking space deficit. And we don't have room on our city streets or in our municipal parking in close proximity to accommodate those extra on street parking parked cars. Uh, and so the developer hasn't provided an alternative plan. Whereas in the Stanley district, there was an alternative plan to lease parking across the street to accommodate the 200 plus space deficit. We haven't seen the same plan here. So for that reason, staff are sticking with our recommendation to um, stick with 1.25 spaces per unit. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you for that. Um, yep, uh, Councillor Peter Angel. Yeah, thanks. Maybe just a question through to staff then. I know there was another very, very large development that was on the corner of Stanley and Ferry. Um, and I know that that one there, I believe went all the way down to, was it 0.98, one, 1 1.02? It, it was right around one anyway. Um, and I'm just wondering like how you compare, how you contrast one development to the other and should we not be treating them all the same, that's all. Ms. Dolch. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, to the Councillor, I think Mr. Nickel did just answer that briefly. So he was speaking about the ferry application. And generally, they are providing off, they're looking to provide off site parking um, on leased lands as well, um, adjacent to the site in that instance. Thank you for that. Is there any other the council? Pardon me? So we've already got a motion on the floor. Uh, I don't think so. Yeah, Councillor Peter Angelo moved it and seconded by Councillor. Pardon me? What is the motion? The staff, recommendation. Staff's recommendation. So we're having some. So is there any other discussion to the motion, Councillor Thompson? Okay. Oh, well, then it wouldn't be. Yeah, you're right. So, okay, did you want to explain that to uh, uh, Mr. CAO to the status right now? Wayne, listen to this. Just so I'm clear, I believe Councillor Peter Angelo moved the staff recommendation. I believe Councillor Thompson seconded it, but seconded it at the lower parking. So I believe the motion hasn't actually got a seconder at this point in time because I believe your seconder was seconding a different uh, motion. So I believe. That motion requires a seconder. I will second the staff recommendation. Okay, we've got Councillor Campbell who had his hand up, so that was to second the recommendation. Okay, now discussion to the motion. Is there any discussion to the motion? Yes, Councillor uh, Lococo. Sorry, Councillor. Well, Councillor Lococo, then Councillor Dabrowski. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I know we had a lot of residents um, bring up their concerns and to them it is a residential neighborhood. They live in it. The problem I have with this is it is zoned for this development as much as a lot of people don't want it there. I do believe that there will be traffic issues putting that many people in that area when there's already traffic issues. Um, people are parking their cars out there and they're getting hit on a regular basis or they're getting gridlocked that they can't leave their driveways. I understand the concerns of the residents but I, I can't deny this application because it fits and I do support the, um, the parking at 1.25. Okay, any other discussion to the motion? Yeah, Councillor Dabrowski, I'm sorry. The motion so the motion is yeah. the recommendations, which is in the report, there are five recommendations. Yeah. The only um, de debatable point it seems at this point is the staff recommendation is for 1.25 parking spots per dwelling the applicant is requesting 1.02. So that's the only uh, deviation that we're dealing with right now, but there's a motion on the floor to move the recommendation it, as it is with 1.25 uh, parking spots. By Councillor Peter Angelo, so I think I got confused because you went to Councillor Campbell. So maybe that's where my confusion came from. Okay, yeah, no problem there. Did you wanna speak, Councillor? Yes, Councillor Peter Angelo. I, I just had a question in, in regards to once again, contrasting the Cupolo site. Um, I know that there's offsite parking. Is the offsite parking in relation to the addition 
that the building now has? Because didn't they come back for a few more floors? And is that what the offsite parking is tied to? Are you talking about which one? This one or Ferry Street? No, I'm talking about contrasting the two sites again, Cupolos. I, I, I seem to remember that at that site, it was a one space parking requirement. And I know that they've come back since for an addition to the building, and they now have offsite parking. My, my question is, is the offsite parking related to the addition in units? Or is it related to the original application? Because I don't remember offsite parking in the original application. So who would be able to answer that question, uh, Ms. Dolch? Thank you, Your Worship. Um, so my understanding, you are correct. I believe that the offsite parking is associated with, with what they're proposing now, the additional units. I do know, and I don't know if uh, perhaps Director Nickel wants to comment in, but I do know when they did look at the one space per unit on that site, there was a, a review of the transit situation as well in that area, and it does connect to two different lines, and they considered that uh, appropriate. There's two different lines that cross that uh, intersection at Ferry and uh, Maine. Thank you, Maine. Um, so that was the concern. Now, right now, they're looking at the additional parking based on the increased height they're looking at, um, but that'll have to be a lease situation. But generally, the the residential, because they do have both residential, mixed use, and hotel, um, so they are providing additional parking for additional uses as well um, on that site. So, in terms of the residential, though, they are looking at one space. Thanks. And so, Your Worship, when that development was first approved, it was approved at a one space per unit ratio. Ferry Street, are we talking now? Ferry Street, yes. yes. And the only reason is it because there's two lines of transit that cross it as opposed to one? That would seem, I mean, I, I just want to compare, you know, I, I just want to be consistent, that's all. Um, I, I don't know that one line of, of transit would, uh, would equate to 0.25 of a parking space. I'm just trying to understand how one can get one parking space per unit and another one has to have 1.25. Okay. Um, yeah, well, there's still discussion. And um, I've got Councillor Iannone who, her hand was up, but I don't see her on the screen right now. Okay. Yeah. Battery, did you say? Yeah. Battery? Yeah, okay. Right. It's not charging. So um, I don't know if. Uh, Ms. Dolch? And uh, between you and Eric, I don't see Mr. Nickel if he's still on the. Oh, there oh, he is. There he is. There he is. Did you want to jump in, uh, Mr. Nickel? So the question, uh, I don't know if you heard it. Did you hear the. Yes? Okay. Yeah, and, and thank you, Mr. Mayor. I don't have uh, easy access to the approvals that were given to the Stanley Ferry site. Um, I can tell you though that context is key and location is key and the supply of on-street on parking in the neighborhood is also key because we know that if the development can't support, um, or sorry, if the neighborhood can't support um, the, the overflow of parking in the situation where more than one person in the, in the home or the apartment owns a car, they need to rely on municipal sources of parking and in the case of Stanley Ferry, we have more on-street parking and even municipal lots available for, for public use. That situation is very different at Victorian Walnut. So context is very critical in addition to the access to transit, the walkability uh, to shopping amenities and um, generally what we would expect the ownership model to be and, and the expectations for car ownership to be based on affordability within the ownership model. Does that help, uh, Councillor Peter Angelo? Kind of. Um, so yeah. you know, maybe we can. And I've got you, Councillor Iannone. I've got your. Uh, I've got you up next. Um, I'm just wondering if we might be able to hear from uh, Mr. Vaca because I understand he was involved in both. Maybe you can just help us. I don't know uh, if you can just help connect the two, so we're apples to apples. Your Worship, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Uh, through you, yes, I was involved in the uh, the ferry street ferry street proposal, and the ratio there is one space per dwelling unit, 
Um, the developer has gone back and has added uh, a number of floors to, uh, to buildings. And in fact, later on this evening, you'll be considering an amendment to uh, the development agreement to uh, reorder the phasing of the three buildings. Um, but the, the offsite parking that was mentioned by Mr. Nickel, that is for the additional units. But the ratio is still one. That has not changed. Um, there's mention of transit lines. I believe that everyone is forgetting that we have more than one transit line in Victoria as well. We have WeGo, which, you know, I have lunch at Antica quite a bit, as many people know, and I see that bus come by every 10, 15 minutes. So there is a Niagara Transit line and there's also the WeGo line that comes by on a regular basis. Um, so, I mean, that's the context I can give you. Uh, it seems to me that if we're, we just followed a report on uh, adding additional units and affordability and to knock out two or three stories of a residential building because of parking, where the city has already approved a development at one space per unit down the street, just does not make sense to me, I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you for that. I've got Councillor Iannone uh, waiting to speak. Thank you, Mr. I'm sorry, I had to switch devices. My iPad is not charging, and Sean Oatley and I are going back and forth. Um, just to Mr. Vaca, this is, this is nothing to do with apples to apples. I, wanted to, I want to support this development. But when Mr. Nickel comes on and tells us the parking and traffic problems we're going to have if we don't stick to the staff report, the residents who live in that area over there are watching us wondering why we are not going to respect the fact that what's going to be built there is going to affect them. So like Councilor Lococo, I want to support this. But I'm going to support it with Victor's motion because that's the right thing to do for the built up area around there. And that's what Mr. Nichols job is. So I'm going to support it with with um, the parking spaces as is. I don't think we could possibly do apples to apples because they're not in the same spot and they're not affecting the same residents. Okay, thank you for that. I've got um, uh, Serge and Wayne Campbell. Uh, thanks, Your Worship. Just uh, one difference in terms of uh, the Stanley project in this, Ellen Avenue is full of parking lots. And uh, quite uh, right now they're, they're sitting empty. Our lots rarely full. So when you're thinking of uh, offsite parking where people can find locations, that's what Ellen is. It's, it's full of parking lots and they're not full 100% of the time where you don't have that same situation in the other. So you have that extra parking available to people coming to that, that, to that site. So I just wanted to uh, share that with council. Okay, thank you for that. We've got Councillor Campbell and Councillor Thompson. Thank you, Your Worship. No, we're not comparing apples to apples. We're comparing developer to developer. It's the same developer yeah. that's doing that on, on uh, Kuvlo's. Yeah. And we can't compare the two because of the situation that's being presented here tonight. We shouldn't even, even be on this uh, talk. It, it really is not helping in the, in the decision making. I agree. People in, uh, on those streets have difficulty some days. They can't even get out onto the street, get, get off the Walnut Street. If we were to drop it to 1.02 or 1.0, that's only going to complicate the situation even further. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Thompson? I think that uh, that if they do this and if they have a shortage of parking, they're going to get another piece of property or um, do something to solve the problem. They got a 35 and 36 uh, stories and they're going to have to look after the parking. If, they, if it doesn't work there on site, they'll have to do something else. Okay, well, if we don't have any further dialogue or any further uh, input here, I think we're at the point we gotta call the vote. 
Recorded so, vote, Mr. Mayor. Yep, that was already requested, uh, Councilor oh. Iannone, by Councilor Thompson. So, Mr. Clerk. Mr. Mayor, could you repeat the, the motion, what it is? So, the motion is the, fi is the recommendation that's in the report. Okay, five recommendations. Okay, Councilor Campbell. In favor. Councilor Dabrowski. In favor. Councilor Iannone. In favor. Councilor Curio has declared a conflict. Councilor Lococo. In favor. Councilor Peter Angelo. Yes. Councilor Strange. In favor. Councilor Thompson. Yes. And Mayor Diodati. In favor. That passes unanimously. Okay, thank you for that. And thank you to everybody for uh, participating in that planning matter. Okay. Now. Pardon me? Oh, yeah, we're going to get. Uh, Oh, did he go to get him? Okay. No, Good. I don't think he did. Okay. Hey, Bill. Can you do a motion for the panel extension? <laughs> yeah, okay. He was asleep. I was having a nice time. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Clerk? Uh, just before we start the next planning item on the agenda, uh, it's just suggested that we get a motion as per the procedural bylaw to extend past 10 p.m. Looking for a motion to extend past 10, moved by Councillor Strange, seconded by Councillor, someone to go past 10. Councillor Lococo, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Contrary. How many are in favor? Okay, uh, well, okay. Opposed? You can't be for both. You got to pick one no, or the no. other. No, well, you're you're jumping all over the place. Start over again. Okay. We're going to call the vote for those in favor of extending beyond 10 p.m. Please raise your hands. <coughs> one, two, three, and opposed. One, two, three. I vote in favor to extend uh, beyond. You guys are beautiful. Okay, you're beautiful. Okay. Uh, Mr. Clerk, can you please introduce the next item on the agenda? Uh, I could wait till later, but I'll point out now that we'll look for another motion if we go past 1030, as per the procedural bylaw. But as we uh, continue with our planning processes here, a public meeting is now being convened to consider a draft plan of subdivision and to consider uh, if, or sorry, and to consider Sorry, proposed amendment to the city zone bylaw to allow for the individual ownership of four semi-detached and 15 townhouse dwelling units and to also rezone the land to a site-specific residential low density grouped multiple dwelling R4 at 5267 to 5279 Van Alstine Place. Notice was given by first class mail in accordance with the Planning Act on February 18th, 2022 and by posting a sign on the property in question. Anyone who wants notice of the passing of the draft plan of subdivision and the zoning bylaw amendment to participate in any site plan process if applicable or preserve their opportunity to appeal to the Ontario Land Tribunal shall give notice to the city clerk immediately after today's public meeting or use the sign-in sheets that are posted just outside council chamber. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. I now ask our director of planning, Ms. Dolch, to explain the purpose and reason for the proposed draft plan and bylaw amendment. Thank you, Your Worship. I again have Julie Hanna. Um, we're changing things up a little bit just to uh, allow staff some time uh, to present to council. Yeah, that's great. All right, Ms. Hanna, the floor is yours once again. Uh, thank you again, um, Mr. Mayor, and I will try to go very quickly through uh, the slide deck for your, your uh, evening um, agenda. And so t uh, tonight I'm presenting uh, the public meeting for the zoning bylaw amendment and draft plan of vacant land condominium for 5269 to 5279 Van Alistine Place. Um, and as the clerk identified, is to permit four semi-detached and 15 townhouse units. Uh, the location of the subject land um, is north of Stamford Street at the uh, terminus of Van Alistine, um, and it's located uh, 
west of Victoria Avenue. Uh, the surroundings are detached uh, dwellings. The Hindu temple is to the west and there's commercial, uh, specifically Bell Canada building um, adjacent to the property off of Victoria Avenue. The proposed elevations uh, are on the slide before you. Um, there are three story buildings at a height that is lower than the existing zoning uh, for the surrounding neighborhood, as well as the zoning height of uh, the proposed zone. The condominium plan shows the 19 uh, dwelling units. Um, the semi-detached uh, units are located on the southern portion of the site, and there is visitors parking uh, available off of Van Allestine Place. In terms of the requested uh, zoning relief, uh, there's several um, items that are being requested. The minimum lot area, the minimum rear yard, the minimum interior side yard, the minimum privacy yard depth, the um, minimum lot frontage, uh, which is an existing situation on Van Allestine uh, Place. Um, I won't read the numbers for you. It is in the report and on the slide before you right now. Uh, the applicant um, is requesting these amendments for a 0.46 hectare parcel of land. Uh, it will result in the ownership of individual units of um, land for dwelling units. The land is currently zoned uh, residential two, and the request is for a site specific uh, R4 zone. We did hold a neighborhood open house and we had one uh, resident that was in attendance. Uh, we also have received several written comments um, that are on this evening's agenda. And so uh, the public concerns are provided for you on this slide. Um, the concerns included the infrastructure capacity, on street parking, loss of privacy, and the proposed architecture. Uh, so in response, um, Municipal Works does not have any concerns with the proposed capacity and draft plan conditions are in place uh, should Council approve the proposal to um, confirm the capacity for the development. Uh, the proposed development meets the parking uh, requirements and visitors parking is provided on site. Um, ben Allison Place is actually going to be reconstructed as part of the extension of services, so there is the opportunity to um, pave more Van Allestine Place to um, have a, a wider laneway as well as uh, maintain the on-street parking that is permitted. Um, as I indicated, the building height is consistent with the uh, permitted height in the neighborhood. Um, in addition, there will be a screening fence that will be installed surrounding the property to buffer neighbors um, and a landscape plan is required as well. Uh, this neighborhood is not a designated heritage conservation uh, district and um, as a result, architectural control is not in place to prevent a more modern design. In regards to uh, the various policies at the provincial, regional, and city level, it is um, consistent and conforms to all of the policies that uh, were reviewed and outlined in the staff report. Um, in all of the policies, it conforms because a variety of housing types is provided, it meets the density targets uh, required, and it is a transit supportive development that is within the built up area. Um, the requested zoning bylaw amendments is appropriate because of the proposed use um, is being regulated by the proposed zone. The requested and recommended regulations um, maintain suitable setbacks to the existing neighborhood. There's an appropriate building envelope and a compact building form is facilitated. Um, and as I indicated earlier, the reduction in the lot frontage is um, due to an existing situation with Van Allestine Place, and that will result uh, at that location with the extension of a private road access. Um, we do recommend that a apartment dwelling um, be not permitted uh, in this zone, and that will um, provide assurances to the residents that uh, the dwelling type will be townhouses and semi-detached uh, dwellings, which are um, similar in nature to uh, detached form. In terms of the condominium design and the conditions of approval, uh, the proposal conforms with um, the provincial matters and section 5124 of the Planning Act. Um, as I indicated earlier, it's transit supportive. It assists in the creation of a complete community, minimize land consumption and servicing costs. And the draft plan conditions that are outlined in the report will address servicing, fencing, and trees that will buffer the neighbors. So staff recommend that council approve the zoning bylaw amendment application and draft plan of 
vacant land condominium application as outlined in the report and approve the conditions um, that are aligned in Appendix A to the staff report. And that concludes the presentation. Okay, thank you very much for that. Any questions of council for staff? Councilor Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I was wondering if Ms. Hanna could put that picture back of the, the truck that was parked there and the, the fence. I drove by there the other day and there were two cars parked there and it was really difficult to get around. How is it going to be widened? Because on the right hand side, there's a very little piece of grass and then that fence. And on the other side of the cars is a, a sidewalk. How would that be widened? Um, I experienced the same uh, situation when I went to visit, as you can tell, uh, there was, had been quite a bit of snow. Um, so currently um, the pavement and, and of course, Director Nickel can speak further to this. Um, it is not at the six meter that uh, would be the city standard um, for a road in this location. Um, and there is already an agreement for the off, off on street uh, parking for um, the abutting uh, apartment building. Um, so the intention is to utilize more of the existing right of way that the city currently owns um, and have more of it paved to provide uh, better access um, onto the abutting parcel that is the subject property, as well as um, have uh, a better situation for the off-street parking or on-street parking. Through the mayor to Ms. Hanna, uh, on the right-hand side or the left-hand side, what right of way would you be taking? There uh, three, Mr. Mayor, there is uh, no requirement for right of way dedication. Um, the existing right of way mm -hmm. is sufficient. Uh, it is just a case of the design of the uh, road surface has not been to city standards in terms of the width required for um, access onto uh, a property, as well as providing uh, one lane for on street parking. And that will be something when uh, the developer applies for uh, clearance of their draft plan conditions. Um, the city engineering staff and transportation staff will review the engineering plans. And uh, through that process, um, they will determine the improvements that need to be made to Van Alistine Place. Through the mayor, I, I'm sorry, I still don't understand. It said widen, so how are you, are you, making the road wider and if you are are you going to the right where the fence is um is there a way from victoria avenue um that bell uh, property to go in that way or from second avenue why does it have to be van elstein uh through you mr mayor uh this parcel does not have any access onto victoria avenue um they would have to negotiate with the uh bell canada or the owner um, of that parcel to acquire easement rights. Uh, there is a narrow um, access off of uh, 2nd Avenue um, to this parcel that is also the subject of an easement to the abutting property, um, but that width is less than the width at Van Alistair Place, and our engineering and transportation staff are satisfied with the access um, being proposed onto the subject parcel for the proposed development. And the surface uh, is what would be widened, not the land holdings uh, currently owned by the municipality. Thank you. I just want to ensure I'm, I'm getting that the surface of the existing road, you're going to go off to the right hand side where that strip of grass is. Is that what you're doing? The, the municipal works will go off onto grass and pave it uh, to standards that meet uh, the city standards. So that fence that's there, is that still going to remain? Uh, that is on private property. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you, any other questions of council for staff? Okay, seeing none. Members of the public are advised that failure to make an oral or written mm -hmm. submission at this public meeting will result in the Ontario Land Tribunal dismissing any referral it receives. Failure to notify the city clerk to preserve their opportunity to appeal will result in staff rejecting an appeal as for section 3419 of the Planning Act. <clears throat> Excuse me, council will now hear from anyone other than the applicant who wishes to speak to the proposed draft plan and bylaw mm. amendment. Mr. Clerk, who do we have that would like to speak to this? Uh, well, currently, let's uh, start with the two uh, residents that are here in the chambers. So okay. If we want to invite them to the podium and give their names and address for the record. Okay, Mr. 
Gupta, if you'd like to come to the mic, and if you could introduce yourself and state your address for the record, please. Sure. Oh, the microphone's got to be turned on. Okay, okay, thank you. Sorry for that. <clears throat> My name is Vijay Kapoor, and uh, I'm representing the Niagara Hindu Samaj at 5284 Second Avenue. And with me, uh, our president, Mrs. Kanchan Raghi, and uh, she's the president of Niagara Hindu Samaj, representing this temple, Shiv Mandir which uh, I think you have visited that also almost everyone over there. So the only concern what we have, the, when the development is going to be done, they had the right of way. And that was my question. The right of way is going through our temple. Is that going to be used for the traffic or how that is going to be used for? And second question, which uh, Lori did ask about that, the uh, right way over there, fence, has to be removed or this, when the snow is there, you can see in the picture also how the traffic is going to go there too. My third point is that uh, we already have too much problem of the traffic on the second avenue. There are a lot of potholes are over there too, beside the temple. It's not been fixed yet. But where they are going to park? We are not allowed to park on the street. When we have our functions, we can't park over there. Mm. And now how? this uh, development is going to afford that parking and next thing what we are concerned is the noise level we don't know who are going to be the tenants in those properties in the condominiums or the townhouses and are they going to be regularly using our temple site for going towards uh, the condominium or the townhouses there is going to be security concern is also there how we are going to protect our own security we already have a problem from the neighbors because uh, we are having some outside uh, function sometimes, just like the hover. We just uh, have this uh, uh, fire over there and uh, the people are complaining on it. But we are there, we don't know what to do, the next one over there. And now all of a sudden, this kind of development is going to be there. On this Saturday, we had a big function over there uh, for our holy function which uh, Jim has already attended so many times, sorry for that. But uh, when we had the holy function, the people they started complaining. We already informed to the police that we have a function here today, so it will be done. And they say, we have started early in the morning. We did not. We started only after 2 o'clock. And we finished at 7 o'clock. But we don't have that kind of freedom there. Now, by adding up all that kind of the facilities over there, how that is going to protect us. This is the only religious organization of Hindu we have in the Niagara region. We are just looking for our protection. No objections about the development, they can do it. But at least look our security, our stages where we are. We are looking for the expansion. We offer these buyers, the people who have done this application, okay, please sell us this land to us. But they were asking, exorbitant uh, the amount so much over there which they got it from Masonic Lodge. It was only four hundred thousand dollars now they were asking 1.5 million. We, uh, Temple is charitable organization could not afford that. So we don't know exactly the development ideas and even though I did get a phone call yesterday uh, from uh, the one of the owners and he said, yeah, we would like to have a meeting. I said, sure, we can have a meeting, there's no problem. But we tried to talk to you a bit more than a year ago also. Nothing happened. So we were trying to work on something together so that let's combine them together or sell to us also. Don't make too much profit in there, just donate it. The father agreed, but somehow the other thing did not work out. Then we kept quiet, what can we do? We cannot afford that much. So all our concern right now is to look into the right of way, which right of way they are going to use it from, and what purpose is that. And secondly, accommodation of the parking. We already have the problem. Are they also going to face the problems in the same way or not? The entrance over there, they, they told me that they bought a property on Macrae. 
and which they are going to use it for uh, the entry into the building. So when I talked to him yesterday, I was told that no, uh, we are going to leave the property as is. We are going to use only on that site, uh, that street where this uh, car parking was there. So I said, I don't understand that. Uh, what should we do? I'm sorry, we missed our meeting in the January. Uh, I think it was in January or February. February it was, in January it was, right? So mm -hmm. anyway, I missed that meeting. Otherwise, I could have seen that something more details. But uh, these are our concerns. We want the council to address that also, that how it should be looked into. And we want the people to come forward, no doubt about it. We want the people to come to our worship place. We want to invite everyone, but at the same time, look into our security, our protection, noise level. We want peace over there, not this uh, too much um, um, openness, uh, um, intrusions or something like that. We have recently heard that so many uh, temples are being uh, raided. A lot of things have been stolen from there also. We have to lock our doors all the time. We have to have somebody over there all the time to let the people come in. We can't leave the door open. There's no security. Okay. So well, those are our concerns only, and I would appreciate if you can look into that one. Okay. Well, maybe if you just hang on, we'll see if we can get some answers. So I'm going to start with our director of planning, and you can direct or answer the questions if you could, Ms. Dolch. Thank you. I'll start, and um, generally, so I'll start with first the the traffic or the parking. The parking, obviously, this development itself does have adequate parking on site for all its all its uses. So mm -hmm. all the residential uses have their own spots and things like that. So generally, the issue on street is an existing situation that's occurring. But obviously, the developer is willing to look at that, and it, our infrastructure, our municipal work staff is willing to look at that in terms of the road uh, pavement wide to try to resolve the issue that's currently occurring on street that uh, is existing now today. Um, in terms of um, security, what I can tell you is that as sites redevelop, um, when you have vacant pieces beside you or, or underdeveloped pieces, a lot of times that does create security issues. But as you put more development there, there's more eyes on the street and people watching and people seeing what's happening. So it does actually improve security when you have underdeveloped or vacant parcels that start to be developed. It actually improves the security situation. Um, in terms of noise, obviously you have functions and that, that's great uh, to have. Uh, we do have noise bylaws, so obviously those things are regulated. Um, but other than that, the uses are compatible together, both types of uses. They can work <coughs> together. Um, it's just something we have to control through violence, should there be an issue. How about the right of way? Um, can you explain something about that right of way, how that is going to be addressed? And I may defer to staff because I'm not, I'm not positive what you're referring to on the right of way, so I'm going to just see if Mr. Bryce or Mr. Ms. Hannah has that information. Yes, I think I can answer that question. If I can pull up the site plan uh, for the, uh, the staff report, mm -hmm. uh, if I can just ask for that to be pulled up. Um, anyways, the site plan uh, does show um, the, uh, if you can look at the lower left hand corner, it does show a right of way out to Second Avenue. That is not being used for access to this development. The access is coming from Van Hiles Time Place. Okay. okay, my question is, is there a possibility that if that right of way can be closed to um, stop any kind of movement from there? Or is there any difficulty for that one? So that we can have a little bit more privacy? That that would be uh, an arrangement between yourselves and the private developer. There's currently a legal agreement uh, on the land, so you would need to speak with the developer. That was that agreement was with the previous people. Yeah. Yeah. So that agreement was with the so Masonic, Masonic Lodge. Masonic Lodge. So that uh, must have been carried forward. I don't know exactly how that works out. Our only concern right now is to, uh, we're not against the development, mm -hmm. but at the same time, we're looking into this one. If the second avenue, the right of way is going to be used from there, there's already a lot of potholes also is not being looked after properly. And uh, uh, the more so movement is going to be there, and you're using this uh, entrance only on one side. They so have entrance from Van Alstein. 
Uh, I was so, saying yes, that's what it is. So through you, Mr. Mayor, um, there is one, only one access being proposed, and that's off Van Alistair Way. Uh, there is a right of way and a small sliver of land, um, as Mr. Bryce indicated, off of Seacourt Avenue. Uh, no access is being proposed uh, or use of that land. Uh, for the most part, it would remain vacant and in its existing um, condition, which is partially grass and partially uh, gravel. Um, so that would allow the uh, temple um, to utilize that land as per their legal agreement that they have on title. And in terms of the road condition, um, of course, any complaints uh, can be directed to the Municipal Works Department. And, and um, with this past winter that we've had, there's potholes all throughout uh, Niagara. And, and so um, given time, they, they will be filled. No, I have already referred that to the uh, parking and uh, city development side or whatever it was, planning department. Right the there is that pipe. <coughs> and goes pipe, yeah, pipe goes through our land, right? There's a pipe goes that out there too. Coming from that okay. other building. Now, from that building, where the construction is going to be done for that uh, development of the project, there's a drainage pipe, comes pipe in our drainage pipe comes in our property. And Has city. that uh, been uh, looked into? City has no record of it. Um, I have to ask Mr. Nickel if he could weigh in on that one. I would think uh, the drainage the pipe, um, Mr. Nickel. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I don't know specifically the drainage pipe you're looking at. Right now, there's two, uh, if we're talking about drainage between two private properties, that's a civil matter. If we're talking about drainage into municipal right of way, then um, you know the drainage from land into a municipal right of way is permitted, and, and that's part of the services we provide to residents. The development, however, of this development off of Van Alstein will require servicing. And it's likely that servicing will need to come from Van Alstein Place. And um, nonetheless, all of the drainage on site will need to be captured and, and ensure that it doesn't run off into off site locations and enter into municipal services available um, at the adjacent property line. It is probably older than 100 years. The drain. Drainage? I'm sorry, I'm not understanding. No, the, the drainage which comes from Masonic Lodge, this uh, present property, and two hours, that was also Masonic property. They had one drainage going between both the properties. As uh, he just mentioned that uh, it is between the two owners over there, but that uh, drainage has been there for over 100 years. And no record is available anywhere. Uh, they have tried to look at uh, whatever was going on and uh, who is going to be responsible or how that is going to be maintained or something like that. So we don't know about that at all. So that, uh, that issue was not addressed at all. Mr. Nichol, I don't know if you uh, wanted to add anything to that? Yeah, the only thing I can add is this, this is planned to be developed through a, a condominium. And so the, the next steps would include some of those more detailed assessments to look at the drainage on site. If this development relied on your lands for its drainage, they would need to secure those approvals or find an alternate plan to eliminate that reliance and take their servicing for drainage out to municipal locations. So I think it's fair to say that that is a next step if this project is approved, but it doesn't need to be determined before council decides on how they want to deal with this development. So that's not for that's tonight. Yes. That's fine. Thank you. Okay. That's all right. Okay. okay, thank you very much, Mr. Kapoor. Uh, Councilor Campbell. <clears throat> thank you, Your Worship. Just, uh, and this is sort of my concerns as well. So the next time this comes back, we could request a fence around that entire property, which would secure the parking lot for their work place of worship. So Ms. Dolch, uh, for site plan, is that something that's possible? Through you to, to the councillor, uh, I believe if I, if I remember correctly, there is a fence being proposed on this site already to go around the entire site. No. But that has, that's not being passed tonight. It's part of the condition and if I can find it, um, it is on, it's in one of the conditions here uh, about fencing around the site. And that would be around, completely around the site, including that little piece that goes on to Second Avenue. Uh, Miss Hannah, is it around yeah. the entire site? Thank you. Um, yes. Uh, thank you, um, Kira. Uh, 
There is a condition, um, as the director of planning was indicating, Katie, it was it's condition number seven, and that requires the developer to plan provide a landscape plan, and the plan is to include a wood screen fence along the adjacent residential properties, and that would also, of course, include the um, temple itself because it would encapsulate the side yard of the townhouses. And what would be the height of that fence? It, it would meet the uh, high requirements of um, the city's bylaw, which typically is 1.8 meters. About six feet? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. So there'll be a six foot fence all the way around. Thank you. Okay, that's good. Thank okay. you, Andrew Schmidt. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I, look, can I say one more point? Yes, yes. I just wanted to congratulate her also on her 80th birthday. We just <laughs> celebrated last year, last week only. 80th. 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 I wanted to consultate her tonight like that. Too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You are welcome. Uh, Mr. Clerk, is there anyone else who wishes to speak? Uh, no, Your Worship, there's nobody registered online. Okay, that's great, thank you. Okay, well, Council will now hear from the applicant or his or her representative. Uh, they're just reconnecting now, okay, great. There we go, welcome, uh, how do you say, it? is it Roe, is that how you say it? Yes, sir, Mr. Mayor. All right, Mr. Rowe, welcome to the meeting. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, Julie did a great job of uh, you know, giving an overview of everything. I'm not gonna duplicate her slides. Thank um, you. I did hear some of the comments from, from the counselors uh, and, and from uh, the, the members of the temple next door. So I'm just gonna focus right now on, on addressing those comments, providing a little bit more information as we, we did the design. I'm gonna forego that slide deck that I, I provide. Everything's been covered, but feel free to, to refer to it for reference. Um, so just based on my notes that I have here, Mr. Mayor, um, to Councilor Lococo's point, uh, yes, um, all of our servicing connections are gonna have to occur uh, out at Stamford. So we'll have to reconstruct Van Alstein Place. So as we go through our detailed engineering process uh, through our condominium clearance or site plan process, um, we'll be working with city staff to uh, confirm with them what's acceptable in terms of a road design to improve that urban cross section, widen the pavement as required, and make sure that we have adequate, adequate room so that the function of that street remains, that we still get emergency vehicles, things of all that nature. That's uh, all has to be approved by staff and we're well aware of the need to do that reconstruction and fix a bit of that geometry. So it is a substandard road, but we do have a fair amount on uh, the east side of the boulevard to probably work with that and, and come up with a, a more appropriate design for that street. Um, the second comment that I had was uh, from the members of, of the temple. Um, yes, the only vehicular access for this property is going to be coming off of Van Alstine Street. Um, I looked a little bit into the, the right of way. That's actually registered on title. I'm not a legal expert. What I kind of inferred from it is there used to be a roadway through there, but the city stopped it up many years ago. But the right of way still allowed the property owner to have right of access to get into their property. That's my understanding, but we can of course confirm that for staff if they'd like to know more. Um, the entirety of the site will be fenced. Um, so there is no um, risk of trespass from the neighbors. Uh, also, one of our condo units is down at the southwest corner, so it'd be a little awkward for people to be walking through their backyard and going out that way. I'm sure that wouldn't sit well with the, the residents of the condominium. So it will be our intention to do a full perimeter fencing. There won't be any access provided to the temple. And that six foot uh, woodboard fence around the property uh, is what's contemplated this time. We just showed on the site plan uh, for preliminary purposes just to help articulate the design that we're trying to go with. Um, in terms of the noise levels, condos are great neighbors. They come with an additional level of control that allows you to regulate certain activities. And when people are out blind, there's penalties or you can be removed from that condo. Um, so certainly uh, everybody would be subject to uh, the noise bylaw of the city. Um, but if there's any issues, that condominium uh, board uh, could receive any comments from the neighbors about uh, noise impacts and they could reprimand or speak to whoever is the owner that may have caused that nuisance. So you have that additional check and control that's there. Um, I believe we've covered off the security. Um, in terms of, as I mentioned, that access out to Second Avenue, as I noted, all servicing is going through Van Alstein, so there should be no reconstruction on there. Maybe saving except a little bit of resodding and things of that nature as we go through construction, uh, moving equipment around uh, and, and so forth. Uh, I think that's all the items that were brought up, but certainly if I missed anything, um, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. 
Uh, thank you for that. Uh, any questions of council for Mr. Rowe? Okay. Oh, uh, Councilor Campbell. <clears throat> Excuse me. They're putting up a fence. Will there be any uh, bush, trees uh, around the Some inside of the fence? Landscaping, landscaping on the inside? Landscaping on the inside of the fence, Mr. Rowe? Yeah. Uh, through Mr. Chair, uh, one of our requirements is that we need to do a landscaping plan. So. Um, obviously, it's aesthetically pleasing to make sure that we get uh, some good landscaping in there. We did provide a preliminary plan with our submission, uh, and you can get a copy of that from staff. Um, we'll, of course, be enhancing that and making it a little bit more robust as we get into our grading and, and engineering design. Um, but uh, yeah, it would be our intention to landscape and provide some trees throughout that development. Um, and I believe there's also a condition for us to evaluate any tree saving opportunities uh, along the perimeter of the site. Thank you. Okay. That's great. Thank you for that. All right, uh, if there's no further questions, the public meeting with respect to the proposed draft plan of subdivision and zoning bylaw amendment is now concluded. Councillor Thompson, you're moving the five recommendations, six recommendations, seconded by Councillor Peter Angelo. And if there's no further discussion, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for being here, Mr. Kapur, and thank happy you 80th much. birthday. Thank, well. you thank you Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Thank you very Good night. Uh, Mr. Clerk? Uh, yeah, it might be appropriate to get another uh, extension. This would be the final extension uh, as per the procedural Council bylaw. Before you run away, we just got to call this vote. To go past uh, 1030, the first uh, motion was just to give us an additional 30 minutes. Uh, this motion does require a two-thirds majority. Two-thirds majority, okay. We've got some, Mr. CAO, we've got some time-sensitive issues, I understand, too. So we've got some time, we don't meet again until April the 12th, is it, I think? Uh, yes. yes, so we've got some things we've got to get covered so we don't have to have a special meeting. So uh, I'm looking for, so we've got a motion by Councillor Dabrowski, second by Councillor Strange, that we extend. Um, as we long need, as the mayor's report goes at the end of the next meeting. <laughs> yeah, that, okay, that's what added the time. We'll call the vote, please. All those in favor? Thank you very much. It was a little too close last time. You had me nervous. Thank you. I, you did. I'm, <laughs> I'm awake. <laughs> Mr. Clerk, can you please introduce the next item on the agenda? Uh, yes, Your Worship, a public meeting is now being convened to consider a proposed plan of vacant land condominium at 6353 Carlton Avenue. Notice was given by First Class Mail in accordance with the Planning Act on February 25th, 2022, and by posting a sign on the property in question. Anyone who wants notice of Council's decision shall give notice to the City Clerk immediately after today's public meeting. Thank you, Mr. Clerk, and I'll ask our Director of Planning, I'm not sure who exactly, but if she could let us know uh, and, and explain the purpose of the application. Thank you, Your Worship. Actually, I have Alexa Cooper, oh, who's our other planner to, uh, going to provide the public uh, presentation. That's a great real team approach. Ms. Cooper, are you available? Yes, I'm here. Oh, there you are. Okay, good. Welcome to the meeting. The floor is yours. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Mayor Diodotti and members of council and members of the public, if we still have anyone here with us. Um, tonight I will be giving a presentation regarding the vacant land of Condominia for 63 Carlton Avenue, and this is to permit 32 townhouse units for individual ownership. The subject land is located on the west side of Carlton Avenue here, south of Age of Bridge Park. Um, surrounding the property, primarily so the Dutch dwellings to the west, the south, and the east, and then over to the north is the park, as well as Princess uh, Margaret's School. So, for some background, in 2019, the lands were rezoned to site specific R4 zone to permit the proposed uh, 30 unit townhouse development. Um, and now they have applied for a corresponding vacant land of condominium, uh, separate the land into 32 units for individual sale and um, for lands in common. So here is the proposal. Um, it is comprised of 32 house units. There is a private road as well as uh, in, uh, spaces for visitor parking. So through the um, zoning application process, 2017, neighborhood and house to house, um, 
There were a number of concerns that were raised and addressed through the, the rezoning application. I'll just go over them here. Uh, there were pr privacy concerns, um, which the developer promised to provide a 2.4 meter fence along budding pro properties to address this. There are concerns about tree preservation. Um, so a tree saving plan has been added as a condition of condo to identify any trees that can be preserved. There are traffic concerns. Um, the proposed development is expected to generate peak hour volumes of 20 vehicles in the morning and 47 in the afternoon, which is a rate of less than one per minute. Um, and our traffic um, staff had no concerns with this. Uh, for servicing, our municipal work staff said that the existing sanitary sewer can accommodate uh, the proposed development. And there was also concerns regarding snow removal and garbage collection, which the condo board will be responsible for um, the site maintenance, which would include um, snow removal and garbage collection. Um, an analysis was completed through the rezoning application in 2019. Uh, the rezoning application and the proposed vacant land of condo application conforms to provincial, regional, and local policies, as well as complying with the site-specific zoning for the property is varied. Um, consideration to 5124 of the Planning Act for vacant land of condo, the development conditions are not premature for the proposal um, as it's within the built-up area there's existing capacity for it and site plan matters will be addressed prior to registering an agreement on title. So the rec staff's recommendation uh, is that council approve the draft vacant land of condominium subject to the recommendations that are contained in the staff report on the agenda tonight. Thank you. Any just going to announce that from the, members of council. Sorry, just going to mention the mayor stepped away from his seat. Councillor Curio will just uh, take over as the uh, chair for the public meeting. Thanks, Bill. Hey, are there any questions from members of council? Seeing none, council will hear from anyone other than the applicant who wishes to speak to the plan of vacant land condominium. Mr. Clerk, do we have anyone that wishes to speak? Uh, Mr. Chair, we do not have any residents uh, registered to speak to this matter. Council will now hear from the applicant or his or her representative. Close the meeting. Close Hello? Meeting. Yes. Yeah, do you hear me? We Are can. Yes. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, my name is Hamid Razavi and I am an architect, a licensed architect. And, uh, uh, I'm, call, I'm, uh, I'm uh, on behalf of my company Apex, and also beside me, uh, the owners are sitting beside me. And uh, well, uh, uh, Alexa Cooper, I, <laughs> she made our life easier. <laughs> so, because uh, this is what actually we were looking for. Well, this property was bought by our owner in 2020. Well, at that time, uh, in 2019, November uh, 12, the council approved that, uh, a that the uh, townhouses, which was rezoned at the same time. So when we take over this one together with the owner, uh, we, we had a pre-consultation meeting with, uh, with uh, Alexa, and uh, uh, we, were, uh, we were given a, 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 a checklist that uh, you need to follow when you are submitting this one. At the time that uh, you are submitting for a draft plan of condominium, uh, well, at all, also at the same time the site plan approval, but site plan approval is going to be conditioned where the, uh, the draft, of, draft plan of condominium is going to happen. So we got all those uh, comments that we were supposed uh, to get it, uh, uh, well, to, to address all of those in checklist, and we did. Uh, we are working and we work on that one. There are some comments that was, uh, was indicated by Alex, uh, for instance, regarding the uh, defense, uh, the uh, uh, one story looking, and uh, those items, and uh, beside those, uh, uh, well, at the same, also there were uh, there were some uh, minor variants at the same time that 
We uh, participated and we attended them, and then uh, that one actually was approved too. So, um, so right now, uh, we, but we completed our uh, drawing and uh, whatever that is required for the draft plan of condominium, and we submitted uh, in last December, and uh, we'll just be waiting to get the comments uh, regarding basically oh, regarding the uh, civil oh. and grading that we got that one actually yesterday that uh, all the comments that uh, we got yesterday so what we were expecting those to be as a condition and for sure we will address all of those in our next submission okay that's great thank you for that are there any questions of council for the applicant no. seeing none the public meeting with respect to the proposed plan of vacant land condominium is now concluded. Yeah. Motion by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Cario, that we approve the five recommendations in the report. There's no further discussion. We'll call the vote. All those in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you for that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. All right, so let's get I back. would move. Eight one to eight six. Um, okay, motion from Councilor Thompson. Eight one to eight, eight six. Eight one to eight six. Okay. Okay. We being. Uh, sorry, Councilor Strange. Okay. And me. And okay, so we've got three conflicts on eight point. I'm sorry, on eight point six. Okay. So motion to move 8.1 to 8.6 with uh, three declarations of conflict. Uh, moved by Councillor, um, uh, actually no, you probably can't because you have a conflict, right? So maybe we'll get moved by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Cario. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved, thank you. Um, so now we go to 8.7, Bredner Crescent. Parking, uh, parking control review. There are four recommendations. So move. Okay, motion by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Dabrowski, that we move the staff report with all four recommendations. All those in favor? Okay, and that is unanimous, thank you. 8.8, .8, Ontario Housing Affordability Task Force proposal review. There are four recommendations there. What's the will of council? Councillor Lococo. Mr. Mayor, I was wondering if we could bring this back to another day. I think it's really important that our yeah. residents understand all of it instead mm -hmm. of rush through it. So Can you'd like to that? defer that yes, to the please. next meeting, to the April 12th meeting? Does that affect, uh, um, are we okay with that, Ms. Uh, Dolch, or do you have any um, commentary on that, uh, on a deferral of that report? On 8.8? The, yes. The only concern, th through you, well, your worship to the councillor, the only concern I have is obviously we're trying to get the comments through to the province as quickly as we can, um, just because they are, are obviously considering those recommendations now, and I would like our comments to them so that they can contemplate those comments further. Okay, and Mr. CAO would like to weigh in as well. Yeah, thank you, through the mayor. Uh, if the councillor would like to have uh, the report come back, uh, for a discussion matter too for the education purposes but allow the comments to go back to the government so that at least we're on the record with that, that we can fine. certainly arrange that uh, for the next meeting okay yes that would be so good. it'd just be for information but we we talk about the subject matter of the report yes thank you talk at the next meeting at the next meeting okay so you're okay with a deferral then no uh no it'll be to move the recommendation but then we'll also oh, uh bring it back information the session yep. the last me i got it okay did you want to move that councillor lococo yes please thank you okay motion by councillor lococo to approve the five recommendations second by councillor campbell with the proviso that this comes back to the next meeting for a uh, explanation discussion presentation okay well uh councillor pierangelo did you um, want to comment yeah so we're approving support of the recommendations. Is that what we're approving? That's what the motion is. Okay. Um, some of the recommendations, Your Worship, they ask for um, well, how do I put it? Um, no public participation. Um, I was hoping we could have a discussion around that. Um, simply because a lot of times we hear from residents that 
you know, they, they want City Hall to be more open and to tell them what's going on. And part of the province's recommendations, not that I agree with uh, the overall outcome that they're trying to achieve, but um, in some of their recommendations, they're saying that the public will not have any input. Um, a lot of these decisions, especially if it's 10 units or less, are going to be done by staff. There will be no public process. There would be no rezoning application. There would be nothing to appeal. There's also, um, there's also some other items in there that I was hoping we could have a discussion around. One of them is in specific to city councils. And city councils now are going to be penalized if they vote against the staff recommendation if they were to lose the appeal. Um, I, I can pull it up if you want, but I, I don't know that I'm ready to simply say, yeah, I'm going to support all of the province's recommendations without having a discussion on it. I think, you know, pulling the whole process away from the public doesn't really sit that well with me. Uh, again, I agree in, in terms of the direction and what the overall goals of the province is, which is to create more housing. Um, I just don't know how much I agree with, you know, eliminating the public from that process. Okay, thank you for that. I've got, so I've got uh, Councillor Iannone, uh, Strange, and Lococo. Uh, Councillor Iannone. I have to agree with Councillor Peter Angelo. While I understand Councillor Lococo's premise, there's so much in that report I don't agree with. And, and I don't end, I don't agree with the end up, the overall end game that the province is heading towards either and I well I agree that this is very important to discuss I can't I don't think I can even support it in principle tonight with with um, so many I, like I have lifted off so many red flags that we're not going to have an opportunity to discuss and I really think it needs to be brought back I'm going to vote against the motion uh, Councillor Strange yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think there's a lot in here that I think all of us council will have to go through. You know, I, in particular, you know, the government plans to to uh, propose like a f the following as of right, of like to put up four stories and up to four units on a single residential lot. So if you can just picture that, if you're in a residential neighborhood and there's a vacant lot or a 600 square foot house beside you, they could basically demolish it and build a four story. With four units so you know it's not going to be compatible with the neighborhood I don't mind doing this if it was just that in a certain neighborhood where it was just the land and, and start that whole zoning in a particular area but not where there's existing residential and you have all you know bungalows or multi units and then you put up a, a four story four units so I, I think there's a lot in here you know six to eleven stories without you don't even need any parking I know it's affordable housing but still we just you know, we, we passed a, a development that just wanted to reduce their parking by a little bit, but here's, you know, six to 11 stories with no no parking at all. So, you know, how is that fair to the developer that we just made, you know, reduce uh, uh, his parking? Um, I don't know, like, I, I, don't, I don't think I wanna pass this tonight. I would rather just defer it and speak on it when we can, if, if, if we can do that and, 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 and if, it looks like the province or whoever wants to go ahead with this. We just want Niagara to know or let them know that Niagara Falls is, is against certain uh, parts of this anyways. Okay, thank you for that. Councilor Coco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. That's not what I thought we were doing. I thought we were supporting um, the recommendations from our planning staff, not supporting the housing affordability task force report. The, um, if you go to page 44 that's where our staff outlined all of the different so I, I didn't think that we were accepting the report I have tons of concerns about a lot of the things but our, our staff have outlined each point um, some are supported by staff some aren't and I understand Ms. Dolch needs to get comments to the province we're not supporting the province's task force report okay so, so right and it does say that clearly here that Okay. Uh, supporting the affordability task force as detailed in appendix okay. two and that's your report uh, Ms. Dolch did you want to uh, comment on this so 
Thank you, Your Worship, if I can. Yes, and I, I did go point by point and make some recommendations, uh, and some I can kind of elaborate on here. The public meeting process, for example, I did recommend to the province that they consider still allowing an open house meeting so that the developers and residents can engage. Um, so what they're looking to do is, is just remove any additional public meetings that people may have. Sometimes they may have two or three, depending on a, a topic, but right now the act says you can have one. Um, a lot of municipalities have that and an open house, and I do think that they should keep that open house because that's the residence conduit to the developers themselves, not necessarily council, but to, to the developers. Um, there's also uh, recommendations, obviously, that I, I disagree with, some I, I can agree with, uh, but there there is the four-story um, uh, requirement that Councillor Strange, Strange brought up, and generally that's something that I have concerns with as well. And I think that the intensification should occur on the transit corridors, uh, the major transit corridors, and those are places we can intensify. The other areas should be left to the low-density type intensification, uh, maybe semi-detached townhouses, but at a certain height limit. So those are some of the recommendations that uh, I think I'd, I'd like to get to the province. And I do appreciate that that council may have other suggestions and concerns, and maybe that's something that they can bring forward um, at, at the subsequent meeting, and we can uh, do some outreach on that. But I, I, I would like these to go forward to the province just to kind of get our thoughts in uh, before they start. Start uh, considering any of them too much further. Okay. Thank you for that, uh, Councillor Coco. You saw before. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Th that's what I was going to suggest: is um, forward Ms. Dolch's comments to the province, but maybe um, with the notation that we're not uh, that it doesn't restrict us. That we'd like to forward more comments after our April 12th meeting. Okay. Okay. Um, so, so you're so moving this the four uh, recommendations in the report doesn't endorse the actual provincial report with all the things that they had in. Is that right, just for clarity? Ms. That's Tool? that's correct, Your okay. Worship. It, it's just recommending the planning staff's um, yeah. recommendations on the affordability, yeah. um, and then that's, that the report's forward to Minister Clark, so. Okay, that's great. Okay, Councillor Coco, and then I've got Councillor um, Peter Angel. Do I see other hands over here? No. The only okay. one is number four, and that's a specific one about uh, reducing the parking. So if I was to make the motion, I would remove that one, that we're not recommending that one. Okay, so one to three. Yes. So that's your motion, one that to three? That would be my motion, yes. Uh, Councillor Campbell, are you okay with that mm -hmm. as the seconder? Yes? Okay. Okay, uh, discussion, Councillor Kerry? I just was going to ask the question, and... Uh, Councillor's already addressed it, that we reserve the right to continue to comment. That we reserve that right to be able to comment again at the next meeting, not just inform. Is that that's still open for further comment? Uh, yes. Friendly amendment, or you already put it in? Yes, that can be in the amendment. Okay, and so you're good with the second too, Councillor Campbell. Yes. Okay. Okay, are we good with that? Um, yes, it still serves the purposes. Okay, great. So, the motion by Councillor uh, Lacoco, seconded by Councillor Campbell, is that we move the first three recommendations and also with the caveat that we can add further comment at the the uh, april 12th meeting right when we bring this back yes councillor peter angelo just one more question your worship and i'm fine with staff's recommendations i just wanted to ask um what the process is when the province sets down new policies in terms of the planning act uh such as this and we don't adopt all of them are we Will we be forced to adopt them, yeah. or can we adopt our own? Uh, through you, Your Worship, to the Councillor. So uh, depending on how they deal with the recommendations, obviously these are just recommendations at this point. Should the province decide to move forward on some of them, some will be implemented through changes to the Planning Act. The, For example, as of right changes would be implemented right into the Planning Act, and you would be forced to adhere to those. Um, some may they may do a little softer approach to you, but the majority will be legislated as I read it. Okay. So you're good with that then? Okay, so we've heard the, the, the motion, it's been duly motioned and seconded. We'll call the vote, all those in favor? Okay, and that is unanimous. Thank you for that. 8.9. 8, 8, 1 uh, to 8, 6. Pardon me, 8 what? Eight one. Eight nine. Red eight nine now. You already made that motion earlier. So we got information. Uh, 
We've got uh, information report, Town of Aurora. Yep, motion by Councilor Peter Angel, second by Councilor Carrier to receive and file. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Um, item 810, changes the public notice circulation area. Uh, motion, yeah. okay, motion by Councilor Lococo, second by Councilor Thompson. All those in favor? Okay, that's approved, thank you. 811, amendment request to a revitalization grant under the historic Drummondville CIP on Ferry Street. Motion by Councilor Peter Angel, second by Councilor Strange. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved, thank you. Uh, unanimously, um, item 8.12, request for council resolution on a ministerial zoning order for lands bounded by Erie Road, Bridge Street, Queen Street, and River Road, and there are uh, eight recommendations there. Yes, Councilor Iannone. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. We have a number of objections to us doing this. I got a number of phone calls from people who are different than the objectors who have been emailing us. We got a lot, another email this evening while we were in this council meeting, and I, I just think we shouldn't be dealing with this. It's premature. We've got people with, with LPAT appeals out um, who believe that um, this should be made public. Um, the last letter that email that came in to us, the person says they've been trying to come to some sort of resolution for ages and they haven't been able to get anywhere. To me, there's so many changes in this. Well, it doesn't have to go to a public meeting. I, I think we're changing way too much um, without anybody being able to speak to it. And, and not to mention that we'd be totally ignoring the letters that we have in regards to people who are who are already involved in appeals. I think this is extremely premature. Is this one of our time sensitive items? Uh, yes, Mr. CAO said it, yes it is. Um, so what would, so if we were to put it off to the next meeting and allow those objectors to speak to us, what would that, what would that affect? through you to the city CAO. What's that? Yeah, Mr. CAO. Yeah, it's my understanding that uh, the province has asked for these prior to the end of March. Um, and, uh, you know, so that way for them to consider it, I believe it has to be submitted prior to the end of March. So that would be the time sensitive when nature. Did, when did they ask for this? The pro it's an intake process by the province, so they don't ask for them. It's it's done, and then because of the provincial election, I believe they can't act on these after a period of time. So is it's our understanding that it's uh, it has to be provided by the end of March. So it's not like the province requests these; it, they're just provided uh, by the applicant to council. So we've known for some time that it needed to be provided to the end of, by the end of March and it's coming to us at the end of March. I would say that I would say that that's that's generally known in the industry that the province was only taking these uh, up until a certain point in time. So um, it's, I think we probably should have addressed this a little bit earlier so that people had the opportunity to speak to it or object and have a chance for us to be able to um, speak to them because we haven't had the chance to do that. Um, I'm going to vote against this. I, I don't like getting it in a time sensitive matter where we don't have any wiggle room and I think it should have come to us much earlier. Yeah, but the, the process, this is a public process so bringing it in open session to council is the is a platform to debate the merits of it. Uh, so there, it's not a requirement uh, for it to be handled in another manner the, it's, it's being done at, at an open process where you can ask questions or vote it up or down. So that's, you know, it is being done in a public manner. Okay. Okay, Still thank work against it. okay, thank you. Um, I've got Councilor Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This, um, the zoning change came back to a, came to a public meeting in March of 2021 and there were many residents and businesses that were concerned at that time and um, it went from 20 stories and then this change would go to four, 40 stories. I can't see how we cannot have a public meeting. I understand that this M MZO um, doesn't require it but I would really like to see a public meeting that people could have, have their say and I understand it's a public forum that we're in this now 
but people don't know about it. They've just found out today and they're, they're calling us and sending us emails. We really need to be transparent and explain the MZO pro process and explain all of the changes that it's going to do. I have concerns about the two Ontario Land Tribunal appeals that we, we shouldn't be able to move forward with that. I do have concerns about the heritage uh, the heritage buildings, I did speak with Ms. Dolch. There's two designated ones and two listed ones. What are the plans? Um, I did have a lengthy conversation with Ms. Dolch. There's really not much more than what's on the agenda, so I don't know how we can go ahead and approve the zoning changes without knowing what the plan is. Um, it does say that the MZO process is not formally laid out. If it's not formally laid out, then I think we should have a public meeting. The other concern I had was um, if there were any geological studies done. We just got the um, OLT appeal for River Road and the concern was digging down into the rock being so close to River Road and the gorge. Is this not the same concern on the edge of the river with the gorge? I'd like to know about that. Um, I just feel it's way too premature for us to ma be making a decision. <coughs> Uh, my other concern is the parking reduction. I know we talked about it earlier. Um, I know it's in a transit hub, but I, I am concerned about the parking because what ends up happening is people park all over the place and then there's problems. Um, I'd like to see the section 37 go specifically for affordable housing. It said community benefit or affordable housing. We've talked about affordable housing so much this evening. I'd like to see it go to that. Um, it talks about inclusionary zoning when we hear that the province wants to remove the inclusionary zoning. And that was all that I had. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Mr. CAO? I'll start and I'm sure my team members will help me out. I think, you know, the, I think the critical issue here for council is I understand, you know, um, having another public process, but I think what's clear from, we went through an extensive public process previously, I don't think there's gonna be any game-changing shocks that people will not like height uh, and will have concerns over parking. Um, so, you know, at some point in time, council has to address the height issue. Having more people uh, provide comments that they don't like tall buildings uh, isn't gonna change the fundamental decision that's gonna be made. On the parking specific issue, we've negotiated something on this one that's very clear, that's different than some of the other uh, applications. So in, in this case, um, we're gonna use live market data. So the developer has to build the podium completely for all four units, but he's only building two towers. Um, based upon what happens with those two towers, we can then request additional parking. So they will provide their parking study, they've completed a parking study, their parking study has things in it that are specifically going to address things like zip cars and you know Uber spots and that kind of stuff. Uh, but what we can do is because they're building a podium for f for all four towers, uh, but they're only going to proceed with the first two. If we find out that what you know what all these assumptions are, how new people will engage and how they may or may not need as much parking, we'll actually have that live data. Uh, there before we allow them to, to build the additional two towers. If there's a problem with the actual parking requirement, there's a stop there. Unlike other situations where you build it and you have no potential to stop it or analyze the data, this one we can actually analyze. And this one has other solutions available to it if the parking is proved to be insufficient. We have other parking lots uh, in the area that we can then build parking garages on and go on top. With regards to your question, um, with digging into the uh, digging into the bedrock, that's a challenge for this. That's another reason why they're going up higher because they cannot dig into the bedrock. Um, they need to go, you know, they need to go higher to accommodate the fact that they can't have underground parking. They they're going to build higher podium and then put their uh, put their property on top of that. So to me, the fundamental question is, you know, the 0.6 is a challenge. I'll note to this council that in St. Catharines, they just approved a 30 story uh, building downtown with a 0.5 allocation. That 0.5 parking allocation was based upon, and as Mr. Nickel says, and everybody else says, there's a whole bunch of individual characteristics of where that is downtown. But, you know, 
you know, that point five was approved for a intense building in, in a downtown on a transit hub. You know, we've asked for a point six plus with a safety valve in this development that says when you've when you've built half of it, but you've built all your parking, we get to reassess. So staff's uh, a bit more comfortable with that because we do have the ability to change the dynamics if what happens in real life uh, changes. But you know, the the issue for um, you know this council and other councils across Ontario is intensification is difficult for municipalities. Uh, having this type of intensification, uh, you know, creates anxiety in, in the public and it creates some tough challenges to it. Uh, they've asked for an MZO, which will put it to uh, the ministry if there's support here from uh, council to do it. If council wishes to gather more information from the public, you know, my only question is, what new information will come to this on this development that we didn't already obtain from the prior uh, secondary plan analysis for the downtown? And I, I've reviewed some of the uh, issues that are there. I think it's the same issues uh, repeated. So, you know, this council has can make the decision one way or the other. Um, but if there's a place for intensification, next to a GO train station is very much aligned with provincial uh, the provincial planning um, uh, philosophy, and it's very much aligned with you know the, that transit hub philosophy. So uh, you know I'll I'll stop speaking, but I think you know this one's a bit more unique because we have a couple of things here that's different with this application, uh, and some real life what I call you know check and balance that once they build their first two uh, two towers. You know they can't go past. They can't get to their third or fourth tower, and until we understand that the parking, as they predicted in their study, is actually working out in real life. Um, you know, and as far as far as height goes, uh, the experts here, and I believe this council has been informed of this. After you go so high, there is no difference uh, from an optical point of view for a resident on the street. Whether the tower is 20 towers, or 40 uh, 40 stories, or 50 stories, it. it the, the impact uh, the impact goes away. However, what doesn't go away is the infrastructure requirement that gets intensified, and the downtown here is where we actually have some good infrastructure to handle that type of intensity. But I'll leave my comments there, and if there's anything that I missed from either uh, the director of planning or Eric, uh, they can provide further comment. We also have uh, on the record the uh, proponents of this are also available for questions. Okay. Um, Ms. Dolch, was there anything else you wanted to add? I, I will just add briefly just a couple points that were missed. Uh, I know uh, Councillor Coco asked about the geological study. That's something we can ask for site, at site plan approval stage. So um, we did look into that and we will uh, ask for that at site plan approval stage to make sure. We do know that they did do some preliminary research on their parking uh, and knew that they they were concerned about going deeper. That's why they were going more above grade. But uh, that's something we're going to ask for at site plan stage. And uh, in terms of the heritage, they are working on their heritage impact study, um, is my understanding. Okay. That's great. Thank you. Yes, Councillor. And then I got Councillor Cario next, and Thank then Dabrowski. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I don't have an issue with the intensification in this area because that's really where, where it's supposed to go. What I have an issue is the notification, the public uh, meeting where people have an opportunity to find out what's going on. And, and it just seems backwards to me. We're talking about a developer and we have a letter and we don't really have all of the other documents and plans that we usually have like we did on our three planning me meetings tonight. That, that's where my difficulty is. Um, the CAO was talking about the developer did this and wanted to do this. It, it just seems backwards to me and um, I'm all about transparency and I'd like the, the public to be able to have that opportunity and unfortunately this M MZO isn't really supplying that. Um, the CAO did say that if we do not approve it, w what happens to it if we don't approve it? I thought if we don't approve it they could do it anyway. That's sort of where I thought the MZO went. What would happen if we didn't approve it? I don't think there's a good track record for MZOs that uh, do not receive council approval uh, at the province. So um, doesn't stop it, but it, um, I think it's generally 
it's generally reviewed that uh, you know that that council is supportive of an MZO oh, going to the ministry before the ministry rules on it. Doesn't mean that they can't overrule council, but I think the process is generally involved so that there is that local input provided into the MZO, MZO and the minister takes those comments as part of uh, as part of their evaluation. Then I guess my question would be, since we do have the um, NPG on, on the line, could we ask for um, some sort of public open house to at least have residents heard and understand the process and then get this in as soon as, if it's approved, get, get it to the minister? I think the only option, councillor, is you're going to have to vote it down if that's the way you want to go because the report here has got eight recommendations as it is, as it sits, and this is the public meeting. So people had an opportunity. Many people emailed us and called us and gave us their views. This is our chance to vet it. So we're on a timeline. Once the writ is dropped, nothing more will happen with the province. So there is a, a, a timeline to expedite this. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I don't believe that this is a public meeting. The only way that people know about this is if they went on to the city's website and looked at the agenda. It wasn't posted. What was it posted on websites um, about the specifics? That, that, that's what I consider a public meeting. Unless you looked at the agenda, you would have no idea that this was on there. Well, we spent a year, I believe, uh, doing the rezoning of the downtown. Mm -hmm. So we've had, uh, I think, ample public input on everything. The, the main difference here is higher height, more height, and it's in a transit route in a downtown, uh, in, in our transit hub. I don't know, like, uh, as far as I'm concerned, there's been a lot of dialogue, a lot of input, and this is a public meeting. Okay, I, I understand that. Um, can someone comment about the OLT appeals then? Uh, who wants to do that? I'll take first shot. The uh, two OLT appeals uh, that are present, uh, you know, that's against what we have existing at this point in time. So, uh, you know, to say, oh, the OLT appeals have to uh, be resolved uh, especially when our position officially as city is neither one of those appeals have any planning merit to it. To hold up something else uh, seems incongruent to our existing position. Uh, so we've, you know, we've gone on, we've gone on record saying that those two appeals should be dismissed outright because of lack of appropriate planning merit. Uh, and then to say that should be an argument to, to do something else against planning. I would I would say is would be inconsistent with uh, the corporation's existing position on the matter. So uh, I don't think it should be factored in. If it was, you know, if there was some, um, if, if there was something that was directly linked to it, well then you know I think that's for for council to decide. But from staff's point of view, we don't think that the, those two items that are being appealed have any planning merit. Thank you for that, Mr. CAO. I, I'm confused about the whole OLT appeal then. If we look at the appeals about Airbnbs, about cannabis, when we, there was an appeal, we had to stop, we couldn't move forward, people couldn't get licenses, we stopped. I understand if, if you feel that there's no planning um, matters to base this on, but it's still in the OLT's hands, and I'm not sure how we can move forward if, the, if they're trying to appeal certain conditions and how can we move ahead with other conditions I'm confused about that well an MZO would overrule it anyways so at the end of the day if the ministry if the minister agrees with this uh, then then those appeals would be squashed anyways by by the MZO so it, it actually uh, would facilitate um, you know the movement of Park Street you know social housing quicker actually uh, than the OLT appeal process because I'm I'm holding up, you know, the Park Street redevelopment project for affordable housing because of an OLT appeal that we're trying to get quashed because we don't think it has planning merit. So to hold up something else, um, you know, and this is one of the, you know, this is one of the underlying challenges that the committee uh, looked at for uh, for approval processes is that, you know, you can have these appeals that delay projects and add cost to uh, things going forward. So I. You know, I don't want to feed into that. Um, that would be my position. And like I said, if if the minister contemplates this and approves it, then the those two appeals would be gone and it would, would be effectively muted anyways. Okay, what, one final comment. I appreciate your comments about the um, MZO uh, overruling this, but I don't think it's our place to overrule the appeals 
if it's going to be a, um, overruled, it should be done by the MZO, not us. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I've got Councillor Cario, then Dabrowski, and then Strange. Thank you, Worship. <clears throat> I agree with the staff. I don't think it's going to change a thing if we put this off. The same letters, the same emails, the same people that didn't like any of what we're doing are the same people that are not going to like it if we deal with it today or the next meeting. Um, I don't, for the life of me, understand why anybody that would own property down there get in the way of this. We've been struggling for as long as I've been on council as I can remember trying to get something going downtown. Now we got something that could be going downtown. I don't get it. I mean, what, what, what else do they want? I don't know what else you want to try and get something that could improve the, the area, the downtown, the whole thing. So I think we should just get on with it. I'd be prepared to make the motion that we have, that this is staff's recommendation, make the motion that we approve the staff recommendation when it's time. Okay, thank you for that. Councillor uh, Dabrowski, then Strange. <coughs> yeah, I'll, I'll echo um, Councillor Cario's comments. It's a downtown that for 15 or 20 years we've been trying to revitalize. I know not me as a specific council member, but I know this council's worked very hard. Wayne's been there for 100. <laughs> Good memory um, but yeah it's positive news for for the downtown I don't know why there's so much push and pull and, and as Councillor Cario mentioned if I was a, a business owner or resident living in or around the Queen Street area I'd welcome this with open arms so I'm happy to uh, second a motion if it's made or, or move the recommendations Just need a motion Councillor Strange yeah. <laughs> thank you mr. mayor and um, yeah I just kind of I have to echo the, the comments just this is something we've been trying for years to do you know, we, we just did the amendment to, to rezone all of downtown and, and uh, uh, make lands where you can make them higher. And that's what the province wants, intensification. But when it comes down here, council wants to vote it down. Well, it's intensification. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Um, this is something that really, really could be a game changer for downtown. You put this in, everybody is going to be booming. Bars, restaurants, barbers, hairstylists. Uh, that they can they can build a grocery store because they're all going to need that. Mm -hmm. This is what's going to start this process of revitalization the whole downtown. And we got the go train. More people are going to come down. It's it's going to be a game changer. So I, I will uh, um, if if they're second mo making a motion, second I'll, I'll you can make the motion. I'll make the motion then. <laughs> motion by Councillor Strange and second by Councillor Dabrowski. I'm assuming to move the eight recommendations of the yes. staff report. Yes. Okay. Any further discussion on the motion? Yes, Councilor Coco. I don't disagree what everyone has said. What I'm disagreeing is the process of the non-notification and um, the non-public meeting. Okay, thank you for that. Well, if there's no further, then we'll call the vote. All call those in f vote. a recorded vote, uh, Mr. Uh, Clerk, please. Okay, the motion on the floor is to approve the recommendations within planning report PBD 2022-27. Councillor Campbell. In favor. Councillor Dabrowski. In favor. Councillor Iannone. Opposed. Councillor Cario. In favor. Councillor Lococo. Opposed. Councillor Peter Angelo. Aye. Councillor Strange. In favor. Councillor Thompson. Yes. And Mayor Diodati. In favor. And that passes. Okay, thank you for that. Moving along to item 8.13, Canada Day 2022. There's a recommendation that Rec and Culture staff continue to coordinate and deliver this, the Canada Day event for 2022. Okay, motion by Councillor Dabrowski. Conflict. Se seconded by, I saw two hands. Councillor Peter Angelo. Conflict. Oh, conflict. Uh, Councillor Coco, I'm sorry. Uh, if, is there any discussion to the motion? Okay, all those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous, thank you. We're on to the consent agenda. What's the will of council? Move Motion by Councillor Peter Angelo, second by Councillor Thompson that we move the consent agenda. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Thank you for that. Okay, motion for under communications and comments of the city clerk to approve from 10-1 to 10-7. Seconded by Councillor Cario. And just real quickly, I'll just touch on them. Proclamation flag raising Knights of Columbus, April 22nd through 24th. Flag raising request Niagara Pride Week, Monday, May the 20th for one week. 
flag raising request children's mental health may 2nd through 8th flag raising request seniors month for the month of june uh, flag raising request haitian day may 18th um, procl proclamation request autism Ontar ontario uh, saturday april the 2nd world autism day and you went to what one did you go to to eight seven. to seven and lastly Flag raising request Filipino Independence Day on June the 12th. All those in favor? Okay. Anyone opposed? Okay. So that's unanimous. Yes, Mr. Clerk. Just a note as we move on to section 11, that 11.1, .1, that report from the uh, fire department, their annual report has been pulled. So the new recommendation would be to just receive and file 11.2 through to 11.4. Okay, motion by Councillor Pierangelo, second by Councillor Campbell, that we approve resolution, uh, I'm sorry, um, recommendations 11.2. Are they recommendations? Yeah, 11.2 to 11.4. Okay, all those in favor? Okay, and those are approved. Thank you for that. Communications? Okay. Motion by Councillor Peter Angelo, second by Councillor Strange that we move items 12.1 and 12.2. All those in favor? Okay, and those are unanimous, thank you. Uh, communications, we've got item 13.1, the Ontario Ombudsman's Report. Uh, Councillor Iannone. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just had to, I've just opened it up and I hope everybody has it open up too. And I'd like you to go to um, start at page three, because when I read this report, I was, <laughs> I'm gonna be extremely blunt here, because um, no, I never am like that. Um, that. That whole integrity commissioner complaint with Councillor Dabrowski and um, the whole back and forth with Councillor Lococo on January 19th was predicated on her questioning the creation, your suggestion that you offered council to give um, an expression of interest to sit on that committee. And when the ombudsman called us for um, comment, um, you got, she brought a report back to council. I wasn't at your in-camera. And I had contacted Mr. Burgess and said, I'm not gonna be at, at that in-camera, as you know. Can I be updated on this, on the ombudsman's report tomorrow? And both he and Mr. Matson told me, no, that's not how the process runs. And I just want to let him and Mr. Matson know that all they have to do is contact the ombudsman and ask if a counselor who was not in the meeting can be updated and they would give them permission to do so. While the ombudsman called me and I had my inter I listened to the report from them, they did tell me that all the city would have had to do was ask them if they can explain it to me on a separate meeting because I wasn't there. And interestingly enough for everybody to know, she started her, her um, explanation of the, the um, in-camera item by telling me that I could take notes, but I had to keep them private. So they had no rule against taking notes. Um, but I wanna go back to why, we're, why there was a complaint. On, on when Councillor Lococo asked you, Mr. Mayor, how come the, the committee had already been decided and your response to her was, I had asked for an expression of interest. And I made very, it very clear to the ombudsman in a question and I said, when she explained that they had listened to audio for I think it was six, seven months of in camera and not one time did they hear in the audio you asked for an expression for the committee to sit, which is surprising to me because on January 19th and September 14th and March 2nd, Councillor Dabrowski was 100% certain, 100% um, certain that you had done so. Councillor, uh, the, the, the Ombudsman's already done the investigation, so why are we going through this again? May I, may I speak? I, I, I'm speaking to the topic. I'm not being disrespectful. I'm walking through a timeline. May I finish? Well, I'm just asking. I'm not, where... out, of, I'm not out of order. Pardon me? 
I'm not out of order. Well, you're not yet, but I'm just wondering where you're going because. Uh, wait, wait, wait a minute. What what makes me out of order? Well, we have a report here from the ombudsman, so there's a recommendation. And I'm, and I'm speaking. To, yes, and I'm speaking to you about it okay, because I a, have a question. There, okay, so you have a question about it. Yeah, and I'm talking. Can I finish what I'm having to say? Because again, you're asking me to stop speaking on something you don't like, but I'm not out of order. No, that's actually not what happened, Counselor. I, I'm asking you where you're going with this because there's a recommendation okay, that Council... Just, hold on, I'm talking. Can you hang on? That Council approved the recommendations in the report. So are you in favor of that or are you not in favor of that? I'm not talking about that yet. I'm not there yet. So can I finish what I'm saying? Or are you going to cut me off again? No, I didn't cut you off, Counselor. I asked you a question. But go ahead, continue on. So I'm asking you, I, I, I was pretty sure I prefaced this with I have a question for you. So if the Ombudsman says that for seven meetings she listened to the audio, and at no point through any of those meetings did you ask the members of Council for an expression of interest, how could you have spent three meetings allowing Councillor Lococo to be dismissed, gaslighted, embarrassed, um, apologetic for telling the truth, which it took an ombudsman's investigation to discover when every one of you in that council chamber knew you hadn't asked for an expression of interest. And paid investigators have now said so. So let me hear, let me repeat order. the comments that you allowed your council to make, Mr. Mayor. You allowed them to say that she was wrong. You allowed them to say that she she lied for her own political gain. Councillor Dabrowski actually said in his apology that he takes full accountability, respects the process, and it was his simple attempt to correct a fellow councillor about a mistake they made. What's the question, councillor? What is the question? Because I'm going to call you out of order any moment. What is the question? How come you said that you asked, why would you say that you asked for an expression of interest when you didn't? And why would you have allowed your council to treat okay, councillor Lococo so badly? Well, I'm just going to answer okay. this then, then, yeah, because uh, councillor, um, first of all, I did ask for an expression uh, uh, of interest from anybody. I, because it wasn't recorded, I can't answer that part. But I absolutely, 100%, and as a matter of fact, the uh, Ombudsman says, we determined on a balance of probabilities that the discussion about forming the subcommittee took place. They acknowledged that it took place. So well, I'm not sure yes, where you're coming you, from, you, but I, what I'd like to know any, is the, it, it did happen. You know what that was. Counselor, I'm going to call you out of order. You are out of order. You are out of order. Mute the line, please. Counselor, if you have a question, you can ask the question, but you are out of order. The report is finished. You don't have the right to rewrite the report. The ombudsman said, as on the... Uh, as I just said, we determined on the balance of probability that the discussion about forming the subcommittee took place. They said it did. Nobody lied. It happened. So that's where we're at with that. So, Councillor, if you want to speak to the report or if you want to make a motion to support it, that's fine. But we're not re-debating what the Ombudsman said here. The report is finished. Can I just talk? What? Yes, Councillor. Okay, Mr. Strange. And, and I do remember talking to the Ombudsman. I think every Councillor did. And I'm pretty sure everybody remembers there was a discussion at the end of the meeting. I remember even talking to the city clerk. And I said, I'm positive that we talked and you said expressed interest if anybody wants to be on the recruitment team, which I didn't. And so why would I lie about that? We did have a discussion. And I asked him. And even the city clerk says, I do remember talking about it, but it was not recorded. So it must have happened after. It was just a discussion at the end of the, end of the meeting. So I don't know what the big deal is because we hired the right CEO. We all were here at the final process to hire the right CEO. And we all picked, the majority of picked, Jason, number one. And I know, Councillor, I know he did too. Uh, yes, uh, Councillor Peter Angel and then Councillor Campbell. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. Um, you don't have to take my word. You don't have to take your word. You don't have to take Councillor Iannone's word. Just look at the report, number 28 and number 29, say it all. 
Interviewees told us that the mayor instructed councillors to express to him in writing their interest in being on the subcommittee. It's right there in number 28. It goes on in number 29 to say that often discussion amongst councillors continues after the close of the meeting and things do not get captured on the recording. This is part of the report. It's not my words, it's not your words, it's not Councillor Iannone's, who wasn't at the meeting. Thank you. Councillor Campbell? <coughs> Is your microphone, microphone on? I do believe that uh, we were discussing a motion that was made with respect to this report. I think that the conversation that we're having does not deal with the motion itself. I think we should be, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Clerk, we should be speaking to the motion on the floor. Mr. Clerk, can we give your insight? Well, uh, we have a recommendation that's listed there, and the recommendation is just simply follow the recommendations that the Ombudsman has already uh, laid out in their report. Um, I just wanted to correct uh, Councillor Iannone that uh, when we said that she couldn't listen to the meeting that she wasn't uh, in attendance for, we were following the direction of the Ombudsman uh, in their letter that was uh, part of that Council agenda. Thank you for that. Okay, so we got a motion by Councillor uh, Strange, uh, second by Councillor Dabrowski to move the recommendation. Did you want to speak to it too, Councillor Carrier? No. I'm no? Okay, so. Uh, I, hello. Yeah, go ahead, Councillor Iannone. Okay, Councillor Council Peter Angelo just said, when we spoke, the interviewees told us, yes, that conversation happened. The interviewees aren't the, aren't the what was in question. Councillor Lococo said she didn't hear it. You have just in your own meeting said that the meeting had closed and the conversation could have taken place at the close of a meeting. So it wasn't in the actual meeting, which by the way was illegal as the report, as the report determines. So how is it that she says at no point on, in the meeting process does she pick up you asking that, but Councillor Lococo, and by the way, Mr. Mayor, just so that you're clear, Councillor Lococo and I have talked long and hard on whether we would bring this up, and we knew this is exactly the reaction we could get. Because when you don't like the discussion, you shut us down. Of course. But at the end of the day, you still did not ask for expression. You created a committee of men, and when a woman questioned you, you let your council That's terrible. Come on. Come on. We were all on the committee on, at the Councilor. end to vote who we okay, wanted, I'm and you call voted vote for now. the right CEO. Okay, everybody. That's the gaslighting right to be. That's not what that is, Councillor. Right Please CEO. stop. That's exactly what that, that is, Jim. Councillor Coco, you have comment. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to ask a question before I, I make a comment. If all of you believe that there was an expression of interest to be um, put on the committee, which I obviously didn't hear if it was in between, I usually don't stay after, or I, I, I know I was here, but I came upstairs. My question is, um, Councillor Peter Angelo, did you send an expression of interest in writing to the mayor after that discussion to be on, on the committee? No, I told him. I'm sorry? No, I told him. Uh, verbally, okay. Um, Councillor Cario, did you send it? Okay, and Councillor Thompson, did you send a, an expression in writing? No, he sent nothing. So those were the instructions to send it in writing, and the three people who were on the committee didn't send it. I didn't hear those, so if if I wasn't part of it, and you knew Councillor Iannone wasn't part of it because she wasn't there, maybe as process there should be an opportunity for the people who are not there. And as the Ombudsman has said, it's very difficult when things are brought outside of in camera, then that was an illegal meeting outside of that meeting. In between the, the two, and I know Councillor Dabrowski said there must have been a discussion in between the 20 to 30 minutes, there shouldn't have been that discussion. So I didn't hear that, and I was made to feel that I was stupid, that I wasn't paying attention, that it wasn't important, and I shouldn't have been. Had the, I, I accepted Councillor Dabrowski's apology the first time. After this, knowing that it was not on tape, it's, it seems very different to me now. I knew I didn't hear it, and I was willing to say I was wrong. I asked to hear the, the recording, 
And I know that's um, right now it's in our policy of only being Ombudsman and Integrity Commissioner, but this council could have changed that. So the question is, why weren't, why weren't we allowed to listen to it? We could have cleared it up at that point. Did you all know that it wasn't part of that discussion? It was discussed after, but that didn't, that didn't negate the actions towards me when I didn't hear it. When I f was first elected to council, I thought we would work together as a team. Each one of us has different things that we bring to the, this council. And if there's differences in voting, I thought we could at least respect each other. I, have, I feel that this has not been the first time that I've been targeted in different ways. And targeted. I would really like it to stop. Oh my goodness, targeted. okay. All right, thank you, appreciate targeted. your comments. And, and since I was the chair of, uh, since I was the one who made the comment, Councillor Lacoco, and you were in the room when I made the comment to make expressions known, and you thought you, you weren't sure if you heard it or you didn't hear it, and it wasn't recorded on the tape. And I can't explain that, I don't know. But I did 100% say, make your expressions known to me. And in the end, what ended up happening was everybody on this council, 100% of us were involved in the final interviews and the selection. So really, I think we're splitting hairs about the outcome. And I don't know what to say. If you didn't hear me say it, I don't know because it wasn't deliberate. It wasn't to make anyone look silly. No one ever intended that. Those are your words, not ours, and not our intentions. Our intention are to play as a team. But you know, what we see is what we look for. So I'm, I'm a little bit uh, disappointed that if that was a concern, you wouldn't come to me, which you never did. So we're gonna deal with it like this in an open session, pointing fingers. And unfortunately, when you point your finger, three point back. And I've said this before, if we're gonna work as a team, we gotta work as a team, but it's a two way street. Everyone participates. And it's a good learning opportunity for all of us. The Ombudsman's report, I see it as a good learning opportunity. We can all learn something. Because every time we have one, we change policies and protocols, we become, we become better and we become better. And I think in the end, we did the right thing. We hired an excellent CAO. I think you'd agree that we've done a good job. And you know what, we're not always gonna uh, agree on things. That's not gonna happen. But we will and we must always try our best to respect each other. And I'm sorry if you felt you weren't, but that was not the case. That's how you perceived it and it's your lived experience. I can't change that, but I can tell you that was no one's intention at all, at all. I'd just like to wrap this up then. This has nothing to do with whether we hired the right CAO or not. That yes, everybody was included in the final. It really had nothing to do with that because we already went past the whole hiring process. If you believed I was in the room after the tape stopped, that's not in the official meeting. There's a lot of people standing around talking about different things, people don't hear it. I didn't hear it. So, and to bring it up now, the only reason why it's coming up now is because the Ombudsman report is here and they, they said it did not happen. I do have No, they didn't say it did not happen. It was, they said it was not recorded. That's what they said, yes. that's right. It was not recorded in the official meeting. Right. So if it was said after, I didn't hear it. I do have some issues and we were supposed to have a team building exercise. I was waiting for them to talk as a team and figure out how we could deal with that. We haven't had our team building exercise. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yes, Councilor. Mr. Mayor, I'm just gonna say again, at the end of that meeting when we were talking about it, he's the clerk, I said, I said, why wasn't, he goes, no, it wasn't on the recording. I said, well, why, you heard it. He goes, I remember talking about, why would the city clerk say we had a discussion about it, but it wasn't on the recording? Why would he, he's got nothing to gain by that. You know what I mean? So I, did, I didn't even wanna be on the committee. I just, why would I lie about that? It makes no sense. Whether it was on the recorder or not, we did discuss it that, that night. Okay, so, I, yes, Mr. Clerk. I just want to point out a, a couple of points that I think have been missed here. Uh, it's the same process for the CEO recruitment that was followed some 12 or 14 years ago uh, when the previous CEO was hired. The difference here is that there was just more interest to sit on that subcommittee. Uh, but the main point I want to make is that that subcommittee uh, was formulated in an open council. There was a motion by council, uh, there was a seconder, it was voted on here, uh, and that was all done in an open process. Okay, thank you for that. So I am gonna call the vote. Councillor Inoni, the last comment, please. 
Mr. Mayor, you just spent almost five minutes telling Lori Lococo that her feelings were wrong. Oh my God, and oh, come you, on. You Why can, are you speaking for her? Why are you speaking for her? Um, I'm listening, and which you apparently do not do. Oh. You just told her it doesn't matter what she thinks she heard. She's Recall wrong. Me. That's not what I said, Counselor. Hey, okay, I'm going to call the vote. The I'm going to call the vote. I'm sorry. All those in favor of the recommendations. Opposed? Okay, thank you for that. We're going to move along the agenda. Item 14, communications, comedy for kidneys. There's a recommendation that council provide direction to staff to coordinate any potential purchase of tickets and also to promote the event on our city website move through social media. Motion by Councillor Cario, second by Councillor Campbell. All those in favor? That's approved, thank you for that. Item 15.1, request for council resolution for a minister's zoning order for lands bounded by Erie Road, Bridge Street, Queen Street, and River Road. Motion by Councillor Strange, second by Councillor Dabrowski. All those in favor? Opposed? Okay. Ratification of in-camera, Mr. Clerk. That passed, by the way, Mr. Clerk. Thank you. Uh, yeah, bear with me. There was uh, quite a few items in camera. Uh, the first item is that council directs staff to receive the convention center reserve of approximately uh, $446,500, and that council directs staff to develop a written agreement ensuring that the Niagara Falls Convention Center maintains their restricted asset replacement fund in accordance with their building condition assessments and fund an additional annual amount of $90,000 for five years in order to effectively repay this transfer. Secondly, the direction uh, was provided to staff regarding a Niagara District Airport procurement process. Thirdly, uh, that confidential information on the Niagara Regional Broadband Network strategic plan be received by council. Uh, fourthly, that council approve of the purchase of three properties from the Ministry of Transportation. Uh, parcels one and two are located immediately west of Stanley Avenue and are municipally known as 5446 Kitchener Street. Parcel three is located at the corner of Victoria Avenue and Kitchener Street and is known municipally as 4873 Kitchener Street. The council direct the acting director of finance to make payments of deposits representing 10% of the sale price before taxes to the minister of finance and to make payments of the balances of the sale prices on closing as follows. Parcel one, sale price of 3,255,000 with a deposit of $325,500. Parcel two, $1,665,000 with a deposit of $166,500. Parcel three, $1,880,000 with a deposit of $188,000. The council approve a 2022 capital budget amendment in the amount of 6.8 million plus applicable taxes and tax rebates and approve long-term debt in equal amount as to uh, borrow funds required to facilitate the land purchase in recommendation number one, as just read. That council approve temporary funding from the capital special purpose reserves to facilitate the land purchase in recommendation number one until the long-term debt proceeds have been received by the city. That council acknowledge by approving the long-term debt in 2022 and not amending the 2022 operating property tax levy to include debt service charges. The 2023 operating property tax levy will be required to increase by the amount of debt service charges related to the debt insurance approved in recommendation number three at approximately $500,000 or 0.16% increase. That the mayor and clerk be authorized to sign the three corresponding agreements of purchase and sale, the forms of which are satisfactory to the city solicitor and return with deposits to the Ministry of Transportation and that council direct staff to report back on the results of due diligence investigations undertaken during the 90 day inspection period. Move the recommendation. And lastly, sorry, there's one more before the uh, mover. Uh, the council agreed to a proposed land swap with 2717981 Ontario Inc. for disposal of approximately 345.8 square meters 
of parkland along the westerly edge of Stanford Lions Park in exchange for approximately 277.2 square meters of land along the southerly boundary of the 3846 Portage Road property, plus additional compensation negotiated by staff. And lastly, that council delegate their authority for the execution of the purchase and sale of the agreement and easement agreement to the CAO. Move the recommendation, Your Worship. Motion by Councillor Pierangelo, seconded by Councillor Strange, that we approve the in-camera items. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unit. Nan unanimous with conflict, uh, Councillor Carry on two of the items. Um, the bylaws? Are you ready for this? I think we are, Mr. Clerk. We're ready for the bylaws? Yes. First, second, and third, Your Worship. Motion by Councillor Peter Angelo. Give the bylaws a first, second, and third reading. Councillor Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. 20, 2022-31, the 67 dwelling townhouse. I'm opposed to that one. That was the last meeting. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, need a second? Second for the... Well, I was also opposed. Okay, Councillor Iannone and the Coco were opposed to that, Mr. Clerk. You've got made note of that. Uh, seconded by Councillor Thompson. All those in favor of the bylaws? Okay, and that's unanimous. Thank you for that. New business? Motion for adjournment, Your Worship. <laughs> okay, motion. All in favor? Okay. We're, we're, we're voting with your feet. We're done. Pardon me? They vote with their feet. All right, where are y'all going? Okay. All right, good night, everyone.